Hello everyone. I'd like to show you guys a few very interesting small programs. The first one is Tic Tac Toe. Uh, it's a game, a puzzle, played by two players. Basically, whoever plays his or her marks on the same row, column, or diagonal wins the game. So let's play. Oh, by the way, this game I designed always uh, has human players to be the first one. So I'll choose the top left corner. Now the machine is smart enough to take this center square of this 3x3 three three, um, grid because the, uh, a lot of columns, well not a lot, there are columns and the rows for example, the second column, the second row, and two diagonals all depend on the center grid. Now, if I pick this one, the yeah, machine took the first column, second row. Now, I have to take this second row and third column, otherwise machine would win. So let's do that. Okay. I have to do this. Now actually the game is technically in. The best outcome of this two players uh, game is a draw. Now let's do it again. And this time I'll be just playing dumb. I'll probably just play randomly. Take this one. I'll do this one. Now I know the machine would win if I don't take the lower bottom, lower right bottom corner. But let's do that. Oh, machine didn't really take it. But if you think about it, think about it, the machine is just uh, kind of playing me because there's uh, two squares on the board. The machine can take either one. It would win. So if I take this. Yeah, machine took the right one, right bottom corner, so it still wins. Now, what's interesting about this game is there is a game tray built by the computer at each machine's turn. The build tray, the game tray would explore all the moves, the best moves, in fact, of the human player, and then the machine's best move to against the human player. So this is a simple game because it has only nine empty squares to begin with. So there are very limited uh, possible combinations for the machine for the, or the computer to explore. But the machine is much more is very capable in exploring many many moves, much more than a human player can possibly do. The next program is a customer simulation. Every time I go to a grocery store or supermarket, I'm always puzzled by how many lines they choose to open or close. So that motivated me to write this simple simulation program. Now here, you say there are eight check boxes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Each of them represents a checkout counter. If I check it, it turns green. That means this line is open. So if I check three, now we have line two and line three open. The rest of those lines are all closed. The first slider gives you the control of simulating the number of customers arriving per unit of simulation time. So if I have the value selected uh, at 5, that means there can be 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 customer arriving at any of your counters per unit of simulation time. Now the second slider 
indicates um, the maximum customer service time. So if I have the value selected three, that means for each customer, it may take one or two or three units of time for it to complete the checkout. Now let's uh, start the simulation. Click Start. All right. Now you see there are customers arriving at counter two and three. So because we have customers coming faster than the counters or that than the counters availability or service, so we can open a new one, another one. Let's see if we can shorten the line. Well, not. So if we open even more, and uh, for each customer, the service time is less. See what happens. Now they'll have to open another one. Oh, let's open another one because customers are arriving much more. It's queued up. So you want to open more lines. Now you say the lines are shorter now. So this is a very interesting simulation. Now I can turn this off, close these lines. So by this, you probably can optimize um, how many cashiers you can employ. All right, let's pause. Those two examples I showed you may not be very easy for beginners to learn everything of it. However, there's something you should pay attention to, such as how the UI, a simple UI, are laid out. What's the data structure are being used? And how to approach a problem, a model, a real world problem. Now, the next example, what you're looking at is written in Python. It's a very simple program. What do you see right now? It's just a square, a blinking square moving at a constant speed in a straight line from the left upper corner to the right bottom. It just repeats the motion itself, moving down, moving down, blinking, and then disappears for a little bit and then reappears from the top. So this program, you should be able to write after a few weeks Python study. I know this animation may not be that interesting, but what if I change something? Now, this is the Python program for that moving objects. So let's change a little bit, see what happens. Comment these two lines and uh, enable these three lines. And then run it. Now I changed uh, a little bit of the Python program. Now, it's a still a blinking square. But if you really pay attention to it, it no longer moves at a straight line. And the speed is not a constant. What you see here is um, 
is a square actually following a parabola curve. It's almost like when you studied um, kinematics, what new, you learned what Newton did as experiment. He threw the stone at a certain altitude and the moving object has constant x velocity and the y has acceleration. That's why when you say the square moving faster and faster downwards in the y direction. So this program in fact simulates somewhat of this um, a physical phenomenon. It simulates physics. So after we learned Python fundamentals, we definitely can build a lot of simulations or games or puzzles like this. Hello everyone, welcome to this introduction to Python programming online course. I'm your instructor. My name is Hai Chuan Ling. I'm not a teacher. I'm a software engineer with about 20 years industrial experience in the US. Early in my career, I did um, some business applications for Praxair. I worked for uh, Cornell University, did some weather and agriculture research for a year. I worked uh, for Simmons on medical uh, devices. Currently, I work on the medical lab automation system for Beckton Dickinson, which is another big medical technology company. Now, what is Python? Python has nothing to do with this reptile. It's a programming language. Uh, if you are interested, you can Google the name, the origin of the name. But to me, it just sounds better. Python is a high-level general purpose programming language. We say it's general purpose is because Python is not a design just for solving a particular set of problems. You can use Python to solve a whole range of, uh, of problems. It's object-oriented. This feature is much like many other languages such as C++, Java, and C Sharp. We will learn uh, the concept of object-oriented. It's a very high-level programming language, meaning the program you write in Python is very close to the natural language, the language we speak every day. It's interpreted basically means the Python program doesn't need to be compiled before we run it. Don't worry about all those terminologies here. We will learn uh, gradually. Now, why Python? Well, we choose Python for high school students because it's simple. Compared to other languages, it's relatively easy to learn. It's also free. It has many library supports. It's versatile, like I said. Python is a general programming language. It can do many things, from scientific com computing to program on robots. What you need? Obviously, you need to have a personal computer. It's better be Windows 10 operating system. You need to download Python 3.7. You can download from python.org, but keep in mind the language itself evolves. So the time you go to the uh, python.org, the latest version may now be 3.7. Uh, Maybe it's 3.8 already. So you just need to download the latest version. You also need a IDE. IDE is an integrated development environment. Basically, IDE is another software that helps you develop Python program. For our course, we pick PyCharm as our IDE. You can go to jetbrains.com to download PyCharm. You also need some high school mathematics, because in this course, I'll try to combine the programming tasks with some uh, concepts you learned from your uh, mathematics teachers or physics. We probably can do some uh, simulations, 
um, from what you learned in kinematics, for example. You also need a paper and a pencils. This is because whenever we try to solve a problem by writing computer a program, first, we may have to think about the problem and think about the solutions on a paper before we actually jump into the computer, write, a, write, write our first line of code. Here are a few web resources or links you may find, uh, you may find useful. Python.org. This is pretty much for developers. And also, there's one called learnpython.org. There are several tutorials available from that link. You can find by yourself. The third link, stackoverflow.com, is an interesting one because a lot of uh, professional engineers, developers, constantly go to this website looking for answers. The fourth one, W3Schools, <clears throat> actually may be more suitable for beginners. There will be a 3.7 documentation installed along with Python 3.7 installation. So this is a very comprehensive menu. This can also be our uh, offline reference because it's installed on your hard drive. Now, this is my tentative course outline. First, we're going to cover the fundamentals about this language, starting from how to use PyCharm IDE, then learn a bit, of, bit about um, how to do the simple tasks using Python interactive environment. We call it a console. We can use it for doing for some very simple arithmetics, such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, etc. Then we'll move on more computer science related concepts, such as what are types, variables, and then what are strings. After that, we can use that to build some functions and learn some of the concepts of the functions. Then we move on to more advanced uh, concepts uh, like decision making, loops. In this course, we are not only just focusing on uh, the programming fundamentals, I would also like to introduce some uh, first year college data structure algorithm uh, concepts. Although we, will, we may not have time to introduce all of that, but uh, the algorithms are more interesting, such as finding uh, the maximum number from a list, how to sort a, a, a sequence of numbers, um, and maybe doing some optimization. And these are all <clears throat> the key of, of the algorithms. We will explore some of that, although probably not our focus here. Uh, classes is the more advanced concept. We will have to cover some of that in order to build more interesting um, software. So these are the fundamentals I have in mind. Uh, we will have to learn first before we can build some more interesting uh, software, which I think will be packaged, packaged in, uh, in projects format. The project will be much more complicated. You will have to spend more time by yourself. I mean, for the fundamental exercises, each probably will take just uh, uh, half an hour at most. But for a project, for example, if I give you a puzzle to solve, Sudoku puzzle, you may have to spend many hours uh, to figure out every details. Although <clears throat> I will give you the uh, the algorithm, the pseudocode for you to start with. But still, you need to spend a lot of time there, there. Don't worry. Once you have all the fundamentals learned, doing projects will reinforce what you have learned in the fundamentals, and they will be much more interesting and fun. OK, here are the ins instructions for install Python. <clears throat> 
The installation is not difficult. Here is the instruction for installing Python. The installation is actually pretty straightforward. But this is the first step. If you do not install that properly, it may cause trouble of using it later on. So I will give as detailed instruction as possible here. So you go to python.org slash downloads, and you find the latest Python release. Like I said, <clears throat> the Python release change, releases uh, every few months. So I have 3.7.4. So when you go there, you may find another release, which is newer than this. So don't be afraid, just download the latest version. So once you download the latest installation file, it's typically named Python dash the version number and dot exe. <clears throat> you run it. This is the first window pops up. Make sure you you check at Python 3.7 to path. And also you want to select customize installation. In the next pop-up window, you select all optional features. In the advanced options, be sure select install for all users. Once you select install for all users, the customized install location will change to say comma slash program file slash Python 37. This will make sure everyone will have access to this on your computer, regardless whether your computer is just used by yourself. Then you proceed. It may take some time to finish the whole installation. So this progress bar will show how much has been installed. Just be patient, wait until it completes. Once it completes the installation, you need to make sure disable path length limit. And then you just click close. Now you actually have already installed that Python. One place to make sure it installed correctly is go to the Windows 10 start manual, you will find a list of Python related stuff recently added. Make sure you have this. After we install Python, the next step for us is to install PyCharm integrated IDE, integrated uh, development environment. Again, go to this py, uh, jetbrains.com PyCharm download web page. And make sure you select community edition to download because that's free. The next page, choose install location. Here we, we can just accept the default location. In the next installation options page, select all the options. Accept this choose start menu folder as is, and then click start. The installing may take some time, just to wait for it to complete. Once it completes, reboot. So after JetBrain Py PyCharm installed, you can go to Windows Start menu, find there should be an entry called JetBrain's PyCharm Community Edition. So if you say this is there, you, are, you install that properly. And next, you want to make an icon on the taskbar. Basically, you go to this startup uh, start menu, JetBrains PyCharm Community Edition, choose more, and then click pin to taskbar. That way, you can just launch PyCharm directly from the taskbar without going to the start menu every time. So once you launch PyCharm program, you should see this window. This is the window you say PyCharm runs first time. If you see this pops up on your computer, I think you're good for the first lesson. 
And next lesson, we will talk about how to use PyCharm to write some simple Python scripts. Hi, everyone. You have installed Python 3.7 and a PyCharm IDE. Next, we want to set up a project on your computer. First, you need to create a folder on your computer and name the folder something like your name underscore CS underscore labs. This is the place we'll be using to store the class exercises and the projects. Next, go to taskbar and launch PyCharm as administrator. Last lesson, I told you to create the button or pin the PyCharm application on the taskbar. So this is a quicker way to launch. If you have never run PyCharm before, this is the screen you will say the first time when you launch PyCharm. It basically shows the version of PyCharm. In my case, is version 2019.1.3. And it gives you option to create new project or open existing project. In our case, we want to create a new project. So click Create New Project. Now you say on the location, it shows C slash lin underscore CS underscore labs. Of course, on your computer, it should say something with your name, underscore CS underscore labs. Now let's change the project location to Py Python Sandbox. Expand project interpreter and make sure you select this new environment using virtual env. By default, it is using new environment using this new environment, so you probably don't need to change anything. Just to double check the location is C slash your name underscore CS underscore labs slash Python sandbox. And also make sure the base interpreter is installed in this C program files. And now click create. After PyCharm completes setting up the project for you, you should see a screen uh, similar to this. Now you may have a different screen uh, with a different background color. That's because the default theme is different from mine. If you want to change that theme, you can go to File, Settings, and uh, Appearance. Make sure you change the theme to IntelliJ. That way you will have a similar background as mine. So, okay. Now, I also have enabled this two bar here, open, save, and uh, synchronize. If you don't see this, I think you can go to, to, yeah, you can go to view and select two bar. Now go back to file, Settings. We want to add a um, package. Go to Project, select Project Interpreter. Noticing there's a little plus button over here. And click it. Now this is uh, a Packages Manager. Now type pi game. So this is the package we want to download for later development. It is called Python game development, but we will be using it pretty much for graphics. We also want to select a specific version. Now from what are available, we want to choose a stable release version. If you say the version appended with RC, that's not a final release version. RC stands for release candidate. 
And if you see the version number appended with dev123, I guess they are not release version, final release version either. They are still in development. So we want to select a release version. So let's pick 1.9.6 and click install package. Now it's installing. This may take a little bit. And also make sure when you launch PyCharm, you launch it in administrator's mode. That way you can install. Otherwise, you probably will see some uh, error messages popping up here. Now we have this Pygame installed successfully. We can close it and also click OK. Now this lesson will be using Python uh, console to do some basic arithmetics. If you go to Tools, Python Console, this will open the Python PyCharm Console. So this right three arrows is the command prompts. This is the place you can type Python commands or Python statements. There are other ways of launching, of opening the Python console. For example, you can go to terminal, you type pi, now you say the same prompts. We don't use the terminal for our exercise. Let's stick with this Python console. If you don't see this console again, you go to tools and click Python console to open it. Now the Python console is activated. We can use this to exercise some simple arithmetics such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, etc. Now let's move this window up. This will make it a little bigger. Now in Python, the addition operator is plus. For example, 3 plus 4 is 7. 9 plus 6, 15. Of course, you can, if you are interested, you can really make uh, uh, the, well, sorry, 9999 plus a very big number. Yep, Python is very good at uh, doing a big number arithmetic. Um, what about uh, subtraction? Subtraction symbol is this minus sign. For example, 5 minus 3, 2. 3 minus 6 is a minus 3. Now, the multiplication symbol is a little different than our daily math uh, multiplication symbol. In Python language, actually in other, in a lot of other languages, the multiplication symbol or operator is this star or asterisk. For example, 3 times 2, you use this asterisk, 8. 9 times 4 times 2. Yeah, you can change this multiplication. 72. So that's correct. Uh, what about uh, division? In Python, the division symbol or operator is slash. And this is still uh, the division symbol used by a lot of other languages such as Java, C Sharp, C++. So let's do a division 5 divided by 1 is 5, obviously. 5 divided by 2, it should be 2.5. Yes, correct. Now, there's a very interesting operator in Python language. It's called uh, floor division. The symbol is double slash. Basically, floor division gives you the integer part of the quotient. 
it drops the decimal part. For example, if we repeat the division from the above, but this time we use floor division. 5 divided by 2, but this time we want to just get the integer part of it. It shall be 2. Okay, yeah, indeed it is 2. And the floor division, in other words, it returns the maximum integer that is less than the quotient. Now we have covered addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, floor division. The last operator we want to exercise is power. The power in Python is double asterisk. So for example, 2 to the power of 2. It's basically just 2 squared. It's 4. 2 to the power of 3. It's 8. It's basically 2 cubed. All right. So these are the very uh, simple mathematics, uh, arithmetics in Python. Now, today's assignment for you is just to go home and get yourself familiar with PyCharm IDE. For example, you can uh, exercise uh, how to open the Python console. Uh, if you don't like the default theme or the theme I picked up, you can change it, but don't change other uh, options or settings. Um, now, you, also, you want to probably get yourself familiar with the keyboard. Um, get yourself familiar with uh, where the symbols are and uh, exercise, exercise some mathematics in this interactive Python console. Now, that's the end of this class. Uh, thank you. See you next time. Let's continue our discussion about Python operators. Python operators have precedence, which means which computation is carried first given expression. For example, 2 plus 3 times 2. How does Python interpret this? Does Python do the summation first, then do the multiplication, or does Python do the multiplication first, then do the addition? In other words, does Python do 2 plus 3, which is 5, then times 2? Or does Python do 3 times 2, then plus 2? Because the order of the evaluation would give different results. Now, the table here shows you Python arithmetic operators' priority from high priority to low priority. The power has the highest priority, followed by unary operator plus and minus. The plus is uh, uh, basically gives you the sign of a number, and the minus negate the number. Next, come multiplication, division, floor division, and modulo. Addition, subtraction have the lowest priority. So for the example above, Python would do the multiply first because multiplication has higher priority than addition. So Python will compute 3 times 2 first, which is 6, and then do the addition plus 2. So the result is 8. Now let's work on a few examples to help us understand more about uh, the uh, arithmetic operator's precedence. Open Python console in PyCharm. Like this. If you don't see this open, again, you can go to Tools, click Python console. Or if you see this Python console, but you don't see this command or uh, console prompt, you can click this, rerun. That will activate Python console. Now let's practice some uh, 
arithmetic operators with um, the precedence in mind. For example, 2 plus 2 to the power of 2. What the result would be? We know power has the highest precedence or priority. So it would do the power first. The power, 2 to the power of 2 is 4. And then plus 2 is 6. Correct. Then what about mi minus 2 to the power of 2? Minus 2. Now, we talked about a little bit about the unary operator, the minus and the plus. So, minus 3 gives you a negative number of 3, just negative 3. Okay. So, minus 3 to the power of 2. What this result is, because the power has the highest priority again, so it would do the power first, which is 9. And then you give a number. The result shall be minus 9. Now let's check this um, division. You don't have to have space in between these operators, uh, between this uh, operand and the operator. I have space here just for a better readability. Again, division has higher priority than summation or addition. So this time it will do the division first. 2 is divided by 2, which is 2 plus 8 then shall be 10. Correct. The same thing with floor division. So if you remember, the floor division takes the integer part of the quotient. Now, 4, floor divided by 2, is 2. And then plus 8. It's 10. Now, let's take a look at the last uh, operator, modulo. 2 modulo 5. So basically this <coughs> gives you the remainder of 2 divided by 5. So obviously it is uh, 2. Now what about I do this? 3 plus 2 modulo 5. Again, the modulo it has the same priority as multiplication division and have also having higher priority than addition. So it would do the modulo first and then do the addition. The modular 2, modular 5 is 2 plus 3, it shall be 5. Correct. I'm sure now you probably have questions about how to change these default priorities. For example, in the very first example, 2 plus 2 raised to the power of 2. What, what if we want to do the addition first and then do uh, the power? Actually, parentheses are used uh, to change the order of calculation uh, in many other languages. No exception, Python used the same. For example, if we want to do 2 plus 2 first, and then raised to the power of 2, we do this. We enclose 2 plus 2 in this parenthesis. So now it would do 2 plus 2 first, which is 4, and then raised to the power of 2. Now you see the now you see the difference. The same thing for the second example, if we do 2 minus 2 and then raise power of 2. Now, this is an interesting case. It's uh, 0. 2 minus 2 is a 0. 0 to the power of 2 should be what? Well, it should be 0. Next example, yeah, minus 3. 
So minus 3 raised to the power of 2. So we know all numbers raised to the power 2 will just give you the absolute value. So in this case, it should be 9. And then what about the next one? 8 plus 4. And then divided by 2. Now, it's doing 8 plus 4 first, 12, divided by 2, should be 6, correct. The same would apply to this floor division. And also, the same for modulo. So this would uh, give you the addition 3 plus 2 first, 5, and then divided by 5, and then the remainder of that is 0. Now let's look at this um, uh, arithmetic expression. This expression does not have any parentheses. So the priority of calculating this is by default. So it would do this multiplication first. This is 18. After that, it does all this addition. So 20, 25, 32. Now what if I have parentheses? Two times three plus five, then plus seven. With this parenthesis, the order of computation changed. This is computed first. So two times three, six plus five, eleven. That becomes this. Now with this, the normal priority applies. It would do this first, 33, and then do this addition again, 35 plus 7, 42. Now, let's make it a little bit more interesting. Let's have a double parenthesis. How does Python evaluate this? It's a straightforward, in fact. Whenever Python th uh, says parenthesis, it would compute uh, what's whatever in the parenthesis first. Now, because we have another one inside it, actually it would do this first. So 11 plus 7. Now we reduce the two parentheses to 1. Now it will do this again because it's a parenthesis. So 18, 3. Now the evaluation becomes something like this. Now whatever the results come from that. So you can practice this in Python console and get a few about uh, the parentheses. For today's homework, I want you to practice arithmetic operators' priorities. Just to run this uh, expression in, in Python console. You can, of course, come up with more complicated expression with the summation, uh, subtraction, addition, multiplication, power, etc. in one expression with and without parentheses. And first, I think you want to manually calculate the result and then type in the expression in the Python console and compare the result comes from Python. Today's lesson, we are going to talk about types in Python. There are two basic numerical types in Python integer and float. The integer is a number without any decimal points, while float 
a floating number has decimal points. They both can have can be positive or negative. And what if you see a number like 10.0 is an integer of float? Technically, it's it is exactly the same as 10 without the decimal zero. However, in computer language, so long you have the decimal points defined, it is treated as a different number than integer. It is a float. This has to do with the underlying representation of numbers. We don't need to concern too much about how the numbers are rep represented. I just want you to be aware of the differences. A string is a sequence of characters surrounded by single quotes. For example, Bai Shan, Grade 9, they're strings. Now, what about a hundred? Hundred by itself is a number, but here, this number is enclosed in single quotes, so it is a string. Again, similar to integers and floats, a string hundred is stored differently in computer than number hundred. You can also use double quotes to define a string, but here I think we want to just make a convention to use single quotes for strings. Boolean types is used whenever you have a condition. The condition can either be true or false. There's no, there's no third possibility for a condition. It has to be true or false. A list is a collection with ordered items. A list is defined by using this square brackets. For instance, we have a list one to three. It's a, basically it's an integer number list. A list doesn't have to have the items of the same type. For example, the second list has two items. The first item is a character. However, the second item is a number, a hundred. The tuple is very similar to list. It is a collection with ordered items. You use this rounded brackets to define a tuple, or parentheses to define a tuple. The difference between a tuple and a list is list is changeable or mutable. So you can add items or remove items from list. However, for tuple, once it is defined, it cannot be changed. A dictionary is a collection with each item is a, a key value pair. For instance, our dictionary here has only one entry in it. The key is a string. In fact, is the ISBN number. And the value for that entry is the book. So basically, you have a value, in this case, a book's name associated with the key. You use dictionary to look up something. A set is also a collection. However, a site does not or cannot have duplicated items here. This set defines, well, all those Ivy schools. For both dictionary and sets, the order of the items in it are not important. We will learn how to use each of the types, when to use which in our later discussions. We know there are different types in Python. Now I'd like to introduce you a few methods to convert from one type to another. For example, you can use int, 
parentheses. This is a method. Don't worry about too much about the syntax here. Just keep in mind, if you want to convert a number to integer, for example, convert a floating point number to integer, you can call, you can use this, int. If we want to convert a number from integer to float, use float. Now, if you want to convert a number to a string, you use string parenthesis or string method. We will not practice this at this point. I just want to give you the reference here for later use. Now let's do a few uh, exercises in Python console to understand some of the implications of types. Let's do uh, addition 1 plus 2. No surprise, 1 plus 2 is a 3. These are the addition of two integer numbers. Then what about I do this? It looks like the same, still 1 plus 2, but if you know what a string is defined. In fact, the first one is a string because you see the single quotes. Does it make sense for us to add a string to a number? Let's see. Well, we got an error. It's a type error. It says oh, you can only concatenate string to a string. That makes sense. So if we really want to do that addition, you have to convert the string, string number one, to an integer, and then plus two. Now you get the correct uh, result all the results you want. Now let's look at another very interesting example. Suppose I have a very big number. I don't know how, how many nines are there, but it's a lot. Let's do some addition, plus two. Well, it gotta be correct because the ones is one. 2 plus 9 is 1. So we verified this must be correct. Now what if I do this? Oops. Guess what the result would be? Now you know whenever we have a decimal points defined for a number, so it is stored as floating point in the computer. And it's a different representation than integer numbers stored by Python. So if you do the two floating points addition, it in fact will give you something. Guess what? Well, it's not quite as accurate as the integer addition. These examples I give you just for you to Keep in mind the implications or the subtle differences of using different types in your program. Hi everyone. In previous lessons, we practiced using Python console for calculations. Basically, we use the console as calculator in a sense. We also covered the concept of types in Python. Now, today's lesson, I'd like to talk about the concept of variables, which are the building block for software or program. A variable is a name for storing or referencing certain type of data. In Python, in fact, a variable is more like a reference for certain type of data. There are quite a few grammar rules related to using variables in Python, such as when you declare a variable, you cannot associate that with a type. This is very different from other mainstream programming languages such as C++ or Java, where you typically declare a variable with a type. 
Now let's work on some concrete examples to help us understand how to use variables in Python and the naming conventions and rules about the variables and the caveats of using them. As usual, we start a Python console in PyCharm. We see this Python console prompts with this blinking cursor, so we know the Python console is active. Now we can do something with this uh, console. We can do this simple calculation. This is where, uh, what we learned before. Now what about declaring variables in console? A variable is a name, a string name. So let's give a variable name A, and we want it store a value. How about three? So this is the way we create a variable in Python. Let's enter. Now A's value is three. Let's declare another variable. How about a B? And let it equals to four. Enter. From this point on, B comes into being. It starts its life in Python. Python knows the existence of B now. So B is four. What we can make use of these variables? We can do this, A plus B, because A is three and B is four now. So A plus B, it must be equal to Yes, three plus four, seven. A variable's name does not have to be uh, just a letter or this short. It can be any string start with a letter. For example, um, word, x, y, z. Okay, and we want to use this reference, sorry, reference, um, String. We know a string is just a sequence of characters. And hit enter. Now word x, y, z begins its existence in Python. From this point on, Python knows what word x, y, z references. So it's a string. It's the school name, Baishan. There are certain rules about creating variables in Python language. Um, for example, you cannot use some special character, for example, this dollar sign for a variable name. Okay, if you do that, it says some invalid syntax. But you are allowed to create variable uh, starting with a letter followed by some numbers. For example, a, one, two, three, and we'll let it equal to one, two, three. A, one, two, three. Yeah, it is one, two, three now. The rationale of creating or naming a variable is make the variable's name as meaningful as possible. You don't want to have some variable in your program that very confusing or misleading. Of course, right now we are practicing very simple uh, variables. We don't need to worry about that very much. Another thing is some special characters are not allowed in the variable names is for obvious reasons, because those special characters, for example, the uh, slash or double slash, are used for division or floor division. Also, variables in Python is case sensitive. A lower case and upper case variable are different variables in the language. Now we know A is three. Now what about uppercase A if we let it equal to two or assign two to A? Now, a, uppercase A is two. 
So the lowercase a is not the same as uppercase a. There are two different variables. Also, noticing when I declare the variable a, b, or word x, y, z, or uppercase a, or a123, I don't have the types associated, that, associated with them. Although the type of, for those variables actually are known to Python at the time it is created. If you are interested, you can check a because we assign an integer value to a, so the type of a is integer. And if we want to check the type of word x, y, z, because we assigned string to it, the type of it is a string. So even Python does not explicitly ask you to declare a variable with a type, but these variables do have types at the time when they are declared or assigned. Now let's move on. What happens if I assign a different number to A, a floating number to A? Well, it is allowed, but once a different type, a numerical type assigned to the same variable which was declared before, the type might change. So if you check type of A at this time, it is a float now. I restarted Python console. Now it's cleaner. And let's work on another example. Let's uh, assign some value to variable 1. How about 10? VR1 is a variable. The name is a legit, starts with a letter. The number uh, follows the letter, so it's a legit name. Oh. Sorry, var1. So var hasn't been assigned. So that's why you say this name error. Var is not defined. That's okay, because what we defined actually is var1. So var1 is 10. Good. And uh, let's assign another number. How about 20 to var2? Okay. var1, var2. 10, 20. That's what we expected. var1 now references number 10, and var2 references number 20. Now, what about we do this? We let var1 equal to var2, or assign var2 to var1. What shall be the values for var1 and 2? They're the same now. They should be of the same value. Let's check it. Enter var1, comma, var2. Two. Var one now should be twenty as well, because we assigned var two, which is twenty to var one. Okay, twenty twenty. So they are the same. That's what it appeared to be. Now, what if we change var two to zero? Nothing wrong with that. We just want to make var2 0. I check var2 0. Very good. Now, what about the var1 at this point? They were equal, but we changed var2 to 0. Will var1 change us as well? Let's check var1. Wow, it's a still 20, but a Y. So the change of value of var2 did not change the value of var1, which was the same as var2. So there's something going on here. I'll have to 
draw on a whiteboard to explain this to you. This is one of the caveats you encounter in Python programming and sometimes in other programming languages. We will assign 10 to var1 and 20 to var2. What actually happens is var1 points to a value 10 somewhere in the computer mem memory and var2 points to a value 20 somewhere in the memory. When we make these two variables equal, or we let var1 equal to var2, or some var2 to var1, what happens is var1 points to number 20, which var2 var points to, and this is disconnected. And uh, when we assign 0 to var2, this is the trick. Somewhere in the memory, there's 0 created, and var2 points to the new 0. So var1 still references number 20. All right, let's go back to our Python console. This is where we left. The story doesn't just end here. It's more complicated. Let's say we change var1 to a list. One, two, three. Remember, a list is a collection with ordered items in it defined by using these square uh, brackets. So var1 equals to list 1, 2, 3, enter. var2, the same, assign the same list 1, 2, 3 to var2. Enter var1, var2. Also, um, by reassigning list to var1 and var2, the underlying types of them have changed. Let's do one thing. A var2 pop 0. Pop basically removes the first item from a list. So we removed the first item from var2. The first item in var2 is 1. We removed it, so it shall be yeah, 2 and 3. What about var1? Is it the same list as before, 1, 2, 3, or it is 2 and 3? Well, hit enter. So it is still the same as before, 1, 2, 3. Removing an item from var2 does not change var1 at all. This is actually not that hard to understand. Even though those two lists appear to be the same, but in memory they created at different places. In other words, var1 has its own copy of a list 1 to 3, and var2 has its own copy of the list 1 to 3. So changing the list of var2's copy does not change var1's copy. Now this gets more interesting. We do the similar things as before. We let var2 var equal to var1, var1, var2. Well, this should be because var1 is 1 to 3, and we let var2 equal to var1. 
So var 2's value must be the same as var 1, which is 1 to 3. So both of them are 1, 2, 3. Now let's do this. Still var 2 pop 0. That removes the first item in var 2. And let's check var, var 2's content. The first item in var 2 was 1. We removed it. So what's left must be 2 and 3. Correct. So we modified the value of var 2. Now what about var 1? In the previous example, when both var 1 and var 2 point to numbers, changing one does not change the other, even though they point to the same, the reference to the same value. But now, the types are different. var1 and var2 reference a list. So we changed var2, we removed one item from it, it's 2, 3 now. What should be var1? Does removing the name of the item from var2 change var1? Let's check. Well, you see the behavior is different when we change the list of var2. var1 also changed. That actually implies var1 and var2 referenced the same underlying data. Now let me draw on the web board to explain this. When we reassign var1 to a list, 1, 2, 3, it got its own copy of that list, 1, 2, 3. var2, when we reassign var2 to list 1, 2, 3, actually it, it got a different copy of list 1, 2, 3. It's two lists just with the same content. When we call var2 pop0, which removes the first item, it only changes var2's copy of the list. So it has only two and three left. When we let var2 equal to var1, essentially we let var2 points to var1's copy of the list. So this is disconnected. So far the story the same as the previous one. Next, when we call var2 pop0, because var2 references this, we pop0, meaning remove the first item out of this. So essentially, we modified the list pointed by var1 as well. This is why after we use var2 to remove the list first item, var1's list also changed because this is the same list pointed by two variables. This is a different behavior for a list from a integer type. Hello, today's lesson, I'd like to talk about strings in Python. A string represents a sequence of characters or symbols. Some of the characters can be human readable, some may not. So in other words, a string can represent both human readable or non-readable characters. In our lesson today, we will be focusing mostly on human readable characters. Now let's use Python console in PyCharm to learn how to define and use a string. 
You should be very familiar with Python console by now. A string in Python is defined by using single quotes, a pair of single quotes. This, in fact, is a string. If you're interested, you can check the type of this. It is a string. And what about length? Zero. This string has nothing in it. Now, since we have learned variables, let's use a variable to store a string. This will be an empty string. But let's put something in it. For example, tell me something. And enter. Check as zero. Tell me something. Tell me something is a string and referenced by variable s0. At the beginning of this lesson, remember I said a string can store both human-readable and non-readable characters. Let's use an example to understand what I meant by that. Let's click this button to clear the console. All right, cleared. Still use this variable s0 that equal to some string, some backslash n words. Enter s0. Now you see this, there's a backslash n in s0. Backslash n is a special character. If you print s0, the backslash n is not printed out. It does not make sense to print backslash n out. It's a special character. You see, this line has backslash n is really what s0 stores. But again, when it is printed out, when you print it, when you print s0, there's a special character backslash n does not print out. Backslash n in computer or in programming means line feed. Now, what if you do want to print this special character? You can use a special character r and then so this time you call print s0 zero, 0 now you see this backslash n is part of the output there are many special characters uh, in programming backslash n for example is a new line it makes a new line. If it's backslash t, it is a horizontal tab. Uh, we will not spend uh, much time to cover that. So let's move on. Again, let's click this uh, rerun to clear the console. Now, it's cleared. Let's define another two string. String one very nice string two and uh, good enter if you want to check the length of this string you can do this len string one nine why is it nine so if you start from the first character v E R Y, there's a space in it, and then N I C E. There are nine characters in string one. So length of string one is nine. What about uh, length of a string two? Before we hit enter, let's check. A N D three, there's a space, so that's a fourth character. And good. 
good is four character word? So there are, there are total eight characters. Enter, yes, it is eight. If we want to perform um, string concatenation, basically, basically means you put two strings together, you do this, string one plus string two. Let's print. Print, just uh, output the results to the console. Enter. OK. Now the result string is really very nice, plus, and good. Notice there's no space between nice, the last character of the first string, and the first character of the second string. Now if we want to make it, um, um, make, make the output a little Better, P R I N T, yeah. String one plus this is an empty character, then plus another string. Let's see. All right, now it is very nice and good. So, indeed, you can use this plus operator for two strings. That's the concatenation. Now, there's another interesting uh, operator that can be used uh, on string in Python. So, for example, string 1 times 3. So, multiply string 1 by 3. So, this, in fact, will just repeat string 1 three times. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Three times. Another very common usage of a string is accessing the string or the individual character by indexing it. Restart the console. School variable. Let's define a variable school and assign, assign a string to it. Remember the string is defined by using single quotes, and that's our convention, even though double quotes can, can be used in Python for string as well. To access individual character in a string, we use square bracket. For example, if we want to check what's the first character of, of this school, square bracket, zero. Zero actually means give me the first character in school. So it's B. Keep in mind, string is case sensitive. And what about uh, another position in school? School, for example, let's check two. 0, 1, 2. That's actually the third character in school. I. So the third character in this, B, A, I, it is I. Now Python provides access and string from reverse order, from the end. What if you want to check Minus one. What if I want to check the first character start from the end of this string? So it should be n. Well, let's say if it is n. Oops. Why is that? Oh, I'm sorry. This is because the name I spelled wrong. It should be S-C-H-O-L. If you spell it wrong, Python thinks it is a different variable, which has never been defined. That's why it's, um, it, it reads an error. S-H-C-O-L is not defined. I spelled it wrong. Now I corrected it. Enter. Yes. The, la the first character from the, the reverse of this string is N. Now, what about I do this? 
have to make sure I spelled correctly. What about I do this? 10. Well, guess what happens? If you access something is outside of this string, because the school has total seven characters and you give it 10. See if, see if Python knows this. Well, Python indeed knows this index is out of range. Let's restart Python console. Restart it. We know we can use square brackets to access individual character in a string. What about we want to retrieve a substring from a string? This is called a slicing. Again, let's use school. But this time we give it uh, two words, Qingdao, Baishan, enter. We want to get a substring from this. So still using a uh, square bracket, but we want to retrieve uh, the substring starting from the first position all the way up to seven. So this, in fact, will extract a substring from school starting at the first character and up to the seventh character. So let's check. Okay, it returns a substring from school. Now let's do another one. School, what about I want to do this? So this will return, this should return a substring from index one to index two. Enter. In. I is at the index position one. And N is at the index position two. So when you slice and school from one to three, it returns from index one to two. Now let's do another example. School. Now I don't give it an uh, index. This will extract the substring from school starting at index nine all the way to the end. You can also do slicing from the, uh, the other end. SH school. You use this negative sign to access a string from the other end. This would extract a substring from the seventh character from the, the other end. Now let me explain the index in a string a little further. Suppose we have a string uh, s0 equals to Baishan. Well, I need to put this a single mark. Um, the index for string starts from zero for the first character. So b, has in, b is at index zero. And then from left to right, we increment the index one at a time, two, three, four, five, six. So when I access the string by index as a zero, it really points to the very first character in the string. If I do Two. This is at index two, so it will actually points to the third character in the string. This is all because the index starts at zero. Another typical operation on a string is finding whether a string contains a substring.
or in other words, finding whether a substring exists in a string. For example, s0, this our variable, let's give it uh, a string. We have three lessons uh, a day. Now we want to find whether uh, a letter E exists in this string. E, S, find E. Return. So if the substring exists in the string, it returns the index because the first E is at the second position. The second position is actually index 1 because the index starts as 0. W starts as uh, index 0, and E, this E, starts at index 1. So we find E, the first occurrence of E is at index position 1. If we want to find um, a multiple letter substring, for example, uh, half. Now it returns 3 because H is at index position 3 in string S0. Now we have learned strings in Python. Next, let's discuss list. In fact, we have learned list a little bit in previous lesson where we introduced the concept of variables. Today, I'd like to um, dig into a little bit more of the details about the list in Python, so the basic operations about it. We're going to still use Python console to learn the basic operations. I promise you after this, we should be able to, and we will do something more interesting. But for now, just bear with me. Use the Python console still. Remember, a list is a collection of ordered items. Remember, a list is defined by using square brackets. It represents uh, a sequence of items or ordered items. List one. If I give, give nothing in these square brackets, so it's an empty list. We can check the length of the list. It should be zero. Now, how do we add one item to the list? Use append. Sorry, list one, append. Let's add a integer number. Append will add the item to the end of the list. Now, if we check list one, it has one item. Now let's add another one. Append three. Enter list one. It has two items now. Let's check the length of it. List one. Enter two. So far, so good. Very similar to string, list can also accessed by indexing, which is the position of the item in the list. For example, list 1, square bracket 0. 0 points to the first item in the list. It should be 2. Then what about uh, the next item? List 1, 1. This is the second item in the list. It must be 3. Now what about we give it an index position that is out of the range and check if Python can detect it. List square, uh, list 5. Yes. Python knows the position 5 
is out of the range of list one because list one has only two items in it. The valid index positions for list one is only zero or one. So what about we don't want to add the item to the end of the list? We want to add item to the list at a, an arbitrary position. Then we use insert ten. This would insert at the index position one with a new item ten. List one. Now you say the new item ten was inserted at the index position one, and it pushed the original item to the next position. If we want to remove an existing item in the list, we call pop, give it a position. So this list one dot pop one will remove the item at index position one. Pop list one. Now it has two items left because we removed one. The one, the one we removed was at the position one. So ten was at the position one. So that has been removed. Now if someone do this, list one assign number five. To list one position one. Remember, list is mutable. Mutable means the list can be changed. So when we assign five to list one, we modify the list. It becomes two five. The second item was replaced by five. What about we want to clear everything from the list? We just call clear. Enter list one. Now it's back to empty list. Now so far we have used the integer numbers uh, for the list. List is a very versatile type or collection. It can store other types. For instance, list. Let's store some strings. How about some chemical elements? Hydrogen and uh, oxygen. Now list two stores string. List two. All right. And uh, we can do the same. Do the same thing. Append a new item. Z onto it. Remember, append as the new item to the end of the list. So the Zion should be added after oxygen. Oh, what happened? Oh, okay. Append. I spelled that wrong. Yeah, it has to be correct. We can also insert an item at a specified position. How about we insert another element at index position one of list two? Enter list two. It should have four items now. And calcium. Was inserted at a position one. The position one used to be this, and the calcium inserted at this position, and it shifted. The position started from one all the way to the right. List also supports slicing, which means extracting certain portion of the list.
listed two. Let's extract the list from index position one to three. Position one, index one is this, zero, one, two, three, exclusive. So it returns only two items. Now let's check list two. So it is still four items. Why? When we do the extraction, it actually extracts this, but it creates a new copy to it. It did not really modify list two in place. Now list two stores uh, four chemical elements, which are strings. It can still be accessed by indexing to it. Uh, for example, three. That's the last item in it. Good. Like I just said, list in Python is very flexible. It, you can use it to store mixed type of data. List three, integer type, a floating point number, and uh, another string, carbon. List of three. It's fine. You can actually have a list within a list. This probably is the single most uh, important feature of list in Python. For example, we have um, list four. Let's have it for zero, comma, another list, three, five. So it's a list, contains two lists. Of course, you can even embed list within a list within a list. So this basically gives a matrix in a sense. List of four can be accessed by index, zero. That gives you the first list. Now, another zero. This gives you the first item in the first list. Zero, zero gives you the first item of the first list. So the first list in list four is this for zero. And the first item of it is four. So let's check it. Yes, it is four. By using list this way, it can simulate the array in other languages. Uh, I'd also like to mention a very similar type to list. It's called tuple. We talked this before. Uh, the difference between tuple and a list is list is mutable, changeable. We saw it just in the above example. However, tuple is immutable. Once it is defined, it cannot be changed. For instance, T1. Two, well, a two-item tuple. I always like to check the length of the type of the data, so it's two. And you can use uh, the square bracket to access individual items in it. Let's index to it zero. The first one of the tuple should be one. So very similar to. Uh, the way we use list, accessing a list, but you really cannot change it. For example, if, if you do this, 100, now you see type error, type object does not support item assignment. Basically that tells you T1 or type cannot be changed this way. Now we have learned some basics in this program language, such as arithmetic operators, arithmetic operator precedents, how to do arithmetic in Python console, and we also introduced some uh, types 
in Python language, variables, how to declare variables. In the last two lessons, we learned some basic operations of string and lists. Now it's time for us to move on to a little more advanced concept, function. Once we learn the basics of function, we can do some interesting stuff in Python. What is a function? A function is a series of statements which returns some value. A function can accept zero or more arguments that can be used in the execution. Now, I took this definition from Python 3.7 menu. It captures the essence of what a function in a programming language. A function in a programming language is not the same as a mathematical function, although you can make an analogy to it to help you understand. For example, the arguments you pass to a Python function can be viewed as the independent independent variables, and the function performs certain computation and transforms or maps the input into a value to, another, to a domain. But the difference is a function in Python can return multiple values given the same set of inputs or arguments. And also a function does not necessarily to return a value. So sometimes a function is also called a subroutine, a procedure, or sometimes it's called just method. The next question we should ask ourselves is, why bother doing Python in function or use a function at all? To tackle a complex system, it needs to be broken down into small, manageable pieces. This strategy is also called divide and conquer, and functions are somewhat like that. With functions, a complex system can be decomposed into more manageable, reusable, and testable pieces. Now, let's take a look at how to define a function in Python. So you define a Python function with a keyword, def, and you give it a name. Inside parentheses, you can pass zero. You can pass a zero argument, or as many arguments as you want, separated by comma. And at the end of this function header definition, you need to give it a colon. Now, this is the function header. Keyword def and a function name. And inside parentheses, the arguments. Once you define the header of a function, inside it, you define, well, you can write the list of statements you want the function to perform. You can return value or not return value from the from the defined function. Now let's work on some real examples to learn this concept. We have been using Python console for our exercises. Now it's time for us to write our program in a file. To do that, first we need to set up a directory to store our Python files. Here I have a few directories already created. For you, you probably would say nothing underneath except maybe vnv. Go to the, the root directory you created at the beginning of this class, new, and then click directory. You can give any name you want, but I suggest uh, we use exercises. Exercises. Now you see the new directory is created. Next, we want to add a Python file to it. Again, right click exercises direct directory, new, 
and select Python file. Here you can give a name, for example, function underscore basics and make sure the file type is Python file and click OK. Well, cancel because for you, you don't need this. All right, now you have a Python file, a blank Python file open for you to edit. Let's write our first Python function. We want this function to calculate the arithmetic average of two numbers. DF arithmetic average parenthesis x1 x2 and then at the end of this column so now you have a function header defined the function name is called arithmetic avg it computes the average of two numeric values. x1 is the first parameter, x2 is the second parameter. Now, how do we do this? Mathematically, the arithmetic average is, is what? Is x1 plus x2. Remember the precedence? We need to use the parenthesis to get this summation first and then divide by 2. This is the average of two numeric numbers. But we want this function to return this value. So you add a return to it. Enter. Now, a couple of things here. First, the function name is somewhat like uh, the variable name. You can't have some special character in it. But most time, you just follow the way we define variables, it should be fine. And the, verb and the function name should be uh, meaningful. It should uh, tell you, tell the reader or other uh, programmers or developers what the function is. For example, here we are calculating the average of two numeric, num numeric numbers. And of course, you don't want to give the function name called um, square root or power. So the function name should reflect what the function does. And second, notice there's indentation inside this function body. So this is a function header, and inside it, these are function body. This defines the state statements that will be executed when this function is called. The indentation is important. Here we have only one line of statement. You, so long you have two spaces or a few spaces indent, indent to the right, you're fine. Now we have a basic function uh, defined, a very simple function. It computes the average of two numeric values. How do we use this function? Here, we define the function. To use it, we call this function by typing the name of it and we gave the number we want the function to compute for us. For example, 10, 20. And of course, we want to get the result of the computation. Now, result is a variable. We learned before. And this is the function we just defined. When this is called, it will go into this function and performs the average of two numbers and then return to this result. 
we can check the result by print it. Now we have a very simple program. To run this program, you go to the, the file name and right click and run function basics. OK. Now in the output window, you see the number 15. It is, it is exactly the average of 10 and 20. What happens when this program is ac executed is first, Python knows there's a function defined, and the function is called arithmetic average, arithmetic AVG. And at the time when the function is defined, it does not really uh, run this statement, it does not run this line. When Python reaches line 5, it knows there's a function called arithmetic AVG defined. It will invoke this function. When this function is invoked, the value you enter here, 10, 20, is passed to x1, x2. So the first parameter you supplied here is passed to the first parameter in the definition. And the second number you passed in this, uh, and the second number you supplied here is passed to the second argument defining this function. So when this two numbers pass to this, x1 is 10, and x2 is 20. So when Python executes line 5, it goes here and assigns 10 to x1 and 20 to x2, and then performs this addition and then divided the division, uh, then divided the summation by two. Once this calculation is done, return. The return will exit the function and returns to where it left, returns to when this function is invoked. So it, actually the result is returned to this. And next statement is line 6, it prints the result. Now, what if I do this? 20, I change, I switch these two uh, parameters in this function call. And save it, right click, and run. So the result is still 15. Well, this is obvious. The average of 20 and 10 and 10 and 20 should be the same. But the numbers here passed to the function are different. So when you define, when you supply 20 as the first argument, 20 is actually passed to x1, and 10 is passed to x2. The result happens to, the, to be the same is simply because the average of two numbers does not really depend on the order showed up in this function. But there are, but there are cases when the position of the arguments are important. Now what if I don't have the second argument in the function call? I save it, run it, see what happens. Well, you got an error. This is not hard to understand because this function expects two parameters, but here when you call it, you only supplied one. You get an error. How about you still give two arguments in this function call, but this time you, for some reason, by mistake, you give it uh, a string, in fact, 
Remember, string is marked by this single quotes. Save it and run. See what happens. All right. An error as well. Why? Because because we really cannot add a number to a string. And the first argument 20 is passed to x1. The second argument 110, one, in fact, is a type of a string. And this is passed to x2. So here you have unsupported operand type for plus, int and a string. This basically tells you you cannot add integer and a string. It does not make sense. Now this is a function that takes two arguments. Certainly, like I said before, a function can have zero or many arguments or as many arguments as you want. What about we want to define another function, def, def, a function that computes the summation, compute sum, but this time we pass, we define three arguments this function will perform on. So this function, with this function, we want to really add all the inputs up. This should be very simple. Return. We still want to return the result. x1 plus x2 plus x3. Enter. All right. To test it, as before, result equals compute sum. How about one, two, three? Enter. You want to print the result. Save it and run basic R S six. This is simple. A function does not have to return a value. So let's do something that does not return a value. Like I said before, a function does not have to return a value. So let's check this. So I have this program copied from somewhere else, somewhere else in my project, so that I saved some time here. So you do need to import this module. And this function will just uh, make your computer, make your laptop to beep through the speaker. And noticing we defined this function and without any return here. To run this function, play one, one, octave, enter, save, and run, see if, I, see if you can hear any sound. All right, you see the function does not return anything, but it performs certain um, computation, or uh, it executes a series of statements without returning anything. So this function is we defined, and inside of this play one octave function, we reuse the function from the win sound module. So there's a method called a beep, which takes two parameters. The first parameter is the frequency, you want to pass to wind sound. And the second one is the duration of milliseconds. So when you call this, it will call the, it will ask your computer's speaker 
to beep at this frequency for this this amount of uh, milliseconds. Obviously, this is not a very good way uh, to make a sound, but it demonstrates how a function can be used. Hi everyone, today's lesson I'd like to talk about two things. First, relational operators. Second, the basic logic in programming. First, let's talk about relational operators. Relational operators are used for comparison. Sometimes you can also call relational operators comparison operators. They are used to find out whether two variables or values are equal or not, or which one is bigger or smaller. The comparison operations are not limited to just comparing uh, two numbers. Also be used to compare strings, uh, lists, sets, and other complex types. But no matter what you compare, the result from the comparison returns either true or false. There are eight basic comparison operations in Python, which are very similar to other languages. I have summarized the comparison operations in this table. The first six comparisons, uh, the first six comparison operations check the equality of two variables or, uh, the, or which one is bigger or smaller. The last two really checks the object's identity is or is not. Basically, it tells you whether one thing is the same as the other. We will be just focusing on the first six comparison operations today. Also, please pay attention to this uh, comparison operators symbols. The less than symbol and the greater than symbol are identical to uh, the symbols used uh, in mathematics textbooks. But for less than or equal, greater than or equal, equal or not equal, they are not the same as you would see in a mathematics textbook. But it's not very hard uh, to remember this after a little bit practicing. Like I said, the comparison are not limited to comparing to numbers. Uh, they can compare other things, but let's start with uh, number comparison in Python. All right, here's the Python console in PyCharm. And let's see, how do we compare two numbers? Three and four. And remember this symbol less than symbol. This should evaluate either true or false. If three is strictly less than four, which it is, it should return true. Then what about four less than three? Obviously, it should be false. Now let's compare whether four is greater than three must be true. Then what about 3 greater than 4? No way. So it's, it is false. Now let's check if two numbers are the same. Let's check if 3 equals to 3. I'm sure 3 equals to 3. So it must be true. And notice for the equal symbol, I have this two equal signs and no space in between. So if you do three equals three and you have space in between, this is treated as a different symbol in the, pro, in the, in the language. It's a grammar error, can't do that. So, now what about inequality? 
if we, uh, if we want to check whether one number not equal to the other. Definitely 4 does not equal to 3. This should evaluate 2. And this is not equal symbol in Python programming language. Let's do another example. 3, 3 not equal to 3. This can't be true, so it, it is false. The access here, I understand, is very trivial. It's just a guess be familiar with this comparison symbols. And also make sure you understand the comparison returns either true or false. All right, let's keep going. We want to compare two numbers and compare whether one number is less than or equal to. For example, want to check on whether 3 is less than or equal to 4. And also notice I can have space in between this left arrow and this equal symbol. And 3 is less than 4. And that implies 3 is less than or equal to 4. So it is true. Now, if we compare 4 and 4, if we check if 4 less than 4, it must be false because 4 is not less than 4. So it is false. However, if we check whether 4 less than or equal to 4, now it becomes true. The same thing with greater than or equal to. For greater than or equal to 3, even though 4 does not equal to 3, but for greater than 3, so this still is true. And uh, 3 greater than or equal to 3. 3 is not greater than 3, but 3 is equal to 3. So 3 is greater than or equal to 3. So it is true. Okay, now let's restart Python console so that clears the screen. Like I said, we can also compare types other than just numbers. What about we want to compare two strings? Let's check if me equals me. Well, we have two strings here. The first string has two characters, M and E. The second one are virtually the same. So it has to be true. In fact, when you compare two strings, it compares each character. So if I have the second string, the first character of the second string is uppercase M, would this be true or false? The string comparison is case sensitive. So the lowercase m is not the same as uppercase m. So that has, this has to be false. Now what about I, I do this comparison? Oops. I want to compare two names. And uh, let's check whether Alex is less than Bob. Well, like I just mentioned earlier, the string comparison compares character by character. And character A comes before character B. Strictly speaking, uppercase A comes before uppercase character B. And if a character comes before another character, then it considered 
less than the second. So now Alex is less less than Bob, and this evaluates true. For each of the character in the string, actually there is a number encoded for it, and the encoded number are in fact used for the comparison. But for now, you can just think about the comparison of two strings is based on alphabetical order. Well, of course, in actual programming or software, you probably would not say this direct number comparison or the uh, string literal comparison. You usually would compare two variables. For example, we can declare variable a and let it uh, equal to 4, and uh, another variable and assign 3 to it. Now let's check these two variables, 4 and 3. All right. Let's compare whether a equals to b. No, they are not, not equal, so it is false. What about a less than or equal to b? False. And what about a greater than or equal to b? Now this time it should be true. Again, in actual program, this is what you would say a lot of times, rather than uh, something like this. Like I said, you can also compare uh, other types. Uh, for example, what, do you, what about we want to compare two list? Remember, list is defined by this uh, square bracket. Now, I just defined two lists, A and B, and they are empty lists. Let's check whether A equals to B. Well, intuitively, they should be equal. So you compare uh, two empty lists, they are equal. Now it should be true. Now, what about I populate the list with something? What about B? One, uh, three and one. Okay. If we want to check whether A equals to B, should they be equal or not? And keep in mind, uh, a list is a collection with ordered items in it. So the order is important. And when you do the lists comparison, it really compares each item at the same position. So it will compare the first one item in A, which is one, to the second list, the first item, in the second list, B, which is three. And they're not equal. So if one of the, uh, if the elements are not equal, the two lists, cannot be considered equal. Now this should evaluate false, correct. Now if you really want to compare whether two uh, lists are identical in terms of they have the same uh, elements, regardless of the ordering, you can, well, one way of doing it is sort. When you sort A, it becomes 1, 3, well, actually the same, because it's already ordered. Now, if you sort B, it should change the order, correct, to 1 to 3. Now, if you check whether A and B is equal, it should be true now. In summary, you really, can, you really can compare uh, anything and usually of the same type. The key point is, for anything you can compare, 
you need to have a definition: what is equal, what is not equal, what is less than, or what is、uh, greater than. Now it's time for logic. We just have discussed the comparison operations. Each comparison operation returns a boolean value. A boolean value can either be true or false. It cannot have any value other than true or false. For numerical values, we have operations that perform addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. For boolean values, we have boolean operations. Basically, there are three type of boolean operations on boolean values. Suppose p and q each represents a comparison operation. So, in other words, p is a boolean value, and q is another boolean value. So, for p and q to be true. You need both p and q to be true. In other words, if both p and q are true, then p and q is true. Now, for p or q is true, you need at least one of them is true. In other words, if either p or q is true. Then P or Q is true. Not P is the negation of boolean value P. So if P is true, then not P is false, and if P is false, then not P is true. For boolean values, we typically use a truth table. We use a truth table. To find out the results of and, or, or not. Again, P and Q here each represent a comparison operation. The result of comparison operation. So P is one boolean value and Q is another. A boolean value, remember, can either be true or false. So for two boolean values. You really have four combinations. Both are true. One is true, the other is false. One is false, the other is true, and both of them are false. Now, if both of them are true, then P and Q is true. P or Q is true, and not P is a negate of a true. It must be false, and not Q is the same. It's a negate of a, of a true Q, so it is false. Now the second row is if p it, p is true, q is false, then p and q is false. Remember, for p and q to be true, both need to be true. Now we have only one is true, so p and q cannot be true. If it cannot be true, the boolean value must be another one, so it is false. Now if p is true. Q is false. What about P or Q? Since P is true, you don't care about whether Q need to be true or false. P or Q is true. At least one of them is true, so P or Q is true. Now the same thing with P is false and Q is true. It's the mirror of the second row. Now for the last row, both P and Q are false. So P and Q is false because none of them is true. So P and Q cannot be true. And P or Q must be false as well, because again, none of them is true. You need at least one of them to be true for P or Q to be true. So P or Q is false. Because P and Q, both of them are false. Now the negation of a false boolean value P is true. The negate of Q, which is false, is true. This is called a truth table. This is a logic 
you may learn at college. And in fact, the, bu the bullying value, the bullying, the term bullying is named after English mathematician George Bull. Well, if you're still confused, um, that's probably fine. Logic is sometimes confusing. Now let's use Python console to work on some real examples to help us understand. P, a variable, let's assign it with a comparison to greater than one. And uh, another variable, assign it with another comparison, three greater than two. P, Q. Now we know the results from a comparison operations are true or false. So P and Q should have value, uh, should have value either true or false. Both of them are true because two is greater than one and three is greater than two. Now what about P, P? and q now if you look that up in the truth table it should be true because both of them are true then what about p or q one of them is true so it is true now let's do a negation not p false because p is true now not p has to be false the same thing with not Q, it is false. Now this is an example of two um, Boolean values, both of them are true. Now what about I have um, one value is still true, P still true. However, Q this time we make it um, false, less than two, three less than two can be true. So P, Q, Q is false now. All right, now let's check P and Q. Because one of them is false. So P and Q is false. Now what about P, oops, P or Q? Now, for P or Q to be true, you only need one of them to be true. And at this time, P is still true. So P or Q is true. All right, that's the case when one Boolean value is true, another is false. Now, what about both Boolean values are false? So now this time, we assign false to P and uh, Force to, oops, force to Q, P, Q, both of, them, both of them are false now, P and Q. This needs to be false because none of them is true. You can't have P and Q is true. Now what about P or Q? Again, none of them is true, so P or Q must be false. Now, if we do the negation, it, you negate the false, then it is true. Same thing with um, P. So it is true. Okay, let's restart the console to clear the screen. Now, let's do another example. Suppose we have a variable called test score. We give, give it a score, 90, 90 points. And uh, another variable, piano level. And we assign eight to it. Now, there are certain schools require both test scores and uh, extracurricular activities such as piano, how well we play piano. And uh, if you have both test score greater than 90 and the piano level reached to a certain uh, reach to eight, for example, um, they admit you to whatever major you want. So in that case, I hope this is more a realistic example. You want to test score 
greater than or equal to 90 and piano le level greater than or equal to 8. So this, if this is true, meaning the student's performance meet both of the criteria, then he or she can be admitted. So it is true. So this condition, if the student if a student passes this condition, he or she is good. So this and operation checks both comparisons. Now what about another school is less selective? That school only looks for one of the uh, performance metrics. For example, if that not so selective school only needs uh, one of them to meet the criteria, meaning as long as the student has test score greater than or equal to 90 or piano level greater than or equal to 8, this student can be admitted to whatever major uh, he or she wants. So it's less restrictive so long the student performs well in one of these areas, he or she is good. So true, because one of them is true. Now I use the variables to uh, practice the comparisons and the Boolean operations. Um, you can in fact do this just to get a handle of how these operations work. I mean logical operations work. You can do true, true, so true and true must be true. Now the um, the logical operators that's not limited to just comparing two. You can also do true and true. If you want, you can do another one. So this basically tells you. This basically means for this whole thing to be true, you need each comparison operation be true. Of course, here the comparison is already true, so it must be true. In real applications, you may say A and B and C and D. So this each of these variables A, B, C, or D represent a certain condition. So if I do this, that means you need all of this to be true for a certain thing to happen. Now, if you want just one of them to be true for things to happen, you do this, A or B or C or D. Of course, if you have many of this, like AND and OR are mixed all together, you really need to uh, have the, your logic figured out first. What do you want to check? Okay, let's get rid of this because I don't have variable A, B, C, or D uh, defined. Now, another thing interesting in Python is um, the logical operations or comparisons uh, can be chained. For example, you can do this, one less than two less than three. This is equivalent to equivalent to one less than two and two less than three. Okay. If you let's enter, so this is true. Now you can chain more than just uh, three um, comparisons. You can do as many as you want. So if I have this, this means we want to check one less than two and two less than three and three less than four and four less than five. Of course, normally you don't do this. This is just for example, and in applications, you, you, you would compare variables. And the values in variables are not known in advance. That's why uh, you need this. 
All right. If, uh, I find if we have more than three chained together, it might be confusing. But if you just compare three, that looks uh, more close to uh, the mathematical expression. That might work better. So anyway, uh, you can either do this, chain the logical operators, or you can do this, one less than two and two less than three. Either way, it would work. Logical operators work on Boolean values. If a function returns a Boolean value, of course, it can be used by the logical operators. So here I have a script file where I define two functions, func1 and func2. And here, for each of the function, I have uh, the print statement. This is just for debugging purpose. So the print statement here is called when this function is called. So for example, if function one, func1 one is called, you would say in the console output, func1 called printed out. Now this argument, return value, return value, is for demonstration purpose. So this function, func1 or func2, would return whatever the argument passed into it. Now, if I want to check func1 true and func2 true, what would happen? All right. I because func1 returns whatever value passed into it, and so is func2. So if I pass true to func1, func1 returns true. And same thing with func2. Because for both, for this and operation to be true, both this func1 and func2 need to return true. In other words, both this func1 and func2 need to be evaluated. When both of them need to be evaluated, both of them will be called. So both func1 and func2 will be called. So if you run this program, you would say func1 called and func2 called. So let's run it. All right. OK, this is the results from um, the script file. So the first block here really is from here. So you can say func1 card and func2 card. Now, what about the second? The second is still and operation. However, this time I passed false to the first function and the true to the second. And keep in mind, for the whole thing to be true, both comparison needs to be true, which means func1 needs to return true and func2 needs to return true for the whole thing to be true. However, when I pass false to func1, func1 returns false. That means no matter what func2 returns, the whole thing can be true. So in fact, Python is smart enough when the first comparison, the first Boolean value returned is false, Python won't 
continue on to evaluate the second part. So only func1 is called. Now you see only func1 is called in the output. Now the third is I pass true to the first func function and a false to the second. However, this time I check the or. I use or logical operation, which means the whole thing is true so long one of them is true, or at least one of them is true. Now, because I passed the true to the first function, the func1 will return true. Now, Python here, again, is very smart because it needs only one of them to be true to return true. It doesn't need to check the second one if the first one returns true. So only func1 is called. So again, func1 is called. Now the last. Still or operation, but this time I pass false to both, both functions. Again, for the whole thing to be true, you need at least one of them to be true. Now, because I passed a false to func1, func1 returns false. So the first one is not true. So Python knows it needs to, to continue on to the next comparison or check on the next Boolean value. So in this case, both func1 and func2 card. Yeah, sometimes this is, um, if one of the uh, terms in the expression is skipped, it's called short circuit. But the logic is really intuitive to me. Okay, I think we have enough logic treatment today. Thank you, I hope you enjoy. Now we have learned logical operations in programming. Logical AND, logical OR, logical negation. If we want to check if both conditions are true, we use logical AND. We use logical OR to check at least one of the comparison operations is true. And logical negation will negate the Boolean value. The result from the logical operations in turn is a Boolean value, which can take on only true or false. Now the question is, what do we do about these conditions or the results from the logical operations? Simple. We take actions depending on the true or false from the condition. For instance, if a condition is true, we do one thing. If it is not true, we do another. Now, let's see how do we do it in Python programming language. In Python, we use if-else to branch the program workflow, to branch the program execution. For instance, if this Boolean expression is true, and this following, following statements are executed. The first line we can call it, we can call it uh, an if test. Again, if is the keyword in Python. It's intuitive. If this Boolean expression, which can be a simple comparison operation or a few comparison operation chained by those logical operators. So if this expression is true, now the following indented statements are executed. Another form is similar to uh, the first. Still, if a condition or conditions are true, 
this block of code indented to the right of if are executed. Otherwise, meaning if this Boolean expression is false, this block of code next to else are executed. All right, now let's use if else in Python. Now I have a blank Python file under my exercise directory. If you don't have the directory, you can right click your uh, Python sandbox directory and a new and create directory. And if you do not uh, have any file for use, you can create a new one. It doesn't matter what file name you use. It's just uh, for uh, writing a temporary code here. So you can right click exercises, new and uh, Python file. All right, I have already created this file. It's blank. Now let's write some um, if else statements here. A simple one is this. If, let's use any comparison condition. If for equals four, print something here. How about that? Save it. Now, noticing um, the syntax here. First of all, you have this colon at the, at the end of this if statement. And also, you need to make sure you have correct indentation after if, because this defines the associated block when the first when the above Boolean expression is true. So you can have multiple statements here, here, here too. Okay, save it, and let's run it. Before we run it, we should know what the expected outputs are, because four equals to four, so this must be true we should see this two-line output. Right-click this and run this file. Okay, now in this output window, you see two lines are printed. That's our expected results. Still in the same file, let's do something a little different. This is too trivial. Get rid of this. Now I have this defined somewhere, I copied it here. Now we have a function. Remember a function is defined by use def keyword. So we use this function to check if a number passed into it is an even number or is an odd number. Now if it is an even number, we just print, print it is an even number. If it is an odd number, we print it is an odd number. Now this percent operator, this percent operator is, well, in fact, modulo operator. So if A is divided by two, or the remainder of A divided by two is zero, that means A is an even number. If A divided by two, if the remainder of a divided by two is not a zero, then it must be an odd number. Of course, here we assume a is an integer number here. So we define a function that checks whether a number is odd or even. Now, this is our simple tests. Look at this. Again, the grammar for if test is uh, same as the one I showed above. You have this if test with colon at the end of it. And this is the comparison. If this is true, this is executed. If this is true, this is executed. Now we have two tests here. First, we check if Number six is even or odd. 
or number five, the second one we check five. Now when six is passed into this function, so this because becomes six, a is a six. Six definitely can be divided by two. There's no remainder of it, so six is even number. This one is executed. It would output this. And a six divided by two is zero. So this is false. So this can be printed when this is called. Now how about this? Let's just run the first test. Check even or odd v0 6. So we expect only this should be output. Save the file, right click, and run it. Now you see in the output, we only see 6 is an even number printed. So this line is executed. Now this is the how we format uh, output. This is how we format an output using print statement. This percent %s is a placeholder you can pass, you can use to print a string type. The s stands for a string type. And this is output as is. Now the percent sign here separate the format and the argument you want to plug in into this. So you, we have only one percent as here. So we only pass, we only need to supply one argument after the person sign. So whatever a here, it'll be in this percent s. Okay, now let's comment this one, enable this one. Five is an odd number. So when the argument is five, we invoke this method, this variable a becomes five. And a five modular two does not equal to zero. It has remainder one. So this is not executed. And a five modular two, yeah, we just said it, it does not equal to zero. So this is executed. Now let's run it. And in fact, I can click this to run it. Okay, you see five is an odd, odd number. That means this line gets executed, which also means this condition is true. Some of you probably have noticed or realized, in fact, when we check whether number is an even or odd number, we don't need to test both this and this. We really, all we need to do is just to check one of them because for integer number, it can either be divided by two or not. So only one of this is needed. Now let's have another version of this check even or odd function implementation. So we call this new version of checking all or even uh, v1. So let's collapse this. And uh, we still want to use the same test cases, but this time we want to call the v1 version, v1 version of it. Save it. Now this is the perfect place we use if else. So if a number modular 2 equals 0, which means it has no remainder, also means it's, it can be divided by 2, it must be an even number. So th if this is true, number a is even. If it is not true, that comes to this else block. 
which implies A is an odd number. Now let's save it and run it. Now we see the same results. Here, if a number can be divided by 2, and this condition is true, this block associated with if is executed. If this is not true, which implies the else part is true, the else part will be executed. So this block of statements and this block of statements are kind of mutual exclusive. Only one of them will be executed depending on the true or false of this if test. Now the if statement can also work on a compound conditions or Boolean expressions, meaning a condition chained to another condition by logical operators. For example, here I have a simple function. I call it a filter func. And what this does is if a number passed in that can be divided by 3 and the number is greater than 20 and less than 30, I just uh, print this number. Otherwise, this number is not what we want. So the condition here really has three comparisons. The first one, we check if A can be divided by 3. The second one, we check whether A is greater than 20. The third one is we check whether A is less than 30. And remember, in Python, you really can chain the comparison. So this basically means A is greater than 20 and A is less than 30. And it's pretty concise here. We have two test cases here, 10 and 20. We are expecting 21 should be printed out as um, 21 should pass the future. So 21 should be printed in this string, meaning 21 is multiple of 3 and greater than 20 and less than 30. And when 10 is passed into this function, when 10 is passed into this function, it does not satisfy the condition at line 3. So line 6 will be executed when 10 passed into this function. Save it and run it. Okay, 10 is not the number we want. And 21 is multiple of 3 and greater than 20 and less than 30. The if-else statements can be more complicated than we just saw. A if can be embedded with another if, and you can nest if within if. For instance, here, if this Boolean expression true or uh, Boolean expression zero is true, it executes this statements. Inside it, you can test another condition. Boolean expression 1. And if Boolean expression 1 is true, you execute something, and then you can test another Boolean expression, Boolean expression 2. And of course, we know the if statements does not have to have else with it. So this if will be, uh, if this if executed, then that's the end of this whole thing. Now let's take a look at um, a semi-real example. Suppose we are operating a robot. The first thing when we start a robot, for the robot itself, it needs to do some initialization work. So we have a function, we define it, we define it as robot initialize. 
And the first thing the robot wants to do is to check its battery. So if check battery works, the function the check battery function returns true, meaning it passed the battery check. It will do load memory, reload memory, reload something from its past, and start a communication and initialize vision, for example. So you need the battery to work, and then you can initialize vision. So if the robot is able to initialize its vision, it can take action to scan surroundings. Otherwise, initialize vision fails. It just log a message. Uh, it can keep moving on to the next uh, initialization work, initialize motion. I don't know, maybe the robot can really move without the vision. It's not entirely impossible. So initialize motion. If initialize motion succeeds, it will exercise motion. If initialize motion fails, which means it returns false, we just log. Log, log something, whatever you want. Now, we go back to this, if check battery fails, the whole block here associated with the true of check battery will not be executed. The else part will be executed. So if check battery fails, meaning it returns false, now line 15 and 16 will be executed sequentially. So first, it would send a message, and then go go to sleep. Now you see in this, now in this stopped code, I have if else nested within another if. And the things can be more com even more complicated if necessary, meaning you can have many if nested within if. There's no limits of how many if you can nest it. Although there a readability issue if you have too many ifs embedded within another if or too many levels of nesting the ifs. So here I have only really here I have only two levels. Now let's review a little bit of this if else again. So when this condition is true, the whole block of code from line 3 to 13, which associated with the true of check battery at line 2, can be executed. And the execution is from the, the beginning from line 3 to line 13, one at a time, one by one. So if this becomes true, if line 2, if check battery is true, it would do line 3, reload memory first, then line 4, start communication, then executes line 5. Line 5 is another if test. So if it is true, we execute 6, line 6. If it is not true, we execute line 8. After that, we move on to line 10 to check if we can initialize motion. If it is true, we exercise motion. If it is not true, we, exercise, we, we run, we just log. Now, if line 2 is false, the whole block will not be executed. Also, keep in mind the indentation. The indentation here, meaning the start of each statement in this block must be the same. So this defines a block associated with this if. And this is really associated this is scan surroundings, 
Noticing it is indented after this if, after line five's if. So this is surrounding, this is scan surroundings statement is associated with this if. By the same token, these two lines, they are aligned at the same column. They are indented to the right of the else. So these two lines are the block when the else part is true. The else part is true when check battery returns false. And when else is true, first thing it executes the first line in this block, send a message, and then the next line go to sleep. Now I think this concludes our discussion about the basic usage of if else statements. Numbers can be expressed by using any base. We are more accustomed to base 10 numbers, which are decimals. For each digit in the decimal number, it can have only a number from 0 to 9. For binary number, each digit can, can be either 0 or 1. We use decimal numbers every day, however, we use decimal numbers every day. In fact, we use binary numbers every day as well, just uh, in an indirect way, because computers use binary numbers, and your cell phone is a computer. You use your cell phone every day. For any number, depending on the base, it can be expressed by summation of each of the digit times to the base to the power corresponding to that uh, digit. The rightmost digit is at position zero. And from right to left, the position increments by one at a time. So for a decimal number, dn, dn minus one to d zero, it equals to dn times 10 to n plus dn minus 1 times 10 n minus 1 plus and all the way to d0 times 10 to 0. Again, the rightmost digit would denote its position 0. And uh, for decimal number is uh, for decimal number is one's position. And the position increments from right to left one at a time. So the leftmost digit we denote as position n. Now for binary number, it can be expressed the same way except the base is 2 instead of 10. Now let's do this step by step using a few examples. Now suppose we have a four-digit decimal number, 1990. Well, let me have a subscript here, D. So it denotes this is a decimal number. Like we said, from the right, starting from the rightmost to the leftmost, the position starts from zero. So the zero, the ones, is at position zero. And the tens is position one. And nine, position two. And this, the leftmost one, is position three. So this decimal number is equal to the leftmost position, one, the digit at the leftmost position, one, times Remember, it's a decimal number, so the base is 10, and raised to the power of 3. 3 is really the position of the leftmost digit. Then keep going, plus 9, this hundreds, 9, times 10 to power 2, and plus 9. This 9 is really this, tens times 
10 to power 1 plus 0. Now this digit is 0. Again, base is 10 to power 0. So this equivalents to 1000 plus 900 plus 90 plus 0. And it is 1990. Now, what about uh, a binary number? For example, a binary number 1010. And again, the position starts from the rightmost 0, 1, 2, 3. And also keep in mind for binary number, each position can be either 0 or 1. So it's impossible for a binary number. So it's impossible for you to see a binary number has a number other than zero or one. What this equals to is let's start from the left most digit. It is one times. Now you know the base of binary number is two to the power of what three, because. This is really at the third position. Plus this one, zero, times again base two to two. Plus this digit, one, times two to one. Plus zero, times two to zero. Now this equals to 8 plus 0 plus 2 plus 0, and this is 10. Let me put a subscript here. So 1010 zero, zero binary equals to or equivalent to a decimal number 10. Make sure uh, the numbers are in binary. Otherwise, 1010 zero, zero may be confused as uh, uh, 1010. So here, I have a sub subscript P, B here to denote 1010 zero, zero is a binary number. And it is 10 in decimal. So if you're interested, we can, we can work on another example. 1111 one, one, one. equals to 1 times... 2 to 3, 1, 2 to 2, 1 times 2 to 1, 1 times 2 to 0. This would be 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. So this is 15. So 1, 1, 1, 1. Yeah, let me better put a subscript here. So it is a binary number, 1111, binary number is uh, 15 in decimal. So in other words, a number 15 decimal in computer, you will say 1111. For decimal number 10 in computer, you actually would say 1010. Also here for the binary numbers, uh, here are possible numbers. There, there's no sign involved because uh, negative binary numbers are represented differently. This table shows you the same number represented using different base. The first column is the usual decimal, base 10 numbers. The second is the binary we just talked about. And the third column is hexadecimal number. The hexadecimal number is base 16. So for hexadecimal number, each digit can have a number from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, all the way to F. So here for hexadecimal number, A, B, C, D, e, F, in fact, is a number. So if you say in a number, hexadecimal number, a digit A, it represents a decimal number 10. B is equal to a decimal number 11. 
and f is equal to a decimal number 15. In computer programming, we use both binary and hexadecimal. The hexadecimal probably is more succinct. For example, uh, decimal number 15, you need to write four digits. However, if you use hexadecimal, you only need to write one letter. Now, the next question is how do we represent a negative integer number in binary? We need a sign in the binary to tell us whether it is a positive or negative number. Now, the sum bit we use is the most significant bit, which is the leftmost bit. If the leftmost bit is zero, it is uh, positive or zero. If the leftmost bit is one, it is a negative number. And for a negative number, the formula of converting it to a decimal is the same. A negative number, negative integer number, is represented by using two's complement. One of the reasons for using two's complement is uh, for ease of arithmetic by hardware. Okay, now I have a few numbers here. Each of these integer numbers can be stored in one byte. A byte in computer equivalents to 8 bits. And each bit is really uh, a single position in the binary, which can take 0 or 1. For number 0, the binary representation is all, all zeros in each of its bits. Now for positive number 1, remember we said the first digit, the leftmost digit, 0 means it's positive. So this is positive 1. Then how to store a negative 1? A negative 1, remember, first thing is the sum bit should be 1. 1 indicates this integer number is negative. And we said for negative number, we use 2's complements to store it. 2's complement is really 1's complement plus 1. Now, number 1 binary is this. It's complements. It's just uh, the flip of each of the bit. Okay, so this is positive number 1, and this is the complement of number 1. And the 2's complements is really the one's complement plus one. So negative one is this number, one, 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 one. This is negative one in binary format using two's complements. Now what about negative number two? Very similar. This is number two. And its complement is the flip of each of the bit. And then two's complement plus one. Now one plus one in binary zero. Then we carry carry one here. 1. All the remaining are still 1. So for negative 2, the number is 1111111110. Now what about uh, negative 127? Interesting, you see, we for the positive 127, 
This actually is the largest positive number uh, a byte can store because the first bit has to be zero for the positive number. And all the rest of the bits are one that makes the, the number the biggest. You can't have a positive number more than 128 in a byte. Now for negative 128 is the complement. Once complement, then plus one. So this is negative one hundred and twenty seven. So far the for the one byte integer numbers, the positive and negative are symmetric. So you have a positive 127, and you have a negative 127. But for the negative numbers in one byte, you got one extra number. That's negative 128. The negative 128 is really 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. For a byte, which has 8 bits, with each bit has only two possibilities. So the total possibilities is really 2 to 8 equals 256. So in other words, you, you can store 256 distinct numbers by using one byte. And here, for the integer numbers, for one byte, we store we can have from zero from one to one hundred twenty-seven. That means one hundred twenty-seven positive numbers, and one zero, and from minus one to minus one hundred twenty-eight. That is one hundred twenty-eight negative numbers. The nice thing about using two complements is if you notice, I if I plus. 1 and minus 1, it is 0. So in other words, the subtraction is essentially the addition. So we almost convert the sub subtraction to addition. That's the purpose of using uh, two's complements. Now let's do some binary numbers arithmetic. It's not very different from uh, decimal numbers. So the first uh, one is 001 plus 0010. And I have the subscript B denoting these numbers are binary. So we, we align the digits and then we add each of them. 1 plus 0 is 1, and 0 plus 1 is 1. And then these two are 0. So 0, 0, 1, 1, and this is decimal 3. So there's no carry involved in the first uh, addition. Let's look at the second one. Again, two binary numbers, 0, 0, 0, 1 plus 0, 0, 1, 1. We align the digits or the bits. We start from the rightmost bits. 1 plus 1 is 0 but we need to carry, okay? There's one carried to the next bit. So this one plus this one is zero, and again, we have a carry. And the carry plus zero, zero is one, zero. So this is decimal four. Why is this decimal four? Remember, we can convert from binary to decimal by using uh, each of the digit times the base to the power of that uh, corresponding to that digit. So this is really two, two. So which is four? 
Now the next one, a negative number, minus 2 plus 1. The first bit is y, indicating this is a negative number. And remember, negative number is represented by using two's complements. And a decimal minus 2 is really 1110 in binary. So minus 2 plus 1 decimal in binary is 1110 plus 111001. This is 1111. So this is minus 1 in decimal. Now, again, minus 2 plus 1 is, th is the same as 1 minus 2. So like I said before, the subtraction becomes addition. That's the nice thing about using complements. We now know how integer numbers are represented in binary format. And what about uh, non-integer numbers? Many number with fraction portion. Floating port numbers represented with three parts. This is a four byte floating point number. The first bit, the leftmost bit, is the sum bit, very similar to the integer number. If it is zero, this number is positive or zero. If it is uh, one, this number is negative. From a bit 30 to bit 23, these are the exponent. So the next 8 bits from uh, uh, following the sign are for exponent. From a bit 22 to bit 0, these are the significant. So this is the format for 4-byte floating point. So we will not go to the very detail of this. We may come back to this when necessary. We have learned string and some of its basic operations in previous lesson. And we know each letter in a string is a number, in fact, in the computer. For instance, a lowercase a, a lowercase character a, the number for it is 97. So in computer, 97 is for a character A. Now this way of encoding these letters are called uh, ASCII encoding. So this table is called ASCII table. It has the mapping of each of these English letters or symbols to a number. And the number in the computer, in the end, is still a binary format. When you compare a string letter by letter, in fact, it's comparing the underlying encoded number. Next, I'd like to talk briefly about bitwise operations. When we do bitwise operations, we are not really concerned about if there's a sign in the byte. All the bits in the byte are treated the same. The first one, we are doing bitwise AND. The bitwise AND operator is this ampersand. For bitwise AND, when two bits are 1, the result is 1. Otherwise, the result is 0. We align the bits of two binary number. 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 1, 0. We can start from the rightmost uh, bit. 0 and 0 is 0. 1 and 1 is 1. Both bits are 1, it is 1. 0, 0 is 0. 0 and 1 is 0. So the result of this bitwise end is 0, 0, 1, 0. Only when two bits are 1, the result bit is 1. 
Now the next operation is called a bitwise OR. The symbol is a vertical bar. For a bitwise OR, the result bit is 1 as long as one of them is 1. We start from the rightmost bit. 0, 0 is 0. 1, 1 is 1. One of them is 1. Two ones, still 1. 0, 1, 0 is 1. Now the next operation is called bitwise exclusive OR. The operator is this uh, upper arrow. This upper arrow, you can find this upper arrow in number 6. For bitwise exclusive OR, the result bit is 1 if the two bits are different. 0, 0, the same, so it's 0. 1 and 1 is the same, so it's 0. 0, 0, the same, 0. Now, this last uh, bits, one of them is 0, another one is 1, they're different. So, the bit, result bit, is 1. This is called exclusive OR. The next bitwise operation is called invert. Invert basically flips each of the bit. So, 0 becomes 1, 1 becomes 0. 0 becomes 1, and 1 becomes 0. There are two shifts operators. One is called left shift. It's left, it's double left arrows. If I shift by one, this becomes, this shift one to left by one. This becomes zero, one, zero, zero. So this one shifted to the left by one. Now this two right arrows is called right shift. If I shift by one, this would shift this one to this position. So this becomes zero, 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 one. Now you can keep shifting it. If you keep shifting it, for example, if I keep shifting it by another one, this becomes zero, 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 zero. So this one shifted out. So there's no circular in this case. Now I want this whole lesson for you is for knowledge wise. The bitwise operations are used a lot in automations. And each bit here may represent a state of a sensor. Hi, I'd like to keep talking branching in Python programming in today's lesson. Suppose we want to have a function that returns the day of week in a string. Because in computer program, sometimes we store the day of week as a number. The reason of doing that is for ease of computation. Numbers are good for computation. However, when we want to display the day of week back, we want to display them as a string. For instance, 1, we should display Monday, and Tuesday for 2, and Wednesday for three, etc. We have learned if else, and one of the ways of doing that is obviously using if else. So here I have a function, I define it as day of week underscore v0. v0 basically, basically means this is not our final solution. It takes one argument day and the valid range of this argument is from a 1 to 7. Now, inside this function block, first we check if day is equal to 1. If it is 1, we print Monday. If it is not, we check if it is 2. If it is 2, it is Tuesday. If not, we keep checking. The last, we check if day is Seven. That means if the days we have checked are not one of one to one up to six, then last we check for the seven. If it's seven, it is Sunday. If it's not, that means we have checked 
from one to seven, and none of that equal to the input argument, and then we have to to say this state is not defined. All right, let's uh, run this function day of week underscore v zero one. Let's check one first. Click this button. And sometimes I think you can right click on this file, the tab. You can also find the current active tab is the file. And you run it. Monday. So the output is Monday. And let's check another day. How about six? It should be Saturday. All right, it is Saturday. Then what about nine? We know nine is out of the valid range. Run it, not defined. Everything seems all right so far. And uh, if you want, you can check all the other inputs. They should be all good. If we, all we know is if else, this might be the only way of doing it. However, if you really look at this program, even it has only how many? Uh, 24 lines of code. But you see, there are so many if else nested within another if else. This definitely doesn't offer a good readability. So in Python, there is a slightly better way of doing this, given a case like this. I say slightly better way of doing this is because for a task like this, you actually have a third option. But let's look at this second slightly better way of doing this. Now let's take a look at the second way of doing this day of week. And I have the function defined as day of week underscore v1. It's a improved version of getting a string representation of day of week. It still takes only one argument, a number. The valid range of this argument is from one to seven. Obviously, there's only seven days in a week. The difference here is really, instead of nesting if else within else, we use L if. What that means is if the above condition are false, then it moves on to check this L if. For example, when we come into this function, we first check at line 27 if day equals to 1. If it is equals to 1, that condition is true. And this block and this statement is executed. It prints Monday. If this is true, the rest of this will not be executed. If this is not true, if day is not equal to 1, it moves on to check the next L if. It checks if day equals to 2. If day equals to 2, it prints Tuesday. If day is not 2, so this condition is false, it moves on checking the next L if. Once it finds a match, once a condition is true, the whole function ends, or this whole if else block ends. So, for example, if day is five, it would come to here, and because day is five, then this is true, and this prints Friday, and it exits or it goes to the end of this whole if elif else block. Now we have the last else. That's kind of a catch-all condition. Meaning if the day is not in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it goes to this else part, not defined. So if you really think about this, this is not 
very different from if else. Then you embed another if else. It, but this does offer a much better readability, and the whole block becomes much more clear. So this if else if else multi way branching sometimes very helpful. It manages your code in a much better way. The key point here is once one of this if or elif condition is true, the rest of these conditions are not checked. Now let's test this new def week uh, implementation. All right, so this time it's going to be v1. And uh, let's test one. Run it. Okay, Monday. Correct. What about uh, three? Wednesday. Now let's check eight. This should go to that else part. Not defined. This is our expected results. The second way of doing this indeed provides a better readability and the second function has less length of code. It's much more easier to read than uh, the, the first version. However, like I said, there's a third option that probably is the best. The third one, in fact, is using a dictionary. Remember, a dictionary is a collection of key value pair. So in our case, the key would be the day in numeric format, and the value would be the string representation of the day of week. So using a dictionary, you can um, very efficiently to retrieve the string day of a week given a number, given the day as a number. But since we are talking about if else, the multi-way conditioning uh, branching, we will skip the dictionary part. Now let's look at another example using if, elif, else. And this time what we want to do is to have a function that converts a score, a numerical score to a letter grade. The score could be uh, the, uh, the overall score of one of your courses. If your score, your overall score is greater than or equal to 100, your final grade is a plus. And if your overall score is from 95 to 100 exclusive, then your letter grade is A. And there are several grades from A plus to D or D to A plus and depending on where your overall score falls in the interval. Now here's the function. The function name is get letter grade. It takes one argument, score, and the argument should be a numerical type. The implementation seems to be very simple. We can just uh, basically follow the rules defined above. So if your score is greater than or equal to 100, then your letter grade is a plus. So if this condition is true, this block, this statement gets executed, and the rest of this will be skipped. And if your score is not in this range, it moves on to check if your score is greater than or equal to 95. So the order of checking the score here actually plays a role. Because if your score is less than 100, the first condition is false. It moves on to the second L if. So when it reaches to this line, when it checks this score, the score already less than 
a hundred. So you don't need to check the score in the the line five L if if it is less than a hundred. It's already checked before. Okay, so if score is greater than ninety five here, it or it basically means the score is greater than ninety five and less than a hundred. So it returns A. So if this is true, we return A. Now, if this is not true, it moves on to the next L if. It checks the score if the score is greater than 90. The check here is sufficient because when you reach to line 17, checking whether a score is greater than or equal to 90. That means the above two conditions are false, which means the score can't be, can't be greater than 95. So here, in fact, it implies the score is less than 95. If this is true, that means your score already falls into that 90 to 95 range. So you can return a minus one. I'm sorry, you can return a minus. The following are all the same. So here you still use if, else, if, else, but the trick here is the order of the checking, somewhat important. This is a no surprise because each L if only gets executed when the above conditions are false. Okay, let's uh, test a few cases. So I have already typed in. So let's save us some time and uh, let's run it. Okay, the first one is A plus. 101 is A plus. 98A, 91A minus. 85B plus 82B. Well, that looks correct. We have learned variables and functions. We know we can use variables to store data, and we have used variables in some simple functions. Now we need to learn the concept of variable scopes. Without a good understanding of this, it may cause mistake and confusion later. Now I have a blank Python file. It has nothing so far. Let me do something. Print x. If we run this, obviously we know the x has, has not been defined. It would cause a name error error because x is not defined. Now what about if I define x after that x assign 20 to x if i run this would this print still uh, error out let's try it run it still because python is interpreted it's not compiled so when it's, when it executes the first line the x is not assigned yet so it doesn't know where to get x, even though x is uh, uh, assigned later. Now, if we print x after, comment this out, this should be fine. If we run it, yeah, x is 20, because at length 3, the x has been assigned and known to this file. I added two more functions in this file, func0 and func1. func0 has a local variable a, and we assign 10 squared to it. Coincidentally, func1 has a variable name also called a, and we assign 10 cubed to it. The variable a here we see it as a local variable. It is only visible within the function. 
So this a at line six after it is assigned ten squared, it can be only referenced in function in function zero, of course, after line six. And this a at line ten, after it is assigned ten cubed, it can only be referenced within func one. So if you comment this line out, func one will not work. The a is not defined. Even you may argue, oh, there's a, a defined in line six. But like we just said, this a is only visible by ref by function zero, only visible within func zero. So let's remove this comment. And again, both this a in func zero and this a in func one are local to their respective function. And if you print a a here outside of func zero or func one, it would not run because a is not defined anywhere in this file outside of these two functions. You run it. Yeah, you see name A is not defined. Line 13. All right, let's uh, comment this out. And let if you're interested, you can run this func 0 and func 1 and run it. So func 0a is 100. And func 1a is a thousand. I added another function, func2 here. Func2 is simple. At line 18, it checks a variable called x. If it is greater than 100, it prints func2 x is greater than, greater than 100. Otherwise, it prints x is less than or equal to 100. Now, notice at line 18, func2 can directly reference a variable called x without any problem. That's because this x is defined at the very beginning of this file, at line 2. Well, when we have a variable defined outside of function in a file, we call this variable has a global scope, global in this file. So everywhere after line 2 in this file, this variable should be able to be used. That's why we can do this here without error. So if we run it, it should print this because x is 20, it's less than 100. So let's run it. Yep, x is less than or equal to 100. So in other words, within a function, it can reference a variable defined outside of it, so long that variable is at a file level. It has a global scope. And what about if we have another function, func3? Within it, it assigns a value to a variable x. Now we have a global variable named x. We also have a local variable named x. This local variable x, by assignment, it hides, it shadows the global one. So x at line 26 is 200. And x is greater than 100. We should see this, this line printed out if we run func3. The difference between line 26 and line 18 is line 18 references a variable directly, and that variable is at a global scope. And line 26 assigns a value to a variable. The variable happens to be the same name as a global variable. This x shadows, yeah, shadows 
the global x and within func three the x after line after line twenty six it is the value two hundred and it should print this however at line twenty six this variable is still kind of local. It's just the shadow, so the highest the global one. But it doesn't replace the global one. So after func three, if we print x, this x is still the global x. So let's run it. Func three because x is 200. Now this is true. It prints this. x is greater than 100. Now after that, we print x. Now this x is still the global one which has not been changed. Now we know a function local variable with the same name as a global variable hides that global variable. If that is your intent, meaning you want to use, you just want to use the name of the global variable, not the value of the global variable, it is fine. It has the global variable, you use the same name inside the function, you do whatever you want, and the global variable is not affected. However, what if you do not just want to use the name of the global variable, you essentially want to reference the global variable directly in the function. You use this global keyword. That way, whatever you do inside of this function after this global, global x, this x is no longer a local variable to func4. It is the global x defined at line to at the very beginning of this file. So if you reset or you do you modify the you modify the x, it actually changes the global x value. So let's run this program. All right, func four x is a zero. That's this line. We set it to zero, and the global one this x becomes zero now. Next, let's discuss loop in Python. Suppose we need to print 10 different numbers using print statement, and we are asked to print one number at a time. Of this one way of doing it is write 10 print statement. However, this doesn't seem to be very appealing, because what if we are asked to print a hundred numbers or even more. And to make sense worse, what if we don't know the numbers in advance? Like other general programming language, Python provides a loop language construct to deal with situation like this. With a loop, you can repetitively execute a block of statements. Now, one type of loop in Python is called a while loop. To be exact, is while else loop, because there's a else part following the while part. Now, here's our simple while loop example in Python. The while loop starts by testing a Boolean expression. As long as that Boolean expression is true, a block of statements will be executed repetitively. So in our case, at length three, we test a number, a variable x, if x is less than 10. If x is less than 10, the execution goes into this while body, goes into this while loop, and executes the first statement in the while loop, which is line four, and then line five. After line five, the execution goes back to line three. As long as line three evaluates true, 
line four and line five are executed repetitively. If line three is false, the execution jumps to the else part by executing the first statement in the else part. That's line seven. And then line eight, then exits the while else loop, execute the first line after the while else loop, which is line 10. So the execution goes like this. At line two, we assign one to x, local variable x, x is one now. It goes, then the execution goes to line three. At this time, x is less than 10. So it enters this while loop. And first it prints the current x value, which is one. And of course, we don't want to print a new line after it prints one. And we append a blank space after the print. After that, we increment the variable by one. So x becomes two now. After line five, it goes back to line three and test that condition again. At that time, x is two, it's still less than 10. So the loop keeps running, the prints two, and then increment two by one, x becomes three. And then it goes back to line three again. So as long as x is less than 10, it will keep printing the number and then increment. So you can say when x is 9, it will still go to the inside this loop and print 9. After 9, x increments by 1, it becomes 10. Once it is 10, it goes to 3, and 10 is not less than 10, and that condition becomes false. So it enters this else part, print a new line, and also print another line telling you the end value of x, which is 10. So we can, without running this, we should be able to say this one executed nine times. It prints the number from one to nine. This is printed only once. Okay, let's run this example. Run it. Okay, exactly that's what we said. It prints nine numbers. This number, these nine numbers came out of this loop, this while part. And then we print, we see another line printed after that. That's exit loop x is 10. That's this one. This is executed only once. The second example is about using while loop to iterate through a list. And this time we don't have the else part because the else part is optional. Now first, at line 13, we initialize a list. This list contains 10 elements. At line 14, we get the length of the list. Line 16, we initialize an index, a local variable index to zero, because that's the first position of the list. And the list in Python is zero index based. Line 17 to 919 defines this while loop. As long as the index, which is the position pointing to the list, as long as that position is valid, is less than the length of the list, we can retrieve the element at that position. All we want to do is, like the example one, just print it. After we print it, we increment the index by one. That will move the position to the 
Next, after line nineteen, it goes back to the beginning of the while and test this expression again. So long index is less than the length of the digit of the list. Line eighteen and nineteen are executed repetitively. Now, important thing here is we keep increment index at the end of each loop, so that would guarantee at a certain point of time this condition becomes false. If the condition never becomes false, you end up in an infinite loop. Of course. For our first lesson about the while loop, we are not so worried about that. Now let's run this example. While loop example two, run it. All right. You see, the elements in the list are printed one by one. All right. Another simple while loop example. While loop example three. It's a while loop without the else part. First, it prints a blank line, and at line twenty-three, we initialize this local variable to zero, and line twenty-four to line twenty-seven defines this while loop. As long as height is less than five, we print a number of.、Uh, Characters. The character is asterisk. How much to print depends on the height. If height is zero, zero plus one is one. The number of characters is one. So this character times one is one. That means you print just one asterisk. After that, you increment height. As long as height is less than five, line twenty-five to line twenty-seven are executed. Repetitively. Now this while loop is executed five times. The first time height is zero. Second height is one. Third height is two. Four four times the height is three. When height is four, it executes fifth time. After the fifth time, height becomes five, and then line twenty-four evaluates false. It exits the while loop. So this while loop executes five times, and each time it prints a different number of asterisks, depending on the height. Let's run it. Okay, it it prints. Something like a right triangle. There are two statements can be used、uh, with a loop. The first one is called break, which allows you to exit a loop at any point. Another one is called continue, which moves the execution to the very beginning of the loop. Now let's take a look at how we use break and continue in the loop. Here I have a function called collect random numbers. It has one argument, time interval seconds, which has a default value one. With a default value, that means when you invoke the function, for example at line thirty, without supplying the argument, the function assumes this argument has a value one. This function uses a while loop. And inside this while loop, it keeps generating random numbers and put it into the sum numbers list until the loop has been running for more than time interval seconds. In other words, this function generates random numbers within this given time interval. The first thing before entering this while loop is to recall the current time, because we need to know. How long the loop has been running? Time dot time returns a floating point number, which represents the total number of seconds since the epoch. The epoch on Windows is January first, nineteen seventy. 
So starting time is a floating point number, which represents the total number of seconds since a certain point of time. Now here's the loop. The first thing when we are in the loop is to check the current time, because we need to know if the time, if the running has elapsed the given time interval. Line 14 does exactly like that. So current time less start time. If it is more than the time interval in seconds, we are down. At line 16, it exits the while loop. When it exits the while loop, it goes to the first statement after the while loop, which is line 28. Another condition that will exit the loop is when the length of some numbers equals 100. The internal list, the sum number list, starts as empty. So whenever the list has accumulated 100 numbers, we are done. We also exit the loop. If we don't have enough numbers collected, or we still have time, now we go to 18 to generate a random integer number. Random.randint 099 returns an integer number randomly from 0 to 99 inclusively. Once we have the number, we check if it is a multiple of 3. So if it is a multiple of 3, that is x modulo 3 equals 0, meaning no remainder, it calls continue. Continue moves the control, the execution, to the top of the loop, which is line 11. And then loops again. If x is not a multiple of 3, it checks if x has been added to the list at line, 20, at line 23. If x has not been added to the list, we just simply add it to the end of the list. Line 26, we, we simply call time start slip to pause the execution for a certain number of uh, seconds. And this would just uh, limit the, the numbers in the list. So again, at line 14 and 15, if one of the conditions evaluate is true, meaning if either the loop has been running for more than this amount of seconds, or our list has enough numbers, we exit, exit the loop. The break, in fact, would exit the nearest loop associated with it. What that means is if I have a loop within a loop, the break would only exit the nearest loop. In this case, the loop started at line 11. The same thing with continue. Continue only goes to the top of the nearest loop associated with continue. Right, let's collapse this. When the loop ends, we simply return the list to the caller. Line 30, we call this function, and then 31, we print the result. So let's run it. All right, pause for about a second. And now you see there's a list with 10 different numbers in it. You run it again, you get a different result. And this time, it has only nine numbers in it. This is for obvious reason because we only generate, we only put unique numbers into, the, into this list. And there's no guarantee within this time interval we would have generate 
10 different numbers. It's random. There is another type of loop called a for loop in Python. For loop is great for iterating through a list or collection in general. Here we have a digits list and at length three shows how we use for loop to iterate through it. Now x is a variable. When used in this way, it will be assigned each element from the digits list. So for each element in digits list, what do we want to do? At line 4, we simply just print it. Of course, if you want to do more, you can have multiple statements within this for loop. Here, I overwrite the end argument with empty space. That, that means we will print each element at the same line instead of at a different line. So let's run it. All right, here's the output. Let's take a look at another example of using for loop. This time we use the built-in function range to give us a sequence of numbers to iterate through instead of using a list directly. The range function takes three arguments, start, stop, and step. All the arguments must be integer numbers. The first argument tells the range, the first element to generate, or the first integer to generate. And the second argument tells range when to stop generating the number. And the step is the offset to each preceding or previous number. So in this case, range 1, 10, 1, it would generate numbers from 1 up to 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So let's run it. Yeah, it has nine numbers because the step is one. So each element is one offset to the previous one. If you make the step to two, that will skip one number from the previous one. So if you run this again, it should be, the, uh, the result should be 1, 3, 5, something like that. Yep, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Also notice that stop number, stop argument is not included. Now let's look at another example of using range uh, in for loop. But this time, notice the start is less than the stop and the step is negative. So this actually makes a sense. So the first number generated by range is 30. The next one is 30 minus 5, which is 25. The third one is 25 minus 5, which is 20. And until the number is 0, actually 0 is not included. As long as the number is greater than 0, it would keep subtracting 5 for the next number. So let's run it. Yeah, the first number, 30. The next number is 5 less, less than the previous one. And so the third is 5 less than the second one. And the last one is 5. Because 0 is, not, zero is our stop argument, so 0 is not in the range. You can, of course, use continue and break in a for loop. So for this example, we still use range to give us a list of um, uh, integer numbers. And this time, first we check the value, the x, if it is 3 or 4. If it is 3 or 4, we continue, meaning it would uh, go, back to, go back to the top of the loop. And for this case, 
it would retrieve the second element from the range and assign it to x, and then goes into this again. If x is not 3 and not 4, then it checks if, if x is greater than 8. If x is more than 8, it exits, exits the loop. So what this for loop produces should be a list of numbers without 3, without 4. And also the number generated from, produced by this loop should not have a number more than 8. So let's run it. 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, 8. Correct. We don't have 3, we don't have 4. And we don't have a number 9, which is more than 8. All right, our last example of using for loops. And this time, what we see here is a for loop inside a for loop, which is nested in another for loop. It's a triple for loop. Before we go into this triple for loop, Let's run it. Well, from the resource, you see it's um, a different permutation of number one to three. And we know the permutation for n is n factorial. So if number, the total different numbers is three, and the total different permutation would be three factorial which is 6. So we have exactly 6 different permutations showing here. 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 1, 3, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1. That's the, all the possible permutations from number 1, 2, 3. Well, this is a very naive way of permutating numbers. Uh, however, it's still worth looking into it. And in this example, continue makes great use here. The first uh, for loop uses range 1, 4. That means I will take on a number from 1 to 2 to 3. So the possible values for I is 1 to 3. And each time we enter the first um, for loop, i changes from uh, one number to another, starting from one. Same thing with the second loop and the third loop. The trick here is the first number, the first position in the permutation is from the very outer loop, the first for loop. So you see here 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3 is from uh, this loop. And the second position is from uh, this loop. And the number for the third position is from the innermost loop. Of course, the permutation would be pre printed in the innermost loop. The trick here for the permutation, you can't have the same number for the position which has been used for the previous positions. For instance, if the first position's number is 1 and the second position's number is 2, the possible number for the third position is must be three. It can be one or two. That is exactly what line 26 does. Meaning if we have the permutation for the first positions fixed, we have to make sure we don't repeat the numbers used by the previous positions. Now the line 23 has a similar row here. So once the first position is determined. For example, if the first position has number 2, when it comes to the second loop, it checks J. J can't have 
two here. We can't repeat what the number has been used by the all the previous positions. So if j is the same as i, it would continue. It would skip that number. Anyway, this is just an illustration of using a continue, and also you can nest a loop within a loop. Uh, to really do a permutation, uh, we should use some algorithm. And in fact, what with what you have learned with the loops, the lists, and all the basic operations you can apply on a list, you should be able to come up with an algorithm that permutates any numbers. Let me explain this triple loop step by step. For each of the loop, it needs to iterate three numbers. For i, it starts number one. Then starts the second loop. The first iteration for j gets the number one. And line 23 evaluates two, one equals one. So continue moves the execution to the nearest for loop. It continues to the next value for j, which is 2. Now, line 23 is false. It goes to 25 and uh, starts the iteration for k. The first value for k from the range is 1. And Line 26, it checks whether k equals to j or i. At this point of time, k equals to i. So continue back to the for uh, k loop and guess the next number for k, which is 2. And a 2 still equals to 1 of i or j. So continues again. Get the next number from the range, it is a 3. Now, line 26 is false. Execution goes to 28. 28 prints our first permutation. 1, 2, 3. After that, the innermost loop ends. Now, for each loop, it needs to loop through three different numbers. We, for the, the innermost loop completed, but the second loop, not yet. It needs to move on to the next number, three. And a three is not equal to one. So the innermost loop, the goes, execution goes to the innermost loop, the K loop, and it starts all over again. The first one for it is one, too bad. 1 is the same as i. Then next number, 2. All right, 2 is not the same as i or j, so we can print this combination. 1, 3, 2 now. After 2 is done, k gets the next number from the range, which is 3. But a 3 is the same as j. So it continue, continue, but it's already the end of it. The innermost loop finishes. Now it goes to the execution goes to the second loop, J loop. J loop completes, and then it goes back to the outer loop. Outer loop gets its the uh, gets its next value two. For each of the outer loop, the next loop will iterate three times. When i is 2, j starts from 1 again. And 1 is not equal to 2, and k starts its iteration. 1, not good. 2, not good. 3, okay, it is good. Then we print one, 2, 1, 3. Now the second number in the second loop, 
2. 2 equals to 2, continue. And next number, 3. Now, line 23 is false. We can go to the innermost loop and start all over again from 1. 1 is good. So we can get 2, 3, 1. What about 2? No good. 3, no good. You can't have uh, the same number that repeated that's already showed up in the previous positions. All right. The last number in the first loop is 3. Again, for each number in the outer loop, you have 3 numbers in the next loop. So the first loop has 1, 2, 3 to iterate through. And for each of this, the second loop will iterate 1, 2, 3. The same thing for the third iteration for i. And for each of the second loop, it gets another 3. 1, 2, 3 for k. 1, 2, 3. So without this checking at line 23 and line 26, you actually would end up having 27 permutation, and most of them are duplicates. I hope this helps you understand this triple loop. We have learned the basics of uh, functions, and we know a function can take zero or more arguments. Now today I'd like to discuss more about arguments passing in Python. First of all, the general rule about arguments passing in Python is arguments are passed by assignment. For instance, I have a simple function here, func0, with one argument. And assuming this argument is a numerical type, what this function does is simple. At line 2, it doubles x. Now this times equal to 2 is a shorthand of x equal to x times 2. At line 6, when func0 is invoked, when we pass a to func0, x is assigned the value of 10, or x is assigned to the value pointed by a. So that is called passing by assignment. And also, pay attention, the x is really a local variable. So at the time when x is assigned the value of a, both x and a are 10. But inside it, x is a local variable to func0. And at line 2, x is reassigned to a different value. So what that means is 10 plus to x, x doubles itself, is 20. The print at line 3 would print 20. However, because x is a local variable and reassigned to a different value, what, what changes here at line 2 doesn't really affect the value of a. So we can run it. Let's take a look. All right. So the 20 is from line 3. It's 10 times 2, which is 20. And this 10 is from uh, line 7, which is still the value of a. So what in this case, the caller, the variable passed to the function, is not affected by what's going on inside this function. Another example, func1. Again, with just one argument. But this time, 
we assume the x can be accessed uh, by the indexer or accessed by using this uh, uh, square bracket. Now at line 13, we pass a list to func1. And then we modify the first item in the list uh, to 100. Now this time, let's see whether a will be changed by func1 or not. So let's run it. All right, now you see the list A has changed. It was 3, 5, 8, but now the first element of A is 100. Now. So this implies when you pass a list to func1, still x at the time you pass uh, a to func1, x is assigned to A, meaning X points to the same list as A uh, points to. And when you modify the X, the first item of X, because it's a list, it's a mutable. Mutable meaning changeable. A changeable object, it actually, what you modified inside the function affects affected was the, the value outside of the function that passed into it. So difference, the difference between func1 and func0 is really the func0's argument x is a immutable type, a number, but for func1, it is a mutable type, a list. So depending on the type you passed into the function, the value passed into the function may be affected. So if you don't want the function to modify the value passed into it, what you can do is make a copy before you pass, pass it into the function. So here we still have the list a equals to 3, 5, 8. And we call func1 as usual, but this time we use a slicing to make a copy of A. So this, we call this, this creates a copy of A, it's a different version of A, and pass it to X. So the modification done inside the func1 will be on this copy, not the original A. So let's run it. Now you say A is still 3, 5, 8. So this is important. If you don't want your function to modify uh, the value passed into it, especially the value is a list type of uh, uh, value or mutable type, you can make a copy before you pass it into the function. We have seen functions with uh, multiple arguments in previous lessons and homeworks. And we know we match the arguments by their positions. And this is the most uh, commonly used way of matching arguments. And it's virtually uh, the way most languages use. For instance, func2 with three arguments, x1, x2, x3. And when we call func2 at line 4 with three, one, eight, three arguments, and uh, three, is passed to x1, and 1 is passed to x2, and 8 is passed to x3. So the numbers are matched from left to right by their position. And in fact, if you miss one argument in func2, you would get a, a, an error. So let's run this example. Now you see the printout, x1 is 3, x2 is 1, and x3 is 8. So the arguments are matched by their position, from left to right. Another way of matching arguments to functions is by the argument's name. At line 6, I still pass three arguments, but this time I specify which 
argument takes which value. So first one, x1 equals 3, x3 equals 1, x2 equals 8. So that means 3 is assigned to the variable x1 and 1 is assigned to variable x3 and 8 is assigned to the argument uh, x2. So this way you don't really uh, need to match the argument from left to right because they are matched by the keyword, by the variable name. So let's run it. x1 is 3 and x2 is 8. So it knows because we said x2 is 8 and then x3 is 1. Well, you can actually mix uh, the arguments passing by position and the keyword or the function of uh, the argument's name. So for example, at line 8, I invoke this function first by passing a value directly. This should match to uh, the first argument in this function. And the remaining arguments are matched by their name. So 1 is passed to x1, and 8 is passed to x3, and 3 is passed to x2. So if we run it, x1 is 1, x2, 3, x3, 8. Yeah, that's exactly what we, we passed. One catch here is though, when you mix matching arguments by position and keywords, you need to start uh, by matching, uh, you need to start matching by the position first, and then specify a matching by the variable names. So if you have the name started first, and then you change it to matching by the position, you would get an uh, error. We know if a function has three arguments, and when we invoke the function, typically you need to pass three values, three arguments for it. Uh, however, with a case like func3, when I specify x3 equals to 0, that means you don't have to supply the argument for the third parameter uh, for func3. This is called a default value. A default value with a, param of a parameter with a default value. Now at line 4, when I invoke func3, I can only pass uh, just two arguments to it. 2, 1, and 2 will be passed to x1 and 1 to x2 because I don't really specify uh, the third argument and x3 assumes the fun assumes, th uh, assumes zero. And the uh, important thing here is uh, for arguments with a default value, they have to be defined after non-default arguments. So you cannot not have x2 um, having a default value and x3 does not have a default value. So let's run this example. Okay, you see x1 is 2, x2 is 1, and x3 assumes the default value with 0. Python also has a way of matching arbitrary number of arguments. Uh, the syntax is uh, using this asterisk args. So what this really does is when you invoke a function, func4, the first argument would be passed to x1 or matched to x1. The remaining will be matched to argument, will be matched to args as a tuple. So at line 7, when we call func4 with four arguments, the first argument string start will be passed to x1. And the remaining arguments 2, 3, 4 will be assembled as a tuple and passed to args. And at line 8, if we just uh, supply one argument start, which is a string, the start will be passed to x1. And nothing will be passed to uh, arcs. So let's run it. All right, so for line 7, we pass four arguments to it. So the first one, x1, is a start. And then we iter through this uh, arcs tuple. 
and we print each of them. You see, it's two, three, four. And also, this end is the default argument for uh, function print. And we match it by the keyword. So we want to um, append a, a space at uh, each of the print. Another way of matching arbitrary arguments is uh, using this uh, double star arcs. That actually maps the arguments into a dictionary. So when you call it, you have to specify the arguments by name so that it knows it can be created as a dictionary. With the key is the variable name, and the value is the value for that uh, argument. So if you run it, now this is a dictionary. All right, I, this, I just want to let you know there's um, another way of matching. We probably will not use uh, this uh, at this point, and we will be using this matching by tuple, the remaining arguments by tuple, like this, star arcs. Next, I'd like to talk about uh, exceptions in Python. You can think exceptions as error. And when error occurs, what do you want to do? In Python, it provides this constructor try except to do just that. For instance, at length 3, if we have a statement print 100 uh, divided by 0, obviously a number cannot be divided by 0, it must have an error there. In fact, Python will raise a zero division error. So if we want to deal with that type of error, we do this, except following this try block. And we know 100 divided by zero will raise a zero division error. Now, it's really up to us we, what we want to do in case of that error. Of course, here we just want to display it or print it. So if we run it, yeah. It just uh, simply uh, prints the error message out. But in real application, if you indeed have a zero division error like this, you probably want to catch it and do something or at least log it without crashing the program. Now you can actually have multiple catch blocks after this try block. So you still have your attempted uh, statements or execution in the try block. And after that, you can have one or more uh, except or cache block. But the important thing here is whenever you have multiple uh, cache blocks here, you need to have your most specific exception dealt with first. Then you move on to the more general one. So here, zero division error is more specific than this general exception or generic exception so you want to have this except uh, generic exception at last. And this time, notice the, the argument here is really a number. I mean, the nominator is a string. You really cannot divide a string by zero. We don't have a definition for doing that. So it cannot be this zero division error. It must be some other error. So this should provide a catch-all place for catching any type of error. So if you run it, all right, you got uh, unsupported operand types for string and int. So that's this type of uh, error we, we get. And again, here we just, uh, print, we just print the error message. Now, the application of using try except is it provides a somewhat uniform way of deal with errors. Because think about if in the try block I have a hundred lines of code, or maybe more than that. And also inside the try block you have functions nested within functions. If you want to deal with errors using a branching if else, that would make the code much, much complicated. However, if you use try except, so you can simply throw 
erase error from um, anywhere and deal with the error at a unified uh, place. And in fact, um, this type of error handling is very common in virtually many uh, mainstream programming languages. Although how to use it uh, appropriately, there are some uh, debates. We will not focus on this in our discussion today. What I want you to learn as minimum is to know how to raise an error inside a function because we need to validate the arguments, the inputs to a function. For instance, this function compute sum, uh, which takes a variable number of arguments, we know is matched to a tuple. However, if that argument has nothing in it, how do you compute the sum of those numbers? There's no number there. So in that case, from this function's point of view, it's, a, it's an error. You can't proceed. So you can simply, at line three, at the entry of the function, you check whether this argument has anything. If, does, if it doesn't have anything, you just um, raise an error. Arguments contain no elements. And, and then this way you can let the caller to deal with it because it's the caller's responsibility of dealing with uh, such error. And once you have this minimum uh, validation and in the past, you can continue on to do your arithmetic. Because here, we this is a tuple, you can iterate through it, use this for loop. So you can have a local variable s initialized to zero, and then you keep adding adding the value from x to it, then you'll get the sum of it, all right? Now, if you call this function and pass it with um, five arguments, and remember this guy really takes some uh, arbitrary number of arguments, you should be able to deal with this. And uh, it would uh, add one, two, three, four, five. You run it. Yeah, exactly, it passed the very simple minimal validation, and it returned this uh, summation of these five numbers. And if you call this function without any argument, you would get this error. Last, I'd like to show you Python assert statement. This can be very useful to validate your test cases. So assert could take two arguments. The first argument evaluates to a boolean, and the second one, the second argument is optional. That basically means if the first argument evaluates false, what the error message should be. So here, what I want to validate is compute um, sum with the three numbers. If this function is implemented correctly, then the sum of one to three should equal to six. And then this assert should pass. So if we run it, yeah, there's nothing printed out. That means it's okay, it passed. Now, what if for some reason, uh, the function is not implemented correctly? Now I commented this, so that means no matter how many numbers you pass into computer sum, it would always return zero. Certainly, it's, um, it's not a good impl implementation. This function is faulty. Now, we still do this assert. This should fail. Let's run it. All right. Now you see we got an assertion error because computer sum one to three should be six. Now this tells you there's something wrong with this um, function. Or maybe sometimes it's really your um, assertion is not uh, designed properly. But in this case, it's really the function is not implemented correctly. 
We are not going to introduce new concepts into this lesson. We'll be doing more exercises with a focus on how to use computer programs help us do some calculations or computations. The first example I have here is a function to compute geometric series. For example, here at line 23, I have a geometric series, 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 8 uh, until um, to infin infinity. So this is an uh, infinite series. And we know there's a closed form of uh, doing it. However, here we want to exercise how to use a program to add a one term at a time until uh, the sum reach to a certain precision defined by this epsilon. So this function has three arguments with the last argument uh, with the default value 0 0.01. The first argument is the first term of the geometric series. And the second argument, Q, is the common ratio. Once we know the first term and the ratio, we know all the rest of the terms. And all we need to do is to have a loop. For obvious reason, to add one term at a time until the sum reaches to the precision we need. And one thing here at line 4, we know if the ratio is greater than or equal to 1, the series won't converge. Because we cannot have the term keep increasing for, for it to converge. Now, inside this while loop, the termination condition is to check whether the difference between the current result and the previous, previous result is less than epsilon. The difference is really the sum between the sum with one extra term. So if the series already, already converges to the precision we need, we exit the loop. To begin with, we assign the first term to the result. Of course, at that time, the previous result is zero. And the previous term also is the first term. And the term added is one. So at each iteration, we calculate the current term. The current term is really the previous, re previous term times the ratio. That's from the geometric series or sequence formula. And then you add it to the sum, to the result. Once you have it, now the previous term points to the current term. Or, or the current term becomes the previous term, and we have one more term added. And then we check whether the difference is less than epsilon. If it is, we exit the loop. If it, is, if it is not, the previous result becomes the current result. And then we go back to the loop and keep adding extra terms until the difference is less than epsilon. At the end of the loop, we return the result and also the terms used for that result. Now let's run it. Use this uh, uh, example. Here the first term 1 and the ratio is 0 0.5 and we use the default uh, precision uh, epsilon, 0, 0 0.01. So let's run it. All right, see? The result from the function is a tuple. The first one is really the sum of the sequence, of the series. It's 1.99. So it's already, the precision is up to 100th now. And um, only eight terms is involved for that uh, calculation. In other words, with only adding eight terms, 
the series is pretty close to the actual value too. The, the two is really the limit of that series. So eight terms added is pretty good. Now, if you want, you can change the precision or the epsilon to, to more, for example, to one thousandth. Now you run it. All right. See the precision is up to one thousandth. And you need 11 terms to add that. Now we know the ratio does not have to be positive. So if I comment this one, sorry, comment this one and run this, this is the same series basically. However, uh, the ratio is a negative. So really, the series is 1 minus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 mi minus 1 over 8. And we know the limit of the series is, is 2 over 3. So the sign alternates. And let's see if our function uh, covers that. So run it. Well, close. This is 2 over 3. And uh, you have... 15 terms, you only need to add 15 terms to reach to this uh, precision. Let me explain this program one more time, step by step. We know a geometric series can be expressed as this. S equals to a zero, which is the first term, plus the second term is zero times Q, where Q is the common ratio. And you keep adding until a zero times Q to N. And we know if n approaches to positive limit, uh, this becomes an um, uh, infinite series, and that can converge to a certain number provided the common ratio is less than 1. Now, for computer to calculate the series one term at a time, uh, first, we have, we initialize this uh, result variable to the first term. So that's this line. And uh, at that time, the previous term also initialized to the first term. And uh, the previous uh, result is zero. We don't have uh, any uh, value for that yet. Now we enter the loop. The first uh, thing we do is to get the current term, cur calculate the current term. The current term is really in the next term you want to add to the uh, sum, add to the result. And uh, by the property of the geometric sequence, we know uh, the term is really the previous term times the ratio. So the second term is the first term times Q and the third term is uh, the second term times Q, so on and so forth. So the current term is the previous term in our program, A0 times the ratio. So the current term uh, is, I mean, the first iteration is A0Q. And you get the current term, then you add it to the result, A0Q. Now the result has two terms added. Once you get uh, the result calculated, you update the previous term with the current term, A0, Q. Kind of you move on, move on to the next term. So this is um, this line. Once that is done, you increment the counter that tracks the number of terms added. After that, of course, you do the comparison, see if the difference is less than the epsilon. If it is less than, we break the loop. If it is not, we do this. That is uh, assign the result, the result we have here to the previous result. Now this is A0 plus A0Q. Um, that's the first iteration. And then we go back to the top of the while loop 
and uh, we do the current term, calculate current term again. The current term is the previous term times Q. Now the previous term is this now. So the current term is previous term times Q, which is Q squared. And once you have that, you add it to the result. You add it to the result, then you update the previous term. You update this previous term to current term, which is a zero Q squared. And uh, after that, you compare the result, this, and uh, with um, the previous result. So the result, the difference between this is just uh, the extra term, the value of the extra term. If the extra term is less than the epsilon, we break the loop. Otherwise, the loop keeps going on. Our next example is about uh, calculating the nth term of Fibonacci sequence. This famous sequence is almost used by any computer science data structure and algorithm textbook because it is a classic example of using recursion. However, we are not doing this in recursion. We just uh, want to use a while loop to calculate the nth term and we want to use this example to learn some uh, Python programming techniques. Uh, Fibonacci sequence can be defined recursively. The nth term equals to the sum of previous two terms. For instance, I have the sequence printed out here. Starting from the third term, it is the, f the sum of the first two terms. The first term is 0, the second term is 1, so the third term is 0 plus 1, which is 1. And the fourth term is uh, a 1 plus 1, so it is 2. And the fifth term is 3, which is the 1 plus 2. Now the interesting fact about this sequence is as uh, the, se the terms uh, moves on, the sequence goes on, the ratio between term n to term n minus 1 converges to golden ratio. Now let's look into this function that computes Fibonacci sequence. This function has only one argument and it assumes an uh, uh, integer type. And at first, at line 7 and 8, we validate if the input is uh, less than or equal to 0. It must be a, a natural number. It doesn't make sense to calculate a negative term. And by definition, the first term is 0 and the uh, second term is 1. So we assign 0 to fn underscore 1 and 1 to fn underscore 2. That represents uh, the first and the second term. And also, if the user, if the caller asks for the first term or the second term, we just return directly. That's what uh, line 14 and 17 does. Now we only need to calculate the term when n is greater than or equal to 3. And uh, in order to know nth term, we must know the previous two terms. For instance, if we want to know term f5, we must know f3 and f4. In order to know f4, we have to know f3 and f2. Now, for us to calculate the term up to n, we need to start by calculating the term f3, because we know f1 and f2 already. So we initialize at line 20 i to number 2. And the first iteration at line 22 calculates the third term. The third term is the sum of first term and a second term. That's what the first uh, uh, iteration does. After we calculated that term, we move on. We assign fn underscore 1 to fn underscore 2. 
and then we assign fn to fn underscore 1. So in other words, after the first iteration, fn underscore 2 points to term 2, and fn underscore 1 points to term 3. That way, we are able to calculate the next term, the fourth term. So that's the mechanism of this loop. Every, every iteration, we calculate the current term based on the previous two terms. Once we have the current term, we move on the previous two terms uh, reference so that we can calculate the next term until we calculated the nth term. Now line 29 to line 29 to 31 is our test. We want to print the first uh, 15 terms of a Fibonacci sequence. And uh, this is the output. Our third example is a function that tests whether a number is prime or not. If it is a prime number, it returns true. Otherwise, it returns false. And we know a prime number has no factors other than one and itself. And a prime number cannot be even number unless it is two. So first, we do some quick check. At line four, if number is less than two, it can be a prime number. And if number equals to two, it is a prime number. Next, at line 10, we test whether this number is an even number because we already tested at line 7 it is whether it's a, a 2. So when it, the program reaches to line 10, it can be number 2. The number cannot be 2. So we can test whether the number is an even number. If it is even number, then we know it can be a prime number. It is a number uh, greater than, it's an even number greater than two. And we return false directly at line 12. This gives us a quick way to cut half of the possibilities. Next, from line 14 up to line 24, this is the key implementation of using trial division to find whether a number is prime. The basic idea is we start from a factor 3 and we'll try if it divides the number. We don't have to start uh, the factor from 2. We know all the prime numbers must be odd. We don't, want, we don't need to test whether that number can be divided by 2. We already tested that. So we start the trial factor from 3. And also we don't need to test the divisor, the divisor from 3 all the way to the given input number. We only need to test up to half of it. Line 17 uh, starts the loop. And line 18... It's pretty straightforward. We just test whether this factor divides the number. If the factor divides the number, we know the number has a factor of that trial factor. So it is, we return false because it is not a prime number. Otherwise, line 22, we add 2 to trial factor. So we skip one number. We don't need to test the uh, uh, whether this number can be divided by uh, an even number. So we keep running the loop. If um, there's nothing up to the trial upper bound, divides the number at line 24, returns true, meaning it is a prime number. Now this is our test case following. 
we want to test uh, a few small numbers. We know they are uh, prime numbers or they are not prime numbers. So we use assert to test that. And uh, here, line 34, we test a pretty big um, number. And uh, this, in fact, is a prime number. So let's uh, run it, see what happens. Run it. All right. It knows 4 has a factor 2, and 8 has factor 2, 9 has factor 3. And what about this um, pretty big number? Well, in fact, it is true. It took the program about one second to find out it is a prime number. If you are interested, you can uh, Google it. This number is indeed a prime number. All right, our last example. And this time, we are using Python to do some statistics. Line one, we import a random module. And line three, we assign an empty list to variable examples. Line four or five, we populate the examples with 15 floating point numbers from a normal distribution. A normal distribution is a bell-shaped distribution. And we give uh, the distribution mean 85 and a standard deviation of a 5. And this could represent a test score of a certain subject uh, for um, a class of students. And the average score is 85. And the standard deviation is 5 points. In other words, most of the students' test scores would fall in the range of 70 to 100. That's not too bad. And uh, line 7, we calculate the sample mean. The sample mean is um, the sum of the values, the samples, and divided by the number of samples. Line 8, we print the sample mean. Next, uh, we want to calculate the sample variance. The sample variance, to calculate the sample variance, we need, to, we need to loop through each sample in the samples and do this. This is a direct translation uh, of calculating a variance. The variance is a measure of uh, how far each sample deviates from the sample mean. Of course, we need to raise it to the square to get uh, the absolute value. And then at last, we take the square root of the sample variance that gives us uh, the standard deviation. Now let's uh, run this program. Okay, so we got uh, uh, sample mean 87 and a standard deviation 4.7. Let's run it again. Now this time it's a different number because we are using random. Each of uh, each time we run the program, the numbers from uh, rand, random dot gas give us a different uh, value. However, the value follows the distribution with mean eighty five and a standard deviation of five. Now, if you don't know the basics of uh, statistics, it's fine. And this is just an illustration how the program uh, can be used uh, to do certain simulations and how we and how the program can translate uh, the mathematics. And a lot of cases, the translation is pretty direct and uh, straightforward. I'd like to introduce modules concept in Python. A uh, Python module is simply a file. You can think about the module is a self-contained program which provides certain functionality. And a software can be made of one or many, many modules which work collaboratively. It is very hard to imagine a software nowadays is written in just one big giant monolithic file. Now let's take a look uh, at one example. Suppose we have a function called find a medium. 
which takes uh, one argument. This argument is a list to find the medium in this array, a list-based array. First, we want to make a copy at line three because we don't want to modify the input. And then we sort it from small to big. And we know the medium number depends on the number of elements in the array. So if the number of elements is even, then the medium is simply uh, the average of the two middle numbers in the array. Otherwise, it's just the middle number. For instance, if we have an array like this, A, which has eight uh, elements, after sorting it, it's this, and the medium of this array should be the average of three and four. So let's run it. All right, so the medium is 3.5. And also we print the original array here just to show, okay, this function indeed did not change the input argument. Now the next question is, what if there are other programs also want to use this function? Other programs also need this feature find medium. One way is straightforward, it's just a copy and a paste, and this is a very short program after all. However, that's not very desirable. A good way of doing it is simply package this function in a separate file. For example, I have a file here, statistic helper. I copy the entire implementation into this. Of course, only, I added only one line just for uh, demonstration purpose. And to use this function in the program, all we need to do is call import, import statistics helper. I'm sure we have seen this import statement before. And here we imp import just one file, one module. And to use it, we cannot just uh, call this function directly now. We need to prefix this function with this module name, statistics helper dot find medium. And this module also serves as a namespace purpose. There are other ways of importing, uh, but here let's keep it simple. And today's lesson, we're just gonna cover the basics. This is the preferred way of importing a module in my opinion. So now you say, in the demo a file, which we want to reuse on this find medium, we simply import, we simply import the module and we can reuse it. We don't have to copy the entire code here. Now let's run it first, see if it works. First, let's clear the results from the previous run and run it. All right. You see, this is the debugging message from uh, this statistic helper file. This just tells us indeed this function is invoked from that file. The same result. And the same, we did not modify the original input. Now you see the beauty of having certain functionality encapsulated in a module, such that you can reuse it in other places. You can test this module before you ship it to other users. Now, how about we do one more test and this time we append one extra number. Then we find it again. Now we append one more number. This list becomes, uh, this list has odd number, odd number of elements in it. So this find medium is supposed to return the middle one. So run it, four. Now we know how to write your own module 
and use it in other places. And one thing here, I have this module file at the same level with, with this demo file. This is not necessary. As long as in demo, when you import it, it knows where to find your module file, it shall be fine. But here, when this file is at the same location, the same directory as this demo, that's the first thing Python searches for. Regardless where you have your module file stored, so long the main file knows where to import it, it's the same way of uh, using it. Next, I'd like to introduce two great Python libraries. One is called NumPy, another is Matplotlib. These two Python packages are great for scientific computing and visualization. Now, to install these two packages, you can do it in PyCharm terminal and type in pip install matplotlib. Matplotlib actually installs NumPy as dependency. In other words, if you install matplotlib, you will have NumPy. Now, as we said before, in order to use a module, we have to import. Now, this time when we import NumPy, the difference is is a package. We are importing a package. A package contains um, a set of modules, many, many Python files. When we import NumPy like this, meaning import NumPy as NP, NP becomes uh, an alias for NumPy. So to use it, we first import it. And uh, let's say some very basic uh, use of NumPy. And here, I'd like to just uh, cover very, very basics and pretty much just to use the array from NumPy, which is more efficient than Python list. So first, uh, let's see how do we create a uh, NumPy array from uh, a Python. Line four, we can initialize array from a Python list. In fact, this list is empty, so the array, NumPy array is empty. The next, uh, next uh, way of uh, initializing a Python array is, uh, call, is called np.zeros by supplying the size of the array. So if we call np.zeros3, we create a uh, one-dimensional array with uh, three elements in it. Now, if we want to specify the type, we can do something like this. At line 9, mp0 is 5. This time is a one-dimensional array with five elements. But this time, the type we want it to be integer instead of the default floating type. Let's run it. NumPy demo. OK. So this is from uh, line 7. It prints that um, um, floating point array, three elements. And this is uh, from uh, line 10. So this array has five integer numbers in it. There are many functions, features from NumPy library. Uh, here, I'd like to just uh, cover the basic way of using NumPy. Uh, one thing is to how to populate a NumPy array because we want to use it for uh, plotting curves using matplotlib. So let's comment this out. We don't need this anymore. And uh, paste this here. So here at line 13, we define a variable number of points, 20. And we want to use numpy then space a function to create, to populate an array. The first argument, minus 3, is uh, the start point. And then second argument three is the end point. And uh, the number of points, basically we use length space to create the number of points evenly spaced between this start and end points. So if we do this, np dot length space minus three to three, number of points, 
it would create 20 points evenly distributed from uh, minus 3 to 3. And next, um, what we want to do is, supposing this is uh, the dependent, the, suppose this is the independent variable, and uh, we want to pass this to func and to get um, a dependent variables. How, we do, how do we do it? So we create the y array, which has the same size as um, x, x array. We use the for loop to call this function um, 20 times and populate this dependent variable array. Okay, let's run it. All right, this output is a little bit big. So first of all, we have 20 numbers floating points array. That's the x array. So that's the so that's the output uh, from uh, line 15. And next output this is this y array, which is uh, which is x array squared. You can use NumPy to do many things, including some linear algebra. You can manipulate metrics uh, such as uh, transpose, multiplication, and calculating matrix uh, determinant inverse. Um, but here, I just want to show you one example of using NumPy to solve linear equations. Let's comment this out. Copy this here. Suppose I have this linear equations. How, how do we use NumPy to solve it? First, we can create the coefficients array, np.array, from um, uh, Python lists. Like I said at the beginning of this uh, class, you can basically use Python list within list to represent two-dimensional array. And uh, np.array can recognize this as a two-dimensional array. So this way, we'll, we can create a two-dimensional array from a Python list. So this would be our coefficient um, uh, array. And next, we create uh, the array h, array 5, 6. Well, that's actually um, the right-hand side of uh, the equation. Now, how to solve it? We simply call np dot lin, lin ALG, linear algebra, solve a h. Then the x would be our solution. It's so interesting. You don't have to do all the hand uh, calculation. Run it. All right, now you get the solution. If you want, you can verify x is 1, y is 1, 3 plus 2, 5. x1, y1, 2 plus 4, 6. Of course, this is a very simple example. I'm sure if you have a, a big, uh, complicated uh, equations, you can solve the same way. Again, to find more uses from uh, NumPy, you should go to numpy.org to uh, look at uh, documentations. Next, let's see how to use matplotlib to plot some interesting curves. First, we need to import those required libraries. NumPy, we need that to create the dependent variables array and uh, independent variables array. And second, we want to import the pyplot module from matplotlib. As I said, matplotlib is a package that can contain, a package can contain many, many modules. And pyplot is one of those many modules from matplotlib. And as above, we give uh, pyplot module an alias. We call it plot. The functions we want to draw are polynomials. The first one is uh, func. It takes only one argument. That's the x. It returns 3 times x squared. 
And the next one, Funk 2, is 3 times x cubed. So these are two polynomials. And the first one with the degree 2, the second one with the degree 3. Now let's see how do we plot it. Actually, the comment is not accurate, accurate here. It's 50. And uh, we want to draw from uh, minus 2 to positive 2. So here we want to generate 50 points evenly distributed from minus 2 to 2. This would be the points on our x axis. Line 14, we allocate 15 points to y array. We, of course, zeros all of them. The same thing with y array 2. The y array and y array 2 will store the dependent variables from a func and a func 2, respectively. Like I showed you before, we use for loop to compute um, the number of points times for each of the function. So the func 1 we call from uh, minus 2 to whatever, you know, the numbers generated from uh, line space. The same thing with func 2, and we assign that to this uh, dependent variables array. At the uh, end of uh, line 18, or after the for loop finishes, we would have all those dependent variables uh, calculated. So the calculation is done. The next part is using uh, the plot to visualize the data. The title is the graph's title. We give it a label. We want to show the grid. Now we want to plot two curves. The x, the points, the first argument is the points on x axis. And the next argument, the second argument, is the corresponding y points. So the same thing for the next curve. Now this is the legend. The last we want to show the graph. It's very simple. And uh, let's run this demo. All right, now you see we have two curves. The title, polynomials, and these are the le legends. And we know we want to plot from a minus 2 to plus 2. So the num number of points are automatically calculated. And we will also want to show the grid. It's a simple and a straightforward, and these curves, they pr plotted pretty nicely. Now we have seen how to use Matplot loop to plot curves. Uh, what about another type of uh, graphs? For instance, bar chart. And of course, Matplot loop can uh, can do that. So here, I want to plot a bar chart with five bars at a position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And what I want to print out, what I want to plot is at those positions, I want to plot the counts. You know, this bar, bar chart I gave here is just for illustration purpose. You can use um, this for a template to plot other type uh, to plot bar chart with other uh, data. So here I define five positions that will be the, uh, the positions for five bars. And for each bar, I have the counts. 10, 20, 30, 15, 8. Well, you can think about maybe this 10 is for the counts for this letter, A. Maybe A appeared in a certain paragraph or phrase 10 times, or E appeared 20 times. Bar width, plot dot bar, the first argument, that's the position you want to draw the bar. And for each bar, the height, the counts. 
and you want to override the width with the d or with the bar width 0 0.3. Now this is uh, the label below each bar because we, we, we don't want to use the default label for it. We want to use the label from uh, the characters. Next, we also want to label the bar chart at each bar, at the top of each bar. So let's run it, see what, uh, what it uh, does. OK, you see, this is a very nice bar chart. A, E, I, O, U, A, Counts 10, E, counts 20, I, 30, O, 15, U, 8. Again, this is uh, another example of using PyPlot to plot a different type of a graph. There are many other features, functions available from uh, a Matplotlib. Um, this just uh, scratched the surface of it. The point is, whenever you think you need certain functions, you first probably want to look for, um, you first probably want to find out if there are available implementation. I have an array that stores a list of numbers, and all the numbers in the array are ordered from smallest to the largest. That is, this array is ordered ascendingly. Now one question to ask is how to find a number from this array? Now I want to point out finding a number is not much of uh, use by itself. You have to think about each of the numbers as a key and the key might have the key has association with a certain piece of information that may be more important or more useful. By finding the key, you are retrieving that associated information. For example, each of the key could be a person's ID. And by finding the ID, you can retrieve the associated person's information. Now suppose we want to find the key 12. How do we do it? One way is very intuitive and straightforward, we need to have a loop that iterate through this array from the left to the right until we find it or not. So the first iteration, we would compare the key to the first element. If they're equal, we are done. If not, we move on and we keep move on and we keep comparing to the next element until we find it. So five iteration, we find the key. Now, what if uh, we have another key to search, nine? Still the same. We start from the left, compare the key to the first element, not equal. We move on to the next element, not equal. Then the next element, not, still not equal. Then keep going until the last element, well, still not equal. So we made a total eight comparisons and we know there's nothing equal to the given uh, key nine. So we know nine does not exist in this array. Now, one thing you should notice is for comparing, for searching the key nine, once we pass comparing element 10, there's no need to compare this range anymore because all the numbers after 10 are greater than 10 because they are ordered from uh, uh, smallest to the largest. So if 9 is less than, if the key is less than 10, you really don't need to compare the range beyond 10. And similarly for 12, comparing the key 12, you probably can try to compare a number not starting from uh, the very first element. For example, you may want to start from uh, index 2 when comparing a given key. So if the key is less than 
the element, for example, eight here. So we can we only need to compare this subarray uh, that is left to the element eight. If the key is greater than eight, we can compare the subarray that is right to number eight. So in other words, we compare a number not starting not starting from the first. We can shorten the search range. One systematic way of finding a key from an ordered array is by comparing the key to the middle element of the search array. So it is an iterative type of uh, it, uh, algorithm. So the first iteration, obviously, we need to search the entire array. The search range is the entire array, of course. Like I said, we pick the middle element to compare. So the first iteration, we would pick, in this case, element 10 to compare to the key 12. And we know 12 is greater than 10. The range, the subarray from uh, 0, 1, 2, all the way to three cannot possibly contain the key. So the key must exist to the right of the mid element. Now we move on to the next iteration. We shorten the search range by half. The range is start from uh, index four to the rightmost index 7. Now the search repeats itself. Again, we pick the middle number, we pick the middle element of this subarray. So this time, the middle element is this. It's a 13. And a 12 is less than 13. So in other words, the array that is right to the middle element, that is this range, cannot possibly contain the number 12. They're all greater than 13, and 13 is greater than the key, so we can drop the right subarray for comparison for the next search iteration. So we move on to the next iteration, and this time, the search range is on the left of the previous middle element. And in fact, because we know this is uh, greater than that, this range is reduced to just uh, one number, 12. And you see only three comparison. We can find the key. All right, let's find another number, this time 14. The first iteration, the left index starts from the left of the whole array and the right index points to the very right index of the entire array. That's our first search range that covers the entire elements in the array. And the middle number, middle element points to index three. And then we compare 14 to 10, and 14 is greater than 10. So we can safely drop the subarray left to the middle element M. We don't need to compare any elements here to the search key. We know the search key must exist, if it exists, must be in the subarray that is right to the middle element. And the next iteration, we would uh, move the L, the left index, one position to the right of the middle element. And that gives us the new search range. The search range is reduced by half from the previous one. And the iteration is again to find the middle element, which is uh, index five now. Now 14 compared to 13, 
It's still greater than the key. So we again, we keep moving the search range and reducing the search range. The search range now reduced by half again. It started with eight elements and then reduced by half to four elements. And now it is only two elements we need to compare to search from. And 14 compare this new middle element, 14 compared to 15, that is less than 15. And we know it must, if it exists, must be in the subarray that is left to the M. And we want to update the right element and move it one position left to L. However, at this time, it is not a valid search range. We can conclude this key does not exist in this array. So we only did three comparisons and we detected this number does not in this array. It is much quicker and efficient than you scan the whole array from the very beginning to the end to find whether uh, the number exists or not. This binary search is a very efficient algorithm. It scales very well. Suppose we have 10 to 6, that's a million keys to search from. At each iteration, we reduce the range, the search range by half. At worst case, that means we keep reducing the search range uh, by half at each iteration until the search range is shrank to only two elements in it. We only need to compare, we only need to do log base two of a million number of times. That's about 20. That is, we only need to compare at the most 20 times out of a million numbers to find the key or not. And of course, the keys must be ordered for this algorithm to work. Once we know the theory of binary search, it's pretty straightforward for us to write a Python program that implements this search algorithm. The function binary search takes two arguments the first argument A is an array. The second one is the key to search from the array. And the first, at line two, we do very simple validation of the argument. If the array length is zero, we just return minus one. Minus one means the key does not exist. So the function actually returns the index of the key. We know for Python array, well, list-based array or array from NumPy, the index starts at zero and all the way to the length minus one. We return the index of the key if the key exists in the array. Otherwise, we return minus one. The input argument array A must be ordered. However, that's not the responsibility of this function itself. The caller needs to make sure the array is ordered ascendingly before passing it to this function. Line five, six, seven, initialize the left index, right index, and the mid index. That's what we explained in the previous slides. So at the very beginning of the first iteration, the left index is the leftmost uh, um, element, the right index, points to the rightmost elements. We can just give the mid index the first one. Next is our loop. The condition for the loop is as long as the left index is less than or equal to the right index, we can continue. And at each iteration, like we said before, we find the middle element in the search subarray. The search subarray is defined by the left index and the right index. And the mid index is really the floor division of left index plus the right index. That gives you the middle index 
of the search subarray. Once you get this middle index, you do the comparison. You compare the element at the middle of the subarray to the key. If they are equal, you're, you're lucky. You just return the middle index right away, and you found it. Otherwise, you compare whether the key is less than the middle element or the key is greater than the middle element. If the key is less than the middle element, that means the next search subarray should be on the left of the middle element. You want to move the right and point to the left, to the left of the middle index. That's, that's why you need to do this, mid index minus one, and assign it to right index. That moves the right index to the left. If the key is greater than the middle element, that means the next search subarray should be on the right of the middle element. For that to happen, you need to move the left index to the right, just beyond the middle index. So you do this, middle index plus one. And then you go back to the loop, and you compare the left index to the right index again. If they are if the left index is still less than or equal to the right index, that means you still have a valid a search subarray, and you continue. If not, that comes to the else part. The else part means this while well condition is false. That is when you move the left index beyond the right index, and you still couldn't find the key. So you turn minus one. That tells you the key does not exist in this uh, array. If the key is not in the list, and when this routine returns at the nine, line 19, the left index would be greater than the right index. Next, uh, let's design some test cases to test our binary search function. We have this keys array. That's the keys we used in our previous explanation. Now we want to test a key exists in the array and the key not exists in the array. So first we test a number three and this function should return the index of that key. For the element three, the index is zero. And for element eight, the index shall be 2. And 15, the index is 6, and so on. And also, we want to test uh, one element that does not exist in this array. For example, number 9. Number 9 yet yeah, does not exist in this array. And number 2. Number 2 is less than the smallest element in this array. It still does not exist in the array. It should still return minus one. So this should give us a reasonable good coverage of our binary search. And let's run it. Because we're using a sort here, if there's an error, we would see some error here. We don't see any error here. That means all the tests pass. Let's work on a problem where we can use binary search. Suppose we have a water container. This water container has a very odd shape. We don't know exactly the volume at a given height. That is, we don't have a closed formula to describe uh, the volume of height. However, we can measure the volume manually at a given height. And we choose a set of heights strategically from uh, a height somewhere close to the bottom of the container to uh, some height close to the top of the container. And we record the volume at each certain height. 
For example, here we measure the volume at height one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. At height four, we got a volume three point five. At height five, we got a volume four point one. We shall not worry about the units here. Now, if you want to know the volume at height four, since we have a uh, Measured volume for it, we can just uh, retrieve it. That is 3.5. And if we want to know the volume at height 5, we know the measured volume of it is 4.1. We can just get it directly. But then the question is what if we have a height 4.7? We want to know the corresponding volume at that height. One way of doing that is called a linear interpolation. It assumes the volume at a height between this measured two heights, 4 and 5, lies in the line segment defined by those two measured points. So 4.7 must be somewhere on this line. And all we need to know is to calculate the slope, which can be, which we can get from these two endpoints we already measured. We get the slope, and then we know the distance from 4.7 to the h at the left endpoint, and then we can get the offset. The offset is the volume at 4.7 to the volume at height 4. And we know for line segment or line x1, y1, x2, y2, suppose there are two points on this line. The slope is uh, very simple, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So that is a slope. So when we plug into this, we know the slope is 4.1 minus 3.5 divided by 5 minus 4. That is the slope of this line. And this distance is uh, 4.7. That's the height. We want to find the volume. And uh, 4.7 minus 4. Minus 4, that gives us uh, this distance. And times this slope, that gives us this uh, volume offset to this position and this is volume 3.5 so we plus 3.5 then we know the volume at 4.7 so this is called linear interpolation any points can be calculated this way so long we know that point falls into which interval now one question we need to answer is what if the point is beyond the two ends. For example, if a point is somewhere here, is the height is after seven, is higher than the height, we have the measurement. So we can use the slope of this interval. And for a point less than the smallest uh, height, we have the measurement we use the interval of this. Now for given height, we need to find the interval that covers it. So if a height falls in between one to seven, that's a straightforward. We need to find the left and the point of the interval that covers it. So if we want to calculate the, of the volume of a height in between two and three, we get this index this interval the left end point of this interval two and three if the height is at uh, is in between three and four anywhere in between three and four we get the left end point of interval three and four for points for height beyond the largest uh, height we actually get 
the second to the largest uh, um, height as the left end index, left end point. And again, for any height less than the smallest, we use the first index, the first edge position or height position uh, for calculating this volume. This actually would work. So for this point, it would be the extension on this line. And for this point, it will be extension of uh, this line. Next, uh, let's take a look at how we do that in Python. We define a function called linear interpolate. This function takes uh, three arguments. The first two are arrays, and the first argument is the independent variables array. And the second argument, y, is the dependent variables array. And the third argument is a number. And we need to make sure when we pass in this argument, the x is sorted ascendingly. That's the responsibility of the caller, and we don't need to uh, sort inside interpolate method. However, if you do want to do it, you need to make sure when you sort x, you also need to sort y accordingly. Now, the first thing inside the function is to validate uh, the input arguments. We need to validate at least we have two points. So this is this. If we don't have two points, we cannot do linear interpolation. We need to, we need at least two, two points to define a line. And also we want to make sure the length of those two arrays are equal. For each independent variable x, there is a corresponding y. If we pass the arguments validation, we go to the next uh, uh, statement here, find the left end point of interval for px. So what this means is, like we described uh, before, suppose px falls into an uh, interval defined by this, idx and uh, idx plus 1. So this function returns the idx, the interval's left end point. Once we know this interval that covers this to be interpolated position, we can get um, the slope for the line defined by these two known points. And once we have that, we can calculate um, the offset from uh, this to this. That is the formula. So we have these two points. We can get the slope of it. Let me write down the coordinates of this. For this, the coordinate would be uh, x, a, i, d, x plus 1, and y, i, d, x plus 1. These values are known. They are from the input array. And for the left end point, the coordinate is um, x, i, d, x, and uh, y, I D X. So the slope is direct um, translation. Uh, we just plug in these coordinates y at x plus one minus y at x divided by x at x plus one minus x at x. And the interpolated value is this. And uh, that is uh, the slope times this distance. This distance is really the px, because this point is px, px minus this times the slope, and then plus the y value at this, you get this interpolated value. Once we get it, we return it. And also keep in mind, uh, once we know the interval for this, it would work uh, when the px is uh, at this end or at this end. I mean, at the extension of this line segment, 
it works the same way. The left endpoint index function is a slight modification of the binary search function we saw before. Uh, two arguments are the same. A, the first argument, is an array. And the key is the number or the key we want to search from the array. And a simple validation, uh, if the length of the array is less than two, uh, we throw uh, an exception. I know we validated uh, the arguments at the outer function into polyt, but for this function itself, uh, it's still worth to test the length of the array. This is sometimes called a defensive, defensive programming. Now the difference between this left and point index function and the other binary search function is we we are not just want to know whether the key exists or not uh, in the array. We also want to know if we don't find the key, what is the index that ended the search. So in other words, we want to return the interval or the left, we want to return the interval's left index that closest to the key. What I meant by that is, suppose we have a list of uh, points uh, in the input array A. Now, if we find the key, if the key, we find one, we can just return the index uh, of this. This would be the interval's left endpoint with, with a catch, because if the key is if the key equals to the last one, we actually want to return the index left to it. That is uh, what this does, index minus one, de decrement by one. Another is if the key is outside of the range of this array, meaning the key is somewhere here or somewhere here, we treat it uh, similarly. If the key is greater than the largest element in this array, we return still return the second largest uh, uh, index in this array. And if the key is uh, smaller than the smallest uh, number here, we return the index zero to calculate. Like we explained before, um, this interval would work for points left to it. The left point is just uh, still on the extension of the line defined by this segment. Similarly for this. Now, if the key falls here, meaning if we don't have a direct uh, match for the key, so the key is somewhere uh, between a certain interval, and uh, at the end of the search, that is, we don't find the key, we will not have a direct uh, a match here. So the mid index, that's the left, uh, that's the, that's the index, it ended a search, would be either here or here. And if the mid index points to here, we are down. So we get the interval's left endpoint for the key, so we can use that to uh, do the interpolation. But if the mid index is here, so the key is less than the last uh, uh, search position, we need to move the index back by one position. That is the uh, interval's left end index. So that is still the mid index here minus one. At the last, we also uh, want to make sure um, we get a valid index at the list zero. That is because if we, if uh, the key happens to be here, we minus one, we get a, a minus index. That's an invalid index. So we need to bring it back to zero. Now the rest of the uh, program are very similar. Here we do the same initialization, almost uh, no change, and uh, the same uh, loop condition. So long left index is less than or equal to right index, we have a valid search range. We can keep searching. 
we compare the key to the mid index. No change. Now, because we are not only interested in uh, a direct match, we also, so we don't want to return right away if we find a match. So if we find the key, we just break the loop. We break the loop. We go here. We check whether where the key is. So if the key is left is less than the mid index, we do this. We bring the index uh, one position to the left. Uh, that's what uh, uh, what what that's when this equals to this, and uh, it goes here. And do this adjustment. And also, we can terminate the loop when left index is equal to right index. So we can terminate that a little earlier. So that that is when the search range is reduced to one element. No need to do um, the next uh, if else check. So we still go. Here, go outside of the uh, the while loop. We do this if check. We if the key is less than that, uh, we decrypt the mid index, and this is uh, when the mid index is uh, with the mid index points to the last position. So we know we need to move the mid index left by one position. We need to use this. The second largest index for the interval's left endpoint. Now, if we find a key or we already end our search when the search range is just one element, we break the loop. Otherwise, we keep going. So we don't find the key, but we still haven't reduced uh, the search range uh, to just one element. We do this block. This block is no change from uh, uh, the binary search. If the key is less than the mid element, we move the right. Uh, we move uh, the right index to the one element left to the mid index. If key is greater than the middle element in that uh, search range, we move. The left index one position right to the middle index, meaning we search the right subarray of the uh, middle element. We need to design our test cases to cover the boundary conditions and um, all possible execution path. So if I have uh, the x value one two three four five six seven, you can think about it as the a uh, height for that water container I used as example, and the corresponding volume array. Now the test case should be designed like this. We should test, interpolate, at the points we have already uh, we have known value. For one at height one, we should have a direct value recorded zero point five. So we assert this height volume at height one. It's zero point five. The similarly at at height seven, the volume is eight point seven five. That is uh, this volume. Now, if I have a height one point five, that's in between one and two. Now, the volume should be in the range of zero point five. And one point two five, so that's this validation. And for volume, for example, nine, that is out of the range, that is greater than the largest uh, uh, height. Uh, for height nine, that is um, larger than the largest height we have known. We have the measured volume. All we know is. The volume should be greater than the last one. So this is what we can validate. If you are interested, you can also validate a uh, volume. Uh, I'm sorry. You can also validate a height that is uh, less than one. This linear interpolation will give you any uh, value you plug in. Whether it makes physical sense, 
you have to uh, make your own judgment. Many modern programming languages support recursive function calls. A recursive function is a function that calls itself. For example, I defined a function factor recursive, which takes one argument. And inside the function, the last statement, the return statement, it calls factorial recursive again. And this method and this factor recursive is exactly the same as the above defined. When you call it again, you adjust the argument, you subtract one by the argument, then you call the function again. This recursive function resembles the mathematical definition of n factorial very closely. We know n factorial equals n times n minus 1, parentheses, times n minus 2, and all the way to n uh, to 2 times 1. Now, in fact, this terms is n minus 1 factorial. In other words, n factorial equals n times n minus 1 factorial. Now you say n factorial is somewhat defined recursively. It is equivalent to n times n minus 1 factorial. To know the n factorial, we need to know n minus 1 factorial. And if we say n factorial is the product of all the natural numbers from n to 1, then it is, must be true n minus 1 factorial is the product of all the numbers from n minus 1 to 1. Now, in the last uh, return statement in this function, this is almost the same as this mathematical term, n factorial equals n times n minus 1 factorial. Let's see how this recursive function actually works. Supposing we are doing uh, 4 factorial, f4. Well, I just uh, use f to, uh, for this longer factorial recursive function name. So the first time we call a uh, factorial recursive 4, we basically pass 4 to n, and uh, we do uh, certain arguments validation, that is, uh, that's the first uh, if, uh, if block. Second if block checks if n equals to 1. If n is 1, we return 1, and we know 1 factorial is 1. This is uh, uh, intuitive, and this is called a uh, base condition. So if we don't have this, the whole recursive would not work. You cannot uh, have a recursive function without finally return something, not just uh, uh, the, the call itself. Otherwise, you end up in an infinite loop. Now, the first time we pass 4 to the argument n, and we pass the two if blocks because n is not equal to 1, then we come to the return statement. The return statement is 4 times factorial recursive, 4 minus 1, 3. So it doesn't return immediately because we are calling this exact function again. That means it goes back to the function, but with a parameter 3 this time, and 3 would uh, come to the last return statement again, that it becomes 3 times factorial recursive 3 minus 1, that is 2. And then this becomes 2 times factorial recursive 2 minus 1, that is 1. Now, when 1 comes into this function, it goes to this, this base condition, and n is 1, and then this one returns 1. 
So 2 times 1 is 2. Meaning when we finally uh, meet the base condition, f1 returns, and 2 times f1 returns to another function, 2, and 3 times 2 returns to f3, that is a 6. 4 times 6, that's 24, it returns this f4. When you call factorial recursive f4, it doesn't return immediately. It would continue on to call 4 times f3, which doesn't return. It would continue to call 3 times f2, then 2 to f1. Return one by one. The whole the function returns one by one. F1 returns, you get F2. The F2 times 3, you get the return of F3. Once you have F3, you can do 4 times F3, that returns F4. The key to remember here is when you invoke this function factor recursive first time you pass the argument 4, it doesn't return immediately. It breaks the function into two parts. One is the constant 4, another is um, the same function call with the argument one number less than the caller. And that is the definition of this. It keeps going until the last call when the number, when the argument reduced to just one. It must be one for us to return here. All the previous calls, the number are, the argument n are greater than one. The last one must be one and we return one. This is very important. Without this, you would end up keep calling the same function again and again and in the end, this would blow up the program. This is referred as stack overflow. Let's run this factorial recursive function in PyCharm. I added a few print statements in this function to help us understand recursion. Right enter into this function, we print call factorial recursive. And this is a nice way of formatting a string. You use f and a single quote, or whatever string you want, but you use this um, paired curly braces to include the variable. And this variable n will be replaced by whatever value passed uh, to n. And there are two places we return from the function. One place is at line 8 when we hit the base condition. When n equals 1, we return 1, and we print this return factorial recursive before we return. Another place is the last uh, return statement. Before that, we print uh, return factorial recursive. And whenever we invoke a function um, like this, the n becomes local variable to that invocation. So this call factor recursive and this return should be paired. We should say a pair of that for each invocation. Now let's uh, run this function. All right. First of all, the result is 24. 4 factorial is 24. The result is correct. Second, let's look at the cause. First, first call is factorial recursive 4. That's our initial invocation at here. But it doesn't return immediately, like I explained. It keeps calling the same function with a different uh, argument, with a different number passed into uh, the argument. That's because we subtract 1 and then pass to the next uh, recursive call until we hit this uh, base condition which is uh, n uh, is 1. And then we return 1 by 1 until we return the initial uh, function invocation. And this is 
the call stack. This is the original, the oldest call, and this call is the latest call. As you can see, if we don't have a base condition or termination condition for the recursion to end, to return something uh, concrete, you would uh, end up with this call step keep growing until it hits the memory limit or the stack limit of a program. That is the stack overflow. Second recursive function example. We know Fibonacci sequence can be defined recursively. Starting from the third term, the nth term of a Fibonacci sequence can be defined like this, fn equals to fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2 for n greater than or equal to 3. And n is the nth term of a Fibonacci sequence. It is the sum of uh, the previous two terms. And the sequence goes like this, 1, 0, 0. 0 is the, zero, the first term. The 1 is the second term. The third term is 1. It is 0 plus 1. And the fourth term is the sum of the previous two terms. And 5, something like this. We have used the loop to compute the nth term of a Fibonacci sequence. But let's look, take a look at how we do it in uh, how we do it recursively. And this is a nice format for us to use in the in a recursive function, almost like how we did with uh, uh, n factorial recursive function to compute the nth term of a Fibonacci sequence. We actually recursively compute n minus 1 and n minus 2 terms uh, of Fibonacci sequence. So that is this. So fn, that's the nth term of Fibonacci sequence, equals n, the previous two terms, the sum of the previous two, ter previous two terms. As usual, for the recursion to work, we need to have the base condition. And we know the first term is 0, and the second term is 1. And uh, the recursion is only applicable when it starts from the third term. So we need to set the base condition for it. If n is 1, we return 0. If n is 2, the second term, we return 1. Once we know the first term and the second term, we established uh, the base condition. Contrasted to the n factorial recursive function, inside of this compute Fibonacci recursive function, we recursive on two calls at this line. So for the nth term, we actually invoke two exact computer Fibonacci recursive. So how does this work? If we want to compute the fourth term of Fibonacci sequence, the first time when we call it, we pass 4 to it, 4 to this n. And uh, it comes to this line because 4 is not one of the base conditions. So it goes on to this line and uh, continues on to the recursion, which is f3 and f2. I write it this way is uh, for you to uh, realize when you call for for when you call compute Fibonacci recursive with argument for it actually need to invoke two functions but it can only invoke one at a time the first is the left recursion which is three after three it would return 
it would uh, invoke F2. That is this. But it won't invoke this until this returns. So this would keep going. So F3 is invoked, and F3 would come to this um, beginning of the function again. That's 3. It's not one of the base conditions, and uh, it keeps doing the recursion. That's F2 and F1. So the program remembers for Fibonacci 3, it actually needs to uh, invoke two exact uh, functions. One is F2, another is F1. And F2 would be invoked first. And F2 and the, uh, the argument 2 passed to this again. And uh, 2 is the second term, and we know the case for it. It should return 1. So the first return is F2. OK. And I have this uh, uh, the same debugging print statements here. So the first, really, you would say returning return F2. Once this returns, the program knows there's another function needs to be called. That's the F1. F1 returns, and when both of them returns, it returns F3. Once this is returned, now it invokes F2. F2 still is uh, uh, the second term. That's the base case. There's a base condition for it. So it returns F2. Now let me label the uh, returning call uh, in, uh, in order. So the first is this. We call F2. Well, we return F2. And then we return F1. We have this. Now we return F3, uh, F3. And after that, we return F2. After F2, now we are able to return 4, which is the fourth term of Fibonacci sequence. Let's run this computer Fibonacci recursive function in PyCharm. Run it. We are doing the fourth term of this uh, sequence. It's 0, 1, 1, 2. So the fourth term of it is 2. Correct? And uh, if you're interested, you can verify the cost stack, what I showed you before. So first, it, the initial invocation is uh, 4, and it keeps doing the invocation, the recursion. The first it re recursion return occurs at here, return 2, and then return 1, then return 3, and then return 2, finally return 4. Uh, you can compute a slightly a bigger Fibonacci sequence, a slightly bigger term of Fibonacci sequence recursively. Uh, you can see a more complicated cost x. However, none of this recursion implementation of factorial or Fibonacci sequence computation is efficient. Let's do some performance tests about this uh, recursive version of compute Fibonacci sequence. We want to find out uh, the 30th term of it, and let's run it. It's less than it's uh, less than a second. It's about one third of a second. And what about the thirty-two? Run it again. Now it's close to a second. Thirty-five. Run it again. Well, it's over three seconds now. This is uh, considerably slow, and if you run your loop version of the Fibonacci sequence, it's, it's much faster. 
Then the question is why? If you enable my uh, debugging print statements here, I disable them for our testing so you get a, a cleaner output. But if you are interested, you can re-enable them. You will find there are repetitive recursions occurred for the same number. For example, if you are recursion, you are doing recursion f4 uh, here, f4 equals f3 plus f2, and then for f3 it is e it equals to f2 plus f1. It computes f2 one time, and then this f2 computes another time. It doesn't remember the value it's already got. Now let's see how we can improve this. The inefficiency of our first version computer Fibonacci recursive implementation comes from it keeps computing the terms it already knows, it already computed. Intuitively, if we can remember those terms we have already known, we should be able to improve the performance. With that intuition in mind, we have another version of recursive computing Fibonacci sequence. Let's give a name uh, computer Fibonacci recursive V1. The first term n uh, represents the term of the Fibonacci sequence. The second one is NumPy array that stores the numbers we have already computed. Well, to work with a uh, NumPy array which starts at a zero, as it's zero index based, so the n we allow we allow n to take on a value zero. Zero is first term. n here really means n plus one term in Fibonacci sequence. In other words, if you call this version with three, uh, comma uh, f n, it really returns the fourth term of Fibonacci sequence. That way we can. Uh, align, align with this uh, zero based, uh, zero index based array very well. The first term, like I said, is zero based now. So if n equals zero, we return the first term, which is zero. However, before we return, we record the first term value, which is zero. We put it into um, the first uh, position in this array. For the second term uh, is one, and we know the second term is one, we return one, but before returning it, we record the second term's value in the second position in this array. Now this is the trick to improve the whole thing. So if we know the previous two terms, we have already computed the previous two terms, we use minus one, to represent whether a value has been computed or not. So if we know the previous two terms have computed, have values, meaning they are not equal to minus one, we can just do the direct computation. F n, the nth term, is the sum of the previous two terms. We return. We don't do recursive calls here. If we don't have the values recorded, we we, we do the recursion as usual. Now I have refactored the test into a test method. This is our first version, and we want to test how long it's going to take to find the 35th term. And this is our improved uh, version uh, of recursively computing nth term of a Fibonacci sequence. And we know it's zero-based, so 30, if we pass 34 to it, it really returns the 35th uh, term of that sequence. And we need to store, we need to create an array that stores 35 elements. And we know the Fibonacci sequence is type integer. 
So we specify the type as an integer, and we initialize the array elements to minus one. We don't know each of the terms value when we start. And as usual, we time it. We print the duration in the end. Now let's run it. OK, see the first recursion, as before, it took about three seconds. Actually, this time it's three seconds and a half. And for the improved version, it's virtually zero. So the performance is close to the loop. Now, for these two examples, they do have some uh, values in terms of uh, introducing the recursive concept in programming. Uh, but in practice, they do not provide good performance. Whenever you use recursion, uh, you need to balance the performance and um, the ease of understanding. In most cases, a recursive functions can be replaced by using just the loops. That way, you avoid the potential of stack overflow issues. Let's discuss how to sort an array of elements today. By arranging elements in a certain order, we can retrieve the relevant information quickly, such as using binary search. There are many ways of sorting. One simple sorting algorithm is called a selection sort. The idea of selection sort is at each iteration, it finds the smallest key from a given array and make it to um, the correct position. And in the next iteration, it repeats the a search the same. It finds the smallest uh, key again, but in a reduced range of the array. For example, if we have a array contains keys like 5, 1, 8, 2, 7, 6, 7 keys. The first iteration, by using selection sort, we want to find the smallest key from the original array, that is from the index 1 all the way to index 6. And the smallest key is 0. We find the smallest key. We swap it with the keys at the first position, because the first position is supposed to store the smallest key of the original array. So we swap 0 and 5. The remaining elements are not changed. After the first iteration, the first position at index 0 would have the smallest key of the entire original array. The next iteration, it works the same. However, it searches the smallest key from the remaining subarray from index 1 to index uh, 6. Let's make Mark the index here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The, uh, the array is 0 index based. So you have 7 elements. The index starts from 0 and ends at 6. The second iteration, just like the first one, defines the smallest key. And this time is this guy, 1. They're not seen to swap or you can say it swaps with itself. So one is here. That's the second smallest uh, number in this array, in the original array, but it's the smallest one in this subarray. You can put it here. After the second iteration, we have the first two positions store the two smallest uh, keys from the original array that's ordered ascendingly here. Okay, the remaining are still remaining elements are not sorted yet. The third iteration works the same, but in a different range of the array. So we want to find the smallest array from uh, this range, from index two to index six. 
And once we find it, we still want to swap it with the first uh, with the element at the first position of the subarray. Okay, this time the smallest key is two, and we want to swap two and eight. The remaining elements now this now changed. So the third iteration we have this first three elements for, are fixed. The fourth iteration, the search range is this. The smallest key is five, five, and it swaps with eight. This are now changed. Six. So this is the fourth iteration. Fifth iteration searches in this range. And the smallest key is six in that range. Six swap with seven, seven, and this becomes eight. These are uh, the first four already sorted. After five, fifth iteration, the first five elements are in good order. Now the last iteration in this range, and uh, the smallest one is seven. Seven swap with this eight becomes this five six. All right. After six iteration, we have the array in the order we want. We sorted in ascending order from smallest key to the largest key, and we used uh, uh, six iterations. Of course, in each iteration, we make a comparison to find the smallest key from that uh, search array. Now, the purpose of learning the sorting algorithm is not like um, you need to hand implement a certain sorting algorithm by yourself at work. You almost never need to do that because virtually all the libraries are for each major programming languages uh, have the sorting function built in for you. We learn this is for us to understand how the algorithms performs. And sorting is a very good sorting is very good to give us insight at each step how the algorithm produces and help us understand the complexity of a sorting of an algorithm in particular. So in this case, we have seven keys to, to be ordered. In this selection sort, it's simple-minded. Regardless what the keys in the array, whether they have been ordered or not, in each iteration, it always tries to find the smallest by doing the comparison. The comparison is conducted um, in such a way it compares all the elements. For example, the first iteration, it would compare um, one, two, three, four, five, six, six times. And the second iteration, it would compare five times. Even though some of the numbers or keys have been already compared. So the selection sort doesn't use much information from the array itself. Uh, let me repeat this again, because the way we are finding the smallest is by comparison. So if we want to find the smallest from uh, the original array, for example, 5, 1, 8, 2, 6, uh, 2, 7, or 6, what we will do is we compare this element to 5 first, it's less than that, so the one is the smallest. And then we compare each of the remaining elements to the current smallest we know. So we make one, two, three, four, five, six. Six comparison. And for the next uh, iteration, we are comparing, we are selecting from uh, the six elements to find um, the smallest, we need five comparisons to find it. So that is, we compare eight to one. 
So one is the smallest. Okay, we move on to find to the next element, two compared to one. Okay, it's not smaller than that. Seven to one, five to one, six to one. Okay, five times. And the third iteration, we are finding the smallest from the remaining five elements. So we are comparing, we, we have to compare four times to find it. Two compared to eight, all right? So we know two is the smallest. But we have to compare the rest of the elements to two, see if there are any, any elements less than two. So we compare seven to two, five to two, six to two. Plus the original comparison two to eight, we have have to compare four times for the third iteration and all the way down to this. So you need all this number of comparisons. If we have an array of, um, we have an array contains n elements, then all the number of comparison would become n minus one, n minus two, all the way to one. And the total number of comparisons in that would be two, uh, I think is this. But no matter what, as n increases, this n minus one and n become, becomes same or very similar. And using computer science terminology, this gives you a complexity of n squared. And sometimes they use big O to denote that. Now you don't have to know uh, much details about this, but this just gives you an idea that sorting algorithm is used for anal analyzing the complexity of an algorithm. And a sort, because we know sorting very well, we know how many comparisons or operations need to be performed at each iteration. So we can give a pretty precise estimate of how much time the algorithm would need to produce the desired result. The next simple sorting algorithm is called insertion sort. We still have the same elements, 5, 1, 8, 2, 7, 0, 6, 7 keys to sort and the index is from 0 to 6. We want to sort them as ascendingly from the smallest key to the largest key. In certain sort works iteratively as well. The idea is at each iteration, we insert the element to an existing sorted array. Let's see how it works. The first iteration. Now, before we sort, I want to point out we are sorting these elements in place, meaning we are not moving or copying these elements to a new array. We are just to exchange or swap or shift the elements in the same array. And after the sort, the array, the elements in the array are already reordered. In other words, the original array is modified. We are not using new array, we just do the whole operation in the given array to be sorted. Okay, now the first iteration for insertion sort, what we want to do is, suppose we have an array which has only one element, five, and that can be considered sorted. Okay, let's say how we insert a new element, one, into that. We compare this to this. We want to find the position to insert. Okay, one is less than five, so we move five, one position to the right. That will make room for the one. Now there's no more elements to compare. Okay, we insert one here. Now, after the first iteration, the array becomes this, and the first two elements in the array are sorted. Of course, this is not done yet. We want to continue on, and 
insert the third element in the original array, or that is, or the first element in this uh, subarray. We compare eight to five. Okay, there's no need to compare more. Eight is greater than five. There's no place to insert before five, and that is the position for that uh, sorted subarray. One five eight. So after the second iteration, it becomes this. Third iteration, let's insert two to this ordered array. We compare two to eight. Well, eight is greater than two. We move eight. We shift eight to this position because we need to insert two at a position before that. And then we compare to five. Still, five is greater than two. We move. Okay. That means the room or the position for two must be before five. Okay. And then we compare to one. All right. That's it. Two is greater than one. Now the room left for two is this. All right. Now we inserted a two to the right position. After the third iteration, the array becomes this. Let's go on. Fourth iteration, insert seven. Seven compared to eight. Uh, well, let's move eight, shift eight, one position to the right. And a seven compared to five. Sorry, seven compared to five. Well, greater than five. Okay, no need to compare more. Seven. So after fourth iteration, the array becomes this and uh, this subarray has been ordered. Fifth iteration, we compare uh, zero, or we want to insert zero to this uh, existing ordered subarray. Zero compare eight, well, eight is greater than that, seven is greater than zero, and five is greater than that, too. You see, we need to shift all the elements in this order array to the right and make room for the zero, for the insertion position for zero. So after fifth iteration, this is ordered. Now the last one, that's the last iteration. Six and compare eight, no place for it, compared to seven, okay. Now six is greater than five, okay. Then this position is the right insertion position for six. So after six iteration, we have a sorted uh, array from uh, smallest key to the largest. Now you can see this algorithm indeed improves from the previous um, simple-minded selection algorithm because at each iteration, it does not need to compare all the elements to find the insertion position. And this is good. Suppose we have an array that's already ordered, meaning it's already ordered from the smallest key to the largest key. So already ordered. So you only need to scan once from this, you're done. That's the best case for insertion sort, meaning it sorts on a sorted array. Of course, this array has been already sorted ascendingly and you want to sort it ascendingly. If you want for each insertion position at each iteration, you can use binary search. That may improve the algorithm a little bit. Now, the worst case for this is for each insertion position, you would still need to do all the comparisons and also need to shift all the elements. Then that becomes no better than the selection sort, or maybe even worse. On average case, though, you can argue the insertion position, uh, to find the insertion position from uh, uh, this ordered uh, subarray, you only need to compare and shift half of them as the number of elements increases the insertion sort performs 
not significantly better than selection sort, although it is a better version of simple sort.、Uh, let's take a look at how we write selection sort and insertion sort in Python. Selection sort function takes two arguments. The first one is an array supposed to contain the keys ordered or not ordered. The second argument with a default value false.、Uh, if this flag is true at each iteration after the or at the end of this outer loop, we print the content of the array. That gives you the result of the array at each iteration. Of course, if by default if you don't specify the value, it would not print anything. This selection sort, like I explained, works iteratively. It starts from、uh, finding the smallest key from the original array. So I we start from zero, and at each iteration we. Find the smallest、uh, key from that given array. Once we find it, we copy it to that index that's supposed to store the smallest、uh, element for it. And of course, we do that by swapping, like as planned. The smallest one will come to that position. The first time, the smallest one will come to i, which is zero. And after the first iteration, I becomes、uh, one. It moved to the next index position, and then once you find the next、uh, smallest one, you copy to it. You copy to、uh, index position one, and the next time index position two. So、uh, it keeps、uh, moving the smallest, copying the smallest、uh, key to the next、uh, position. That's the outer loop.、Uh, the inner loop. While loop finds the smallest key from a given array, the inner loop finds the smallest key、uh, from a given range in the array. This procedure can be translated into other programming languages very easily. All right, let's look at、uh, insertion sort. Well, this is、uh, actually smaller than selection sort. The same two arguments. Array that contains the elements to be sorted, and the optional argument with the default value false. Simple validation again, and、uh, still double loops here. The outer loop, the for loop, retrieves、uh, each element starting from、uh, index one and、uh, all the way to、uh, the last element, and the inner while loop. Finds the a、uh, proper insertion position for the value to be inserted, and remember, as we explained, we comparing that to be inserted value to that ordered、uh, subarray, and if that number is less than the number, the preceding number or immediate number. In that su、uh, order subarray, we want to shift. We want to shift the number to the right to make room for the value to be inserted. So this way, you copy、uh, array i to array i plus one. Effectively, shifts element i to the next position. So we keep shifting until the value is no smaller than the value at. Uh, the previous position, and then we find that、uh, position to insert. And of course, you want to make sure you have、uh, also have the index、uh, invalid range. Once you find the insert po insert position, you assign that to the insert position. Then you are done for that value. You go back to the outer loop. You find the next element in the array to insert. That's the、uh, we increment the j. The j increments automatically when you do this in range. And then you start this inner loop again. The value to be inserted we start at index one. We don't start from zero because 
Like I explained, when we started this whole procedure, we assume the first one is already sorted. Of course, if an uh, array has only one element, yeah, it can be considered a solid, sorted. And also, one point uh, here is the insertion position is really at uh, i plus 1 after the inner, inner loop, which finds the insertion position. Uh, this is because we compared uh, the element at index i. When we exit the loop, the value to insert is definitely no smaller than the element at i. So element at i is not shifted. It needs to be remain at uh, where it is. And the insertion position is really i plus 1, which has already been shifted to the right. Next uh, sorting algorithm is called quick sort. It's a little bit uh, complicated than the previous two simple sorting algorithms because this one has recursion involved. Although, like most uh, recursive procedures or algorithms, they can be replaced by using loops. But here, using recursion can actually help us understand the algorithm easier or better. Now, the idea of a quick sort is at each iteration. Given a array, we find a value, we call it pivot. When we have the pivot, when we have selected the pivot value or key, we rearrange the array in such a way that part of the elements in the array are all less than the pivot value and another part of the array, I mean, to the right of the pivot, or having va values or keys greater than the pivot. For example, here, if we select pivot value 6, there are more than one way of selecting uh, a key as pivot. But let's keep it simple. We just uh, select the rightmost element as the pivot. So we select this guy as the pivot value. And we do something to rearrange the array such that the left part of the array or having elements less than, of course, less than or equal to this pivot value. And the right part of the array or having values greater than the pivot. After that, we recursively doing that quick search on this two subarrays. So for this subarray, again, we select a pivot and we part, in other words, we partition the subarray. We select a pivot, partition array, so there's another pivot, part of that, the left part of that, all less than that, and the right part all less or greater than that pivot value. And of course, this first pivot value will remain at the position because this is the sorted position for this key. The recursion applies to the right part of this subarray. We find the pivot value and then the left part, actually that's the part in between this and this, having elements or the keys less than that and this part greater than that. Now you can say we keep doing this until we reach to some uh, uh, base condition of the recursion. We would have the array in an ordered, uh, in a certain order, in ascending order in our case. Now let's do it uh, step by step. See how this quick sort procedure works. And the first iteration, we select a pivot, um, P-I-V-O-T, pivot value six. So this is our uh, pivot value. And we want to partition the array into two parts. One part is uh, less than this pivot value. The other part, the right part, having all elements greater than that. We do that 
by scanning the array from uh, two ends. We use I to start from uh, the very left, and we use J to start uh, the from the very right, of course, in this uh, subarray. And if we find a value, an element, a key that is less than the pivot from the left, we keep moving. So five is still here, but I moves to here. It's still less than that. So keep it here. I moves to the next until we hit a key that is uh, greater than the pivot. So now I stay stops at uh, uh, element eight. We stop this is because we know for the left subarray we need to have the elements less than six, the pivot value, and eight is greater than six. So somehow we assume the eight should be moved or swapped to another part of the array. So we stay out of here. For the J starting from this position, we do the uh, similar thing. We compare the value to the pivot. If it is uh, uh, greater than the pivot value, we should keep moving to the left, moving the J index to the left, because if the key here uh, is greater than six, that means it's already in the right uh, partition, the partition that contains the keys greater than the pivot value. Now, if it is less than that, in this case, zero is less than that, we stop here, meaning we need to swap the element at i and a j, because j needs to, the element at a j needs to be moved to a position at i, which will have element less than six. So we need to do the swapping here. And zero moves here, and uh, eight moves here. Now once we move it, we should move i position to the next, and uh, j position to this, because this three and this position are fixed. They are in the right partition. Now once we move this i to one more position to right, and j one position left, we keep doing the same thing. We, we compare if the element at i is less than uh, the pivot. If it is less than that, um, we should move on, because this is the right partition for this element, okay? And uh, this is two, keep it there, and i moves on. I will keep uh, moving to the right until it hits an element that is greater than pivot. Okay, now i is at seven, as points to seven, we stop. Now for j, if j is greater, if, if the element pointed by j is greater than the pivot, we should keep moving j to the left. So here now, j is, well, not here, j becomes here. So here, and i is here, j is here now. Now once j hits to an element, which is uh, two, is less than the pivot, uh, j stops, okay? At this point, we can make a decision because we already kind of uh, scanned, I mean, g and i crossed uh, each other. The scan should stop because the partition is virtually down. Now one part of that has all the elements less than the pivot value, and the other part has value or keys or greater than that. Now we need to find the position for the pivot value. The pivot value will be copied to this uh, position 
pointed by index i. So the pivot value will be here. Whatever the element at i will be need to be copied to the right index or the right um, or the index pointed by or the index for the pivot or the previous pivot value. So seven goes here. Now, after this iteration, you can say we rearrange the elements in the array. And the pivot value is fixed at its uh, ordered position. This is uh, the position um, if the, all the elements are sorted for assorted. And this is the position for the key value 6. After that, the left subarray has all elements with values less than 6. And the right subarray has all elements with values greater than 6. So after this iteration, we can perform recursion, a recursive function. We can perform the recursive call to this subarray here and here to repeat uh, the procedure we just did uh, again. In other words, for this subarray, we can pick pivot value, the rightmost uh, element, 2 as the pivot value. Then we then i starts from this, and um, j starts from this. And we do this scanning again, and we find uh, until i and j cross to each other that uh, gives us the position for the pivot value. So after that iteration, I mean, that iteration for this uh, subarray, we should have uh, something um, like this, 0, 1, 2. So the pivot value must be here. And we re rearranged uh, um, this subarray such that this subarray, I mean subarray to relative to this, has all values less than this, and a five has values greater than five is greater than that, than the pivot value two. So this is now changed, and this now changed yet. So if we finished the recursion on this subarray, we would end up with a array like this, and we can continue on to recursion on this. And this has only one element here. The recursion will just, uh, uh, the sort can end uh, instantaneously. We do the recursion here um, the same way. We pick seven as the pivot value, and then we find that position uh, for that pivot value by scanning, you know, i, j here, but this time it's just this, it ended up just like uh, swapping this. Well, this is called a uh, quick sort. So each iteration, we find a pivot value, we partition the array into two parts. The left part to the pivot value has all the keys less than the pivot value, and the right array has all elements with uh, uh, keys greater than the pivot value. Now, to analyze the performance of this, uh, it's not as straightforward as um, uh, the simple sorting. However, you can see the worst case is we somehow have very bad luck selecting the pivot. Each time the pivot uh, is, is somehow the smallest value. So it's not, it does not partition the array into two halves. That means each iteration, you have one partition almost at zero, and another partition having um, almost the entire elements except that pivot value. And then you have to do the recursion on that one minus size subarray. So that ended up almost like a selection sort. 
Now, the ideal case is every selection of the pivot value that will cut the array in half. That will give you the best uh, performance. And in fact, on uh, average case, it performs similar to the ideal case. Let's go over Python implementation of quicksort. Uh, the interesting thing about this is uh, you do need uh, two functions for this. One is the after function. That is the function supposed to be called by the application. So the application wants to sort the array and also decides whether to up output uh, the, the array content at each iteration for debugging purpose. But the actual algorithm and recursion is done by this inner quick sort. This function are not called directly by the application. But let's uh, look into this inner quick sort. We have an array and we have the left and right index that defines the subarray you want to partition. Now you should notice um, the art function calls inner quick sort by, by passing the leftmost index is zero and the rightmost index, which is uh, the array length minus one. That gives you the entire array to begin with. And that is the purpose of this uh, quick sort and this outer function. The inner quick sort operates on the subarray defined by this left index and right index. And we said we want to use a simple uh, pivot selection, which gives you the pivot at the right index. Now the scan begins from the very left uh, index and the index one left to the pivot, that's right index minus one. And this uh, loop is scanning from the left until we have uh, an element that is greater than or equal to the pivot. If the element is less than the pivot, we know there's no need to rearrange them. There's no need to rearrange it. The scan, the scanning, the right scanning is the opposite. If the key is greater than that, there's no need to uh, rearrange it. We keep decre decrementing uh, j. So this two while loop will dim to exit. You can think about a y. And once these two loops uh, exits, if at that point, i is less than j, meaning we need to rearrange, we need to swap an element which is less than the pivot, uh, which is uh, greater than, than the pivot, but uh, is at the left uh, position to the pivot, we need to swap it to the element uh, to the right of the pivot, which has, uh, which, is, which is determined by j, and currently it has the key less than the pivot, so we do the swapping. And again, all this implement implementation can be very easily translated into other languages. So we swap that. Once we swap that, we know we can move on. For, for i, we can move on to one index to the right. And for j, we can move on to one index to the left. We keep doing that. If i and j cross each other, we would break the loop. Once we break the loop, we know the i position is good uh, for the pivot. The i is really the partition point. And we, uh, we swap, we copy pivot to i, and we copy whatever the value at i, which is greater than or equal to the pivot to the rightmost index. Now the recursion occurs at the end. Once we have the pivot value fixed, the recursion occurs on the left partition to that pivot, which is left index to i minus one. Remember i is the index of the pivot. The pivot value is the right um, position for that, for that key. And the right subarray 
is one position to the right of the pivot value and on t to the right. Of course, this may be may not be a valid uh, array range, but that's okay because at the beginning of this uh, function, we check whether left index is greater than or equal to right index. If it is greater than or equal to right index, either you are out of range or the array has only one element. If the subarray has only one element, there's no need to partition it. All right, um, this covers our discussion of sorting algorithms. You can generate whatever random values in an array to test these uh, sorting procedures. Let's learn some basic uh, computer graphics uh, programming today. Uh, first of all, we want to know how a color is represented in computer. Computer uses RGB format for color. RGB stands for red, green, and blue. These are the three primary colors. A different combination of these three color components produce another color. And each color component can take on a value from uh, 0 to 255, um, integer value. The value represents the intensity of that color component. 0 means the least amount of intensity, meaning there's nothing from that color or that color, uh, that color component has zero contribution to the final color. If the value is 255, that color component is uh, at its uh, maximum intensity, or it is the brightest of that kind. Now we, use, we can use tuple with the three elements for each of the three color components. The first element we can uh, use for the red component, the second element in the tuple for the green, and the third one uh, for the color component blue. Each of this uh, element in the tuple need to have a value from 0 to 255 that reflects the uh, respective colors intensity. So if I put 0 here, 0 here, 0 here, all three color components have, uh, have 0 intensity. This produces uh, a color black. Nothing. Now what if all of them at uh, the maximum intensity so this gives us the result color uh, white. If we just uh, specify one value for one of the color components, for example, we only specify the red, or we give, give the red a non-zero intensity, and we make uh, the other two zeros, this actually gives us uh, a pure red. Because this intensity is the maximum for that color component, so this red is the brightest red. So in other words, if we keep the green component's intensity 0 and the blue color component's intensity 0, and we reduce the red's color intensity by half uh, to this, this will make uh, another kind of red, but uh, a little bit darker because the intensity is somehow less reduced. Of course, like I said, you can have any value from 0 to 255 for each of the color component. If I make this to red to 255, and green 200 to 55, and blue 0. This combination gives us a yellow color. This is uh, a pure yellow with the brightest uh, 
And this is the brightest yellow because this and this have the maximum intensity. Now the tuple is one way of uh, representing RGB format, and sometimes you can use a hexy number because zero to two hundred fifty-five can be stored by a byte, eight bits. We learned binary uh, a while ago. One byte without uh, taking, without using the first bit for the sign, can store value from 0 to 255. So for a color components in intensity, a byte is just good. For black, a hexy uh, representation could be uh, is something like this. This is one byte, another byte, third byte. This byte is for red, and this byte is for green and this one is for blue. And for white color is hex C format using RGB is FF, that's the R component, one byte, another byte, green, and third byte, FF, that's the blue. Now for a darker red, 0x80, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 80 is red, this byte green, and this byte blue. This is hexadecimal, and this is equivalent to uh, hexadecimal 228. Now with this 3 bytes, 24 bits, we can have a 2 to 24 number of different colors. This is the whole color space using 24-bit uh, RGB format. And this is quite big. We don't use much of it. <clears throat> Next, uh, let's talk about a screen coordinates. Screen coordinates is a coordinates of a 2D XY plane used by computer to render graphics. To be more precise, this 2D XY plane is defined for a computer program, computer programs displaying window. For example, I have a window here. The title of this window is called Graphics Basics. This is, a, this is actually a Python program. The origin of this displaying window is at this up up left corner, this is 0, 0. The x direction goes from uh, left to right. This is x. The y axis goes from top to down. So this is y. The difference from our um, coordinate system used in mathematics is the origin is at the up left corner instead of at the left bottom corner and the y direction, y axis is flipped. The display window is usually a rectangle or square. It has x, uh, it has width and height. The width is this from left to the right. And the height is this. The width and the height uh, are in pixels. For example, the width here 800, each height here is 500. That means the height is 500 pixels, or the width is 800 pixels. Now with 800 and 500, you get 500 times uh, 800. That's the resolution of this display window. If you want to draw a line inside this window, you must have that coordinate in this range. If you draw a line from 0, 0 to 100, 100, that's good. It's probably 100, 100 is at here. So this is a line from 0, 0 to 100, 100. 
because this is the screen card in the system. So the line is downwards instead of uh, a slant from uh, left to the right upwards. That's a typical, uh, you typically say in, a, in mathematics. If you draw something on the side of the window, for example, if you draw a circle uh, that has the center is beyond 800 and 500, you would not say it. So you must be very careful about the uh, drawing graphics using screen coordinates. Now later we will learn something to transform the screen coordinates into whatever the coordinate system we, we want. But here, let's stick with the given screen coordinates. The origin is from uh, the left up corner and X goes from left to right and Y goes from top to down. In fact, this is uh, the fourth quadrant uh, of uh, coordinate system you say in uh, mathematics, just with the Y flipped. Now let's draw some basic geometry shapes in Python using a package called Pygame. If you haven't installed this package Pygame, you can type in the commands pip install Pygame in terminal window. I have installed this uh, package already, so I just need to import at line 5, import Pygame. Next, import a built-in module, system sys module. The first thing to use Pygame is to initialize the package. We do it at line 9, pygame.init. After that, we define the window size, the displaying window size. 800 pixels width for the window and 500 pixels height. After that, we set the display by passing the window width and height in a tuple. This returns a drawing surface. All the graphics will be drawn on this main window. We also, we also want to give, uh, give the window a title. We can call it Graphics Basics. For this small application, we can have a frame rate 10. That means we can uh, that means we refresh the main loop 10 times per second. The main loop includes uh, calculation, whatever calculation, and uh, the final screen updates. We use pygame time dot clock to help us track the time. After that, line 29 to line 34, we define a few color constants. And this color constants are in RGB format, we just uh, talked about. We use a tuple for, um, for, the, uh, for, the, for the color. The first element in the tuple is the red component. The second is the green component. The third is the blue one. For a color line, red components 0, blue component is 0, the second component green. R, G, B, green component will give its uh, full intensity. So this is the brightest uh, uh, green color, lime. And similarly, we define a color for the pure red, the brightest uh, red. And of course, we use uh, one byte for color component and there are three components, so the three bytes, 24 bits, it gives us um, uh, quite a bit, um, more than 60 million uh, number of uh, colors. We don't need all that. However, if you are interested, you can go to uh, this link, uh, rapidtables.com, to find more named color constants. All right, next is the important uh, graphics loop. Everything happens in this while loop. First, in the loop, we make sure the loop does not run beyond the uh, frame rate we want. And a second, there's a small for loop within this uh, while true loop. 
So this for loop is to trap the event, the user inputs. So if the user wants to exit the application, we want to exit immediately without just uh, uh, closing it through the debugger. At line 40, 41, we check if the event type is quit. If it is pygame.quit event, we just want to exit this application. So pygame quit and sys.exit will exit the application. Certainly it will exit the loop. So we have guaranteed a way to break from this a seemingly infinite while true loop. Uh, by default, the background color for a high game window is black. Now, since I have defined a different background color, so we can fill up uh, that color for the window's background color. Before we proceed to draw the basics, draw the, draw the basic geometries, we run this, see what happens run this program. All right, you see we, we have a window, it's about 800 pixels in width and 500 pixels in height. And also keep in mind this width and height exclude the, uh, the size of the title bar and the size of the border. Because we haven't drawn anything here, you just see the uh, background color showing up. And of course, we set the Windows title to Graphics Basics. So this is the, uh, the Windows title. All right, let's close it. All right, first, let's see how do we draw a rectangle. Let's remove the comment. This is the API um, provided by Pygame to draw a rectangle. The first argument you passed is the drawing surface we created above we created at this set mode. Like I said, all the drawings happens on this main window. So the first argument you pass to the draw.rectangle rect is main window. And the second argument is the color. And the third argument is the coordinate and dimension of this rectangle. So we want to draw the rectangle uh, at coordinate 30 and 10. 30 and 10 is the left top corner of this rectangle. 30, 10 is the coordinate of the left top corner of this rectangle. And 100 is the width of the rectangle. And 50 is the height of the rectangle. Of course, this dimension, these sizes are in pixels. The last argument here is the thickness of the line. All right, let's uh, run it, see if uh, we can see a, a rectangle. Run it. All right, now you see a rectangle color green, about that size at the, the coordinate 30 and 10. It's about right. So let's close this. Next, Let's say another rectangle drawing API. And this time we change the, the last uh, argument. And of course, we changed this coordinate of the rectangle's left top corner. We changed the Y coordinate. We moved it down to uh, 100. Remember in screen coordinates, the y positive direction goes from top to down. So this 100 actually moves this rectangle below the rectangle we just draw above. And this last argument, if it is zero, that means we want to fill up this rectangle, fill the rectangle with the color, which is the second argument. So let's run it. All right, you see the same rectangle size. However, the second rectangle is filled with this color. All right, we are done with uh, rectangles. Let's see lines. How about uh, draw a line using pi, pi game? 
we know two points define line. So we need to pass the two points for the line to this um, pygame draw line API method. First argument still the same. That's the drawing screen. And the second argument is the color. And this time we want to draw a red line. Third and fourth arguments define two endpoints of the line. In fact, it is uh, we are drawing a line segment because in geometry, a line really has no ends. We are drawing uh, a line that connects these two end points. And the last argument is the line thickness. So the line will be drawn at coordinate 30 to 100 to 120 to 100. And noticing the x coordinate is different. However, the y coordinates for these two points are the same. So that means we are drawing a horizontal line. So let's run this program. Run it. OK, this is the, the red line, a horizontal line from left to right. Let's close it. All right, now let's see what about uh, another line. Still the same window, the same color, same line thickness. Um, but we changed uh, these uh, coordinates. So this time, for the two points, the x coordinates are the same, 30. However, y are different. Now, if the x coordinate is the same, but the y is different, we are drawing a, a we are drawing a vertical line. Run it. Indeed, we are seeing a vertical line. Close it. All right, let's continue. How about I draw um, a line, inclined line? The same thing, first argument, the drawing surface, the second argument for the color. And this time, the coordinates is the start point of the coordinates. The coordinates of the start point is 30, 30 uh, 350. And the end point on the line is 140. So we are drawing a inclined line, a slant. Run it. All right. This is a slant. And a noticing, I'm not sure if you can see this on your screen, but here you can see this line is not as smooth as the above two horizontal and vertical lines. Close it. To deal with this situation, computer has a um, technique called anti-aliasing to smooth the drawing, to smooth the border, the edge of a graphic. So we can use pygame.draw.aa line. That gives us a line much smoother. First argument, second argument, same thing. We want to move that line slightly below uh, the one we just uh, drew above. And for a AA line, anti-aliasing line, we don't need to specify the last argument. But let's run it. All right, now you see another line with anti-aliasing. So this line looks much smoother. OK, let's move on. What's next? All right. Use Pygame, we can draw a line that connect, uh, we can draw a line that connects two points on the screen. We can also uh, use Pygame to connect a series of uh, lines. The API for that is pygame.draw.lines. First argument, join surface. Second argument, let's make this line blue. And third argument, 
Well, let's talk about the fourth argument first. The first, uh, the fourth argument is a list of the coordinates that we want to, uh, we want them to be connected. And of course, the last uh, argument is still the line uh, thickness. The third argument tell Pygame whether to connect the last uh, two points in the uh, coordinates. So this we have defined a list of uh, four points. One, two, three, four. And we don't want to connect the, uh, the last uh, points to the first. So we should say a three line segment, a blue, in color blue. So let's run it. All right, that's this uh, lines. Similar to draw a AA line, you can also draw AA lines, meaning apply anti-aliasing technique to uh, for connecting all the points. Okay, let's see next one. Next one, let's see how to draw an ellipse. We use this pygame.draw.ellipse. Main window, color blue. And this last argument give us the bounding rectangle for that ellipse. And rectangle, the first element is the first two elements in this list is the coordinate of this bounding rectangle's left and up corner. And third element is the width of the bounding rectangle and the fourth argument, uh, the fourth element is the height of this bounding rectangle. So the ellipse will be drawn within this bounding rectangle. Run it. Okay, now you see an ellipse. Because we did not pass the line thickness for that ellipse, actually that ellipse was filled with the color. It's a filled ellipse. If we want to just uh, draw an ellipse without uh, uh, filling it with color, we need to pass another argument, the last argument, indicating the line thickness. So still you call pygame.draw.ellipse, main window, the color, and the bounding rectangle, and the thickness of the line. Now this way you draw a unfilled ellipse. Now this time the bounding rectangle is the same size as above. So 150 width and 18 height. However, this time we move the rectangle downwards by 100 pixels. So we moved uh, from two, uh, 120 to 220. Run it. All right, now you see a unfilled ellipse. Close it. Move on. Let's say draw a circle. How to draw a circle? We know to draw a circle, we need, uh, uh, we need to know the center of the circle and the radius of it. Mathematically speaking, once we know the radius and the center, we know the circle. And it is true with pi game. We pass a coordinate that is the center of the circle 320 and 380, and the radius 50. And for the circle's thickness is 1. So run it, and this time the color is yellow. We should see a yellow circle at 320 and 380. Okay, now you see a circle. And of course, if you uh, give a bounding rectangle as a square to draw a ellipse, I'm sure it will display a circle. Close it. Uh, let's move on. What, uh, what about 
drawing an arc. For an arc, uh, it's very similar to uh, drawing an ellipse. So you give a bunny rectangle. However, you need to provide span of the angle. The third argument is the uh, starting angle, and the fourth argument is the ending angle. So by specifying a start and an angle, you, de you define uh, the rotation or the span of that arc in terms of radians. So you need to pass this third and fourth arguments in radians for the start and an angle for that arc. And again, the last argument is the arc's thickness. So let's run it. Okay, now you say a arc. And uh, if you notice, what I specified here is for the arc to start from zero degrees to a three quarter of pi. Now the arc is about that angle. Correct. Close it. Next one. Polygon. For drawing a polygon, we need to define for a polygon, we need to pass the pi game a list of coordinates that indicate uh, the vertices of that polygon. The first argument, the second argument, no difference. The third argument is a list of list. A list of coordinates. And each of the coordinates, each of the coordinate x, y is a vertex of that polygon. run it. Now you see here it's a polygon. One, two, three, four, five. In fact, when you draw a polygon like this, the it connects the last point to the beginning point automatically. So this is uh, somewhat similar to draw lines, but it connects by itself automatically. Of course, the polygon, you can uh, fill it or not fill it by changing the last argument. Okay, last one. Last one is really not, uh, it's nothing new. The last one is nothing new. We want to draw a donut. We draw that by drawing two circles. The first one, we draw using um, a dark orange color with a radius 70. The second one this is drawn at the same location. The second circle is at the same location, same coordinate, but a smaller radius. The color is background color. We have to draw the first one, draw the bigger circle first using a color that is different from the background. And the second one, because it's using a background color, it would overwrite. It would draw on top of the original one. It would actually override the dark orange color with the background color. Now you run it, you see a donut. So the inner circle is using a background color, so you don't see it, but the end results it's like a donut. All right, so much for basic drawings. I hope you like it. We have learned some basic computer graphics. We know how to use a Python package, Pygame, to draw some simple geometry shapes, such as a line, a circle, a polygon, a ellipse, a rectangle, etc. Now, what if I ask you to draw a regular hexagon? given its size length and the center coordinate of its uh, circumscribed circle. 
there is no such a function in Pygame directly available for you to draw such a regular polygon. So how to do it? Of course, we need to calculate the coordinates of each of the six vertices of this regular hexagon. Once we know the coordinates of these six vertices, we can easily use Pygame draw polygon or draw lines to connect them to make a, a regular hexagon. Now, you can calculate the coordinates directly in its original, uh, this blue XY coordinate system, this screen coordinate system. However, we can choose another coordinate system that can help us make the calculation easier. So long we translate that coordinates to the final screen coordinates, we are still good. So in other words, by adopting a different coordinate system, we can make the whole calculation more obvious and simpler. For instance, I have a x prime, y prime, this green coordinate system with its origin. Origin here, zero, zero. Coincides with this regular hexagon's circumscribed circle's center. And the x prime's direction goes from left to right, and the y prime's direction goes from bottom to top. And of course, x prime is parallel to x, and y prime is parallel to y. The only thing is the y prime's direction is flipped, it's going upwards. And in fact, this is the coordinate system we are more accustomed to. With this coordinate system, this green one, the calculation for each of these six vertices coordinate becomes simpler. Like I said, we are given the length of the uh, regular hexagon side, L, and we know the center. Now, because it is a regular hexagon, all the sides are equal. And if we draw a line to connect the origin from uh, the second vertex to the origin, the origin of x prime, y prime, this angle is 60 degrees. And the length of this equals to this, and also equals to this. This is a equilateral triangle. And for this one, if we connect, this is also 60 degrees, and this is 60 degrees. Now, for the first vertex, the coordinate becomes pretty straightforward or obvious. So the L, the length of this is L, because this is an equilateral triangle. So that's the x prime coordinate for this vertex. What about the y? So simple, it's a zero. Now we can get the first vertex coordinate pretty easily. It is L zero. Now what about the second one, the second vertex? It's still very straightforward. We can just think uh, to get the second vertex, we rotate this one, the first vertex, 60 degrees counterclockwise. We get this. Or you can calculate using some simple uh, trigonometry. It's very simple. So the x is really L cosine 60 degrees. So this is x. Now the y is L sine 60 degrees. So this is the second vertex 
coordinate. The same way we can get the third one, fourth one, five, uh, the fifth one, and the sixth one. And just uh, for each of them, we the rotation, the angle is different. The first one is 60 degrees. For the second one, we're going to plug in cosine 120 degrees. And for the, th um, for the third one here is uh, 180 degrees. Now we know it's very easy to calculate this regular hexagons vertices coordinates relative to x prime and y prime system. We cannot use uh, this to draw directly because the computer only render only knows the coordinates uh, re relative to this uh, blue one, this blue x and y. So that means once we get this coordinates in x prime and y prime, we need to translate, translate them back to the original screen coordinate system, the, um, the blue one. And uh, we know we are given the center of this uh, uh, regular hexagon. So the center is relative to the original screen system, x0, y0. x0, y0 is relative to this, uh, uh, to this origin, the blue 0, 0. How do we find out the relationship between a coordinate in x prime, y prime system and the coordinate system, a coordinate in the blue x, y system? We are doing a homogeneous transformation. So the transform applies to every point in x prime and y prime. No difference. The transformation is the same for every point here. If it applies to the first vertex, it applies to the second one. If it applies to the origin here, it applies to um, any other points. By simple calculation, you say for um, the origin in x prime. Well, let's use a different color. Green. So x prime. So if I plus x zero, I get the x in this blue coordinate system. We just need to add x zero as an offset to x prime's coordinate. Then we get the x coordinate in this blue xy system. Then what about um, the y prime? So what about y prime? How do we transform from a y prime to y? Now suppose we have a point here, the second vertex. The y prime is um, this distance. Okay. And uh, the y0 is from here to here. That's the y offset. So what we need is really this distance. This distance is very easy. It is um, y0, the offset, minus y prime. Now we get this transformation. We can map a coordinate in x prime, y prime. By adding the offset, we can transform them to a coordinate in x, y system. Now we have refreshed mathematics about uh, 2D transformation. Let's see how we do it in Python program. We need to import the packages and modules we need. Pygame, sys, and math. We need the math module for calculating sine and cosine. Line 6, we initialize pygame, pygame.init. Line 9 and line 10, we define two constants for the displaying windows size. 500 pixels in width and 500 pixels in height. 
Line thirteen, we set the window's size by passing the two variables in a tuple, and this Pygame Display Set Mode returns the drawing surface main window, which will be used for drawing the geometry shapes. In this case, a regular hexagon. Line sixteen, we specify our window's title, Graphics Two D Transformation. Line 19, we give a frame rate of 10. We don't want to our main loop to use uh, as much as CPU. Um, the main loop should execute no more than 10 times per second. That's sufficient. Next, we create a Pygame clock to help us track the time. Line 26 to 31. As usual, we define a few uh, color constants using RGB format. Next, line 33. This is uh, the function that draws a regular hexagon. It takes four arguments. First is the joint surface. The second is the center coordinate of this uh, regular hexagon's so circumscribed circle. Third argument, the length of the side. And the fourth argument, the color, the color we want to draw for this uh, regular hexagon. Before we look into this function, let's uh, take a look at our main uh, Pygame loop. This should be a while true loop. So this way we'll keep the window uh, displaying. First, we update the frame rate. And again, we have a small for loop inside this while loop to trap the user input. So that if the user closes the window, we can exit the program gracefully. After that small for loop, uh, we update the displaying window's background with the background color. After that, we call this draw regular hexagon function. So this is the joint surface, the first argument. The second is the coordinate. We pass the xy coordinate. The third one is the length of the uh, regular hexagon. The fourth one, the color. We want to draw this uh, regular hexagon in blue. Once we draw it, we update the display. All right, now let's look into this draw regular hexagon function. Line 40, we define a variable that is uh, 6 degrees in radians. So this is uh, a variable for the rotation angle in radians. Line 41, line 41, we use uh, points list to collect the coordinates of this to be calculated uh, six vertices. Like I said, the X prime, Y prime coordinate systems or region coincides with the center of the circumscribed circle. The X offset, Y offset should take the center point's coordinate. And the X offset, Y offset is relative to the screen coordinate. And that is the coordinate we translate to for uh, X prime and Y prime. The next for loop, the next for loop, we compute the coordinate for this six vertices. And for each vertex, we know the rotation angle increment, the rotation angle increment by 60 degrees. At line 46, it's uh, the direct translation of the formula we described above. So the first element in this um, list calculates the x coordinate from x prime coordinate. So side length times cosine rotation plus this offset. This transforms the x prime coordinate to x coordinate. The next element transforms the y prime to y. 
and this makes uh, uh, a coordinate for p, and we add it to the points list. We do this for six vertices. After this, we use Pygame draw AA lines to connect all these points. Okay, run it. Now we see a regular hexagon with a center at about 100 and a Y to 50. Now, if you want to change this position, you can simply change the coordinate, the center coordinate. Uh, how about um, 250, 250, and we make this uh, size bigger, the length of the side bigger. Stop this, and then run it again. All right, now you see we have a bigger regular hexagon centered at 250 and a 250. All right, we have come to this far. Let's move one step further. This formula, this, tra this transformation formula can be expressed using matrix. X, Y, this is a row column equals this transformation matrix times this X prime, Y prime one. We introduced a one more dimension here to make the matrix uh, multiplication work. Now the transformation matrix is one, zero, the offset x zero, zero, minus one, because we flipped to the y direction, and this is y zero, and this zero, zero, one. So this transformation matrix times this x prime y prime vector will give you the coordinate in x y plane. Let's generalize this even further. Suppose I want to draw something in x prime y prime coordinate system where the x prime starts from x minimum to x maximum. The y prime starts from um, y minimum to y maximum such that I don't have to be limited by the original, this blue coordinate system, where you can only draw a coordinate in the range of um, 0 to w for x and 0 to h for y. Now in this x prime, y prime coordinate system, the left up corner is really x minimum, y maximum and the right bottom corner's coordinate is x maximum y minimum so in other words the coordinate x minimum y min y maximum shall be translated to 0 0 and what and this um, x maximum y minimum shall be translated transformed to w and h by solving that we get a transformation matrix let me just uh, write down this uh, transformation uh, 2d transformation matrix so the matrix is x 0 tx 0, x, y, t, y, 0, 0, 1. As x is the scaling factor of x transformation, x coordinate, and as y is the scaling factor of the y coordinate transformation, t, x, t, y is the origin, translated origin, uh, or the offset. In other words, the Tx is here, Ty is here. We have seen this before. Now the translation, now the transformation is um, for any coordinate in terms of uh, x prime, y prime. By applying the transformation matrix, we get the coordinate in terms of uh, x, y. Sx and Sy 
are the scaling factors for x and y uh, for x and y axis, and t x and t y are the offsets for x x and y coordinate. So with this transformation matrix, for any coordinate in terms of x prime y prime, we can transform it to the coordinate x y in terms of uh, x y. Because we know x minimum, y maximum, and uh, x maximum, y minimum, we know these two coordinates in x prime, y prime are mapped to 0, 0 and wh respectively. So we can solve them to get this uh, uh, transform matrix. There's another transformation, that's the rotation. The rotation matrix is cosine theta minus sine theta sine theta cosine theta and normalize it to uh, 3 by 3 matrix so this gives you the rotation matrix about the origin in other words, if I have a coordinate in x prime, y prime, by applying the rotation, we can get another coordinate x prime, x one prime, y one prime in x prime, y prime coordinate. So this is a rotation, rotation about origin. So with the rotation matrix and uh, this um, translate and scale matrix, we can virtually do any graphics we want. Let's look at a um, Python example. See so how we use this 2D transformation. This time we want to draw a, a sine wave, a sine curve from uh, minus 6 pi to positive 6 pi. Well, first let's run this program, see what we say. All right, so this is a sine curve from a minus 6 pi to positive 6 pi. I don't have the uh, grid line or the axis line drawn here, but you can count this is uh, one period, two, three, and another three, uh, from 0 to uh, the positive 6 pi. All right, let's close this and see how we did it in the program. As usual, we import packages and modules as needed. This time we import numpy for matrix manipulation. Line 11, initialize pi game. Line 14 and 15, define the size of the display window. And this time we have to uh, make the width and height the same so that we don't distort the curve. Line 18, we pass the size to set mode function that returns this drawing surface. Line 21 sets the window's title. Same frame rate. And the clock again. And the same color constants. We don't care about the draw regular hexagon anymore. Now this is the function get translate and a skill transform. This returns the translate and the transform matrix we just described. The join surface the x minimum, x maximum, y minimum, y maximum. These are the range of the x prime, y prime coordinate system where we can draw the curve. So inside it, so I have a description for you to understand how to get this transformation matrix. With this impulse x minimum, 
maximum, y minimum, y maximum, it's pretty easy to calculate the scaling factor and the offset. With that, we can have this um, matrix SX0, TX0, SY, TY001. This is uh, the right transform matrix we need. Then we return this transformation matrix for rotation. This is the angle in radians. This is the rotation matrix. The rotation is about the origin. So it's pretty straightforward. All right. Now this one is uh, the transform function. Given a coordinate in x prime, y prime system, we want to transform it to a coordinate relative to x, y. We need to draw something in the end in the screen coordinate system. I commented the rotation so that we can test um, the translation and scale first. Okay, now this function get translate and scale transform, uh, we just described, but we pass the arguments. The x minimum is minus 6 pi. x maximum is 6 uh, pi. And for the y is the same dimension the same uh, uh, range. For drawing a curve, we need to make sure the x and the y map uh, in the same proportion. Otherwise, you would see a distorted curve when you do the rotation. All right, let's... Uh, oh, this is the rotation matrix. So pi, this is um, a quarter of pi for um, 45 degrees. So this matrix will rotate the curve by 45 degrees above the origin. Now this is a uh, draw sine curve. We start from uh, minus 6 pi and we stop at positive 6 pi. And we draw at a 0 0.2 radians increment. So we want to draw a point at every 0 0.2 radians. Okay, now this is uh, PT0 is our first um, point, x, and uh, get the sine, sine x, that's y, but we need to transform, transform the point in terms of uh, x, y coordinate for drawing. The computer really takes the coordinate in the screen coordinate system. Uh, the transform coordinate function actually will return a list with the three elements in it. We, for a coordinate x, y, we only need the first two. So that's why we're slicing, slicing the first two elements out of the return vector. Now the while loop will draw, will compute the coordinate at, uh, eight, at every 0 0.2 radians increment. But for every coordinate, we have to transform. Transform the coordinate from x prime, y prime to x, y. Again, because this returns a three element list, we need to slice the first two out of it. After we get the point, we can draw a, a line to connect these two points. After that, we assign point 1 to point 2. Basically, we move on to connect to the next point. Run it again. Now you see this um, sine curve. Okay, now let's, uh, let's enable. Let's enable this uh, rotation. We want to rotate the sine curve by 
45 degrees here. We need to apply the transform matrix after the rotation because the rotation would rotate the curve about the origin in x prime y prime and then we translate the rotated coordinate in x prime y prime to x y so this would uh, rotate first by 45 degrees counterclockwise and then we translate that into x y let's run it bingo you see a rotated sine curve from um, minus 6 pi to positive 6 pi. Okay. If you're interested, you can, you can experiment by rotating a uh, different angle. And also, you can change this scale, scaling. You can change the range that would change the scaling factor. All right. That's enough for our discussion about uh, 2D transformation. It is a little bit uh, mathematic heavy, um, but it's very useful. By now, we have learned a lot of uh, programming basics using Python. We learned Python types, variables, and the operations of the types. We learned functions, control flows, modules, and we can do a lot of interesting things in the combination of them. Next, I'd like to introduce a concept called class. This concept is very common in modern programming languages, such as C++, Java, C Sharp, etc. Class is the foundation of doing object-oriented analysis and design, which is a very powerful and intuitive way of tackling a real-world problem which requires software as a solution or part of a solution. A class is a template for user-defined type. Python has many built-in types, such as numerical types, strings, lists, and dictionaries. Using class, you can define whatever types you want. You can also think a class is a way of modeling a real-world concept, an entity, or thing. For example, we can use class to capture the essential characteristics of a convenience store. The convenience store can later be used as a type in your Python program. In Python, we use keyword class to define the class. Here at line 8, we define a class called convenience store. There's a certain convention of naming the class name. For each word in the class name, the first letter should be uppercase. This is sometimes called camel naming convention. It is convention, it's not a hard Python requirement. Without that, the program would still run. However, by making the class name different from the variable name, it can stand out. For a convenience store, what could be the attributes? A convenience store could have a name, the name of the store, the address, the telephone number, and the manager of the store. And we initialize these attributes in a special method called constructor. The constructor starts with uh, double underscore, then init, followed by another double underscore. This method is invoked when an instance of this class is created. We'll talk about that shortly. But this method is no different than other methods or other ordinary methods, except the first argument by default refers to the class as a self. It's called a self in most of cases. The following arguments are just as other regular or other ordinary functions. You can have uh, arbitrary number of arguments for your constructor. You can also have arguments that take on default values. Of course, a real convenience store would have 
much more attributes than just this four. At line 12, I have a debug statement. So whenever this constructor is called, I print this, this line, convenience store, ctor dash store name. Ctor is a short name used by a lot of programmers to refer the constructor. Now let's talk about what is an instance of the class. Like I mentioned before, a class is a definition of a real world concept or entity. An instance is the realization of this concept. A class can have many instances of it. We have one definition of convenience store. We can use this convenience store as a template to create many convenience store instances. Okay, let's say, how do we do it? First, we want to create an instance and assign it to, to a store called store A. And you notice when we create the instance, we just call the class name as a, a function. However, we need to pass whatever the arguments required except the first, uh, first one. The first one we don't need to pass, we cannot. So the, the argument we passed here, store A, will actually pass to the store name in this constructor. When we call this underline 19, this init will be invoked. That's why we call it constructor. We don't call init directly. We call the constructor by creating the instance using the class name as a function. And of course, we need to pass the necessary arguments. Run it. All right, now you say we created an instance of the store and the store has a name called store A. Because I did not provide this um, argu uh, value for these two arguments, so this address, telephone number, and manager does not have any value for store A. Like I said, you can create as many instances of convenience store as you want. And this time, let's do another store. And we call it a store B. The name of it is store B. Again, we don't pass uh, any argument for the self. The name store B, and we specify uh, the telephone number for store B. Run this. All right, now we created a two instances of the convenience store with store B has a phone number, uh, 532, whatever. Most classes will have many operations other than just uh, this uh, constructor. For convenience store, we probably can have um, these functions. This is just for illustration purpose. Once we create the convenience store instance, we may want to update the store name, update the store address, update the telephone number of the store, update the manager of the store. And also we can have a, a override special function to print the store's uh, information. Uh, let's uh, look at each of the method one at a time. For this class method, the first argument, again, is um, the self that refers to the class itself. Update store name. Whenever you pass a store name here, it would replace whatever the store name it currently has. Why we do this? Well, one of the reasons is sometimes we need to provide a certain validation for, uh, for the input. So if the store name is not a good name or it's a zero length, you don't want to update it. You probably can prompt the user to do something or log there's something wrong with this update. You don't want to mess up the current good information. 
And the same thing with other methods. For example, when we update the telephone, we can do a simple validation. The telephone number has to be in this format. First three digits for the area code, dash, and then followed by uh, seven digits phone number. Of course, this is just an example giving you the reason why you want to have a method of updating your class attributes instead of updating that directly. We know here in this example, uh, we can access the telephone number directly from uh, the store B instance. But when we update it, we want to do it through a method. Production convenience store, you definitely would have uh, more methods, more rigorous argument validation. The last method is uh, called overriding method because the object, the Python itself, for each Python object, it has this built-in print implementation. But for us, when we print the convenience store type, we want to return some basic information. For example, here I can return a self name, the convenience store's name and address. This provides a, a user more readable information. Okay, let's use some of the methods we just uh, uh, implemented. Still, we create a store A, but uh, after the creation, we want to update the store A's telephone number. And then we want to update the store A's uh, address. We want to print the store A's telephone number. And then 47, we want to print the store A. Well, this print will actually call this double underscore string underscore self. Like I said, this print would call this, which will give uh, the user a more a friendly information. Without implementing this, the print store A would invoke the default implementation uh, of printing the type. The same way we create a store B, we print uh, store B's telephone number, and then we print uh, uh, store B's information. Now to invoke a method, a class method, we can actually, we should call it uh, uh, instance method. To call this class instance method, we do this, we call store A, which is um, the instance, the variable, instance variable, dot, and the method. As other methods, we need to pass the necessary arguments. For update telephone number, updating telephone, all we need is to provide one argument, the number of the telephone, the telephone number. Same to the uh, same to invoke the constructor. We don't provide this uh, self uh, argument. All right, let's run this. Okay, let's say the output one line at a time. So this is uh, the print from the constructor. This is from uh, this line. And next, we updated the store A's telephone number. So store A telephone number is 001. And the store A's address is this, correct? And there's a store A at uh, 10 Fushan Avenue. That's from this uh, overriding function double underscore string, double underscore. So after we updated uh, this address, when we print store A, it printed it printed a user a more friendly information. For store B, the same thing, but we don't have the address for it. So you see the blank, blank information for the address. Now you see, Store A has its own name and uh, telephone number and address. And a Store B has its 
own different number and address. Of course, the name included. So instance store A and、uh, instance store B are different. Changing the value of one does not affect the other. These are two different instance variables, convenience store instance variables. Next,、uh, let's look at an example using class to represent a concept. RGB color, and we know RGB color has three components: red, green, blue, and the different combination of the three components produces another color. So, in the constructor, here we provide three arguments: RGB. And notice、uh, in inside this constructor, the attribute for red, green, blue have a leading double underscore. This will make these three attributes private. The private means these three attributes are not accessible directly from、uh, the instance of RGB color. We use this underscore、um, double underscore. To mimic the feature of other programming languages, other OO programming languages such as C++, Java, or C#. Sharp. Now, why we do this? We do this is one of the reason is I want to the RGB color immutable once it is created. I don't want the RGB instance changeable after it is created. However, you can access the red, green, blue component through the property, the read-only property. This is sometimes called getter. For accessing the red component, we define a property called red, and this is the Python a special thing self. Really, when you call this red property, you don't. You don't need to pass the self argument, and it returns the internal private attribute. The same thing with the green and the blue attribute. The last、uh, method here, as we、uh, explained before, we override this underscore string underscore. This provides a user friendly、uh, version of a print. Print of this、uh, object. Let's see how do we create a、uh, uh, RGB color instance. Color one is the instance variable, and we call the class name as a function. But we need to pass the necessary arguments: red, green, and blue. And because this is the constructor required, three arguments. We don't need to worry about uh, uh, the first one. We created that. Now we can access the red component this way. Color one dot red, almost like you invoke、uh, a method, but because it's a property as we defined, we don't need to pass any argument, and in fact we cannot、uh, invoke as a, a, a typical function meaning red with parentheses. Now we just call color one dot red. This is、uh, access like a property. Now the print color one will call this、uh, user friendly print. Like I said, we cannot do this way. Color one dot double underscore red. Underscore red is not accessible, and also we cannot change the component. We cannot change. RGB component once the color one is created. This effectively will make color one immutable after the creation. Let's run it. See what happens. All right, we create color one, and this is uh, uh, the print from、uh, line twenty six. Color one red component value is zero. And this one is from、uh, line twenty eight. So when you print a color one, it prints、uh, the more user friendly format.
of the information of this instance. By designing a class or class attributes as private, this, this is referred to as encapsulation, which means you access the information through the property or methods. And uh, the property or methods can do certain uh, operations or performing certain logics without you, the caller, needing to know the underlying details. Okay, I'd like now to talk about another feature of Python, a feature of class. This is called operator overloading. The operator overloading applies to a class. For RGB color class, we want to use the plus sign to add two color, two RGB color instances. For example, here at line 37, we create a color 2 RGB, okay? And color 3 equals to color 1 plus color 2. So this plus sign here is called, uh, is overloaded inside this um, RGB color class by this double underscore add double underscore. So what that means is when you have this implemented, underscore add underscore, when the class instance says this plus sign, here it will invoke this method. When this is invoked, you can do whatever makes sense. In this case, we want to add the red component, add the green component, and then add the blue component. And we create a new color, new RGB color instance, and return it. Now here, let's go back to the, uh, the constructor first, because when we add two color component, it may go out of range. So we use uh, this minimum, maximum to clip it in the valid range, which is from 0 to 255. All right, the first argument in this operator overloading called self. Self actually is uh, the left-hand side of uh, this um, operator. And the color 2 will be passed to this other argument. This is the way we can add two color, two RGB color instances. So again, color one plus color two. This plus operator will go, will invoke this underscore add underscore method of the uh, of the instance of the instance of the color one, in fact. The color one is um, the self, and uh, the right operand, right to this plus sign, which is color two, is passed to this other argument. Okay, this probably is a good time I'll show you how to use uh, debugger in this PyCharm uh, IDE. In the past uh, 20 or so lessons, I have never introduced you to use um, uh, debugging feature, but since you have learned so many, I don't know if you have used that by yourself, but it is um, a good way to help you understand uh, what's going on in a program. To run the debugger, you can run this uh, from this, this uh, icon. It's almost like a, a bug. Debug class, classes. Run it. Okay, now let's find uh, what's the uh, step into, step into, step over, F8 is okay. Now F8, all right, the next line. So let's say, um, R, other is 255, 255, 0. 
So that's color two. Say color two is two fifty five two fifty five zero. Now in the debugger, when we are at here, other is from this uh, watch window. You say other is two fifty five two fifty five zero. Now the self zero two fifty five zero. Self is color one. Color one is zero. 2550. This is what I told you. All right. One more step. One more step. One more step. Let's check the value. R is 255. R is this guy. And B is this guy is 0. Oh, wow. G is uh, 510. So why G is uh, 510? Oh, it's because 255 plus uh, 255. Yeah, that is uh, 510. Now, by our rule here, when we create this, we clip that into inside the range of 0 to 200, uh, to 255. We just need to make sure it's a valid uh, value inside the RGB format. Okay. Then one more, color three. Color three, all right. That's it. So RGB, red one component, color three, two fit five, two fit five, two fit five zero. Okay, this covers the very, very basics of uh, class. I'd like to continue our discussion about classes and object-oriented programming. Virtually all OO languages support a feature called inheritance. We borrowed this terminology from biology. There are some resemblance. Through inheritance, the attributes and behavior of one class can be reused, extended, or modified by another class. For example, we have two classes. One class is called a student. Another one is a faculty. And these two classes are for modeling a school management system. And for student, we have an attribute called name. Well, the same thing for faculty. Of course, there are there could be many other attributes shared by student and faculty common to both of them. But let's keep it simple. Just as they have name attributes, and a student must have a grade in the range from a one to twelve, and a faculty works in only one department. Department. Now these are the attributes of these two classes. Now notice we have the same attribute for each of the class. We can introduce another class called person. Student and faculty are person after all. And for the person class, we have a name attribute. By allowing student inherit from the person class. Now we can remove the definition name in student and name in faculty. These three classes create a simple inheritance hierarchy. The person is called base class, and a student, and the faculty called a derived class. Derived class, and sometimes uh, the derived class are called a subclass, and the base class is called a uh, superclass. So by using class inheritance, we eliminated the redundant definition of the shared 
uh, attributes for both a student and a faculty class. And of course, suppose we have another class called a staff. Staff of a school. The staff should also derive from a person, and the staff class would automatically have access to the attribute name without defining um, the name for itself. Therefore, the derived classes reuse the information in base class. And of course, in most languages, OO languages, they usually have a common base class called object. There's no exception in Python. Uh, we could have our person class derived from this object class. So a base class for some other derived classes could be a derived class of another base class. And there's no limitation of how deep this class hierarchy can be. Now, for the person, we might be interested in printing out uh, the person info. So we could have uh, implementation. Let me use this plus sign, meaning they are public attribute or methods. Pub public means the derived class can have uh, direct access to them. So person info. And a student, if it's uh, needed, can also have a person info function method. The same thing for faculty faculty class. Now this way we have the derived class replaced the base class behavior or implementation of person info. We reuse the name in the base class, but for student and faculty, we replace, we override the base class person info function or behavior. Because for students, if we want to print out the person info, we not only need to print the name, we need to print the additional information for student, the grade. And the same thing for faculty, we, we want to print out the faculty's department. Now you say the base class has information or data common to the derived classes. The derived class has its additional, distinct information from the base class and from the peers. The base class can have an implementation we, which we call the default implementation. For example, print the person's info. The derived class can choose to override its base class default implementation. Let's look at another example. Uh, this is a portion of Python exception inheritance hierarchy. At the very top, we have this base exception. Of course, uh, the base exception derives from the common class object. I just, you know, omitted it here. And uh, we have exception derived from a base exception. Down in this inheritance hierarchy, we have a arithmetic error derives from exception. We have another two subclasses, overflow error and a zero division error, with each of them derives from arithmetic error. There are many other errors derived from this uh, a common base class exception. 
Now for this class hierarchy, from top to down, the higher at the class inheritance hierarchy, the more abstract the class is. The lower a class is at the inheritance hierarchy, the more concrete the class is. Overflow error and zero division error are very specific errors. And arithmetic error is more concrete than this very general exception. We can use class inheritance to implement a design pattern called a state machine. For example, if I have a real-time strategy game, I have an army. The army ha uh, has a base state called army state. There are several derived states for the army state. The army could be in attack mode, follow mode, patrol, or maybe other uh, states. Now using this inheritance, each of the state could have its unique uh, operation or processing uh, the information in that state. And depending on the surrounding situation, the state can change from one to another, from attack to follow, or from follow to patrol, or if you have other states, they can change from one to the other. We are not going to the details how to implement a state machine. We just need to know inheritance is used for implementing the design pattern. And in fact, many other design patterns use inheritance. All right, enough theory. Let's see how we do inheritance in Python. Well, person is our base class. As any class, we should define a constructor. A constructor starts with this double um, underscore, init underscore. And for this person, we have the name. The name shall be a common to all the derived classes. And also notice for the name, I have uh, one leading underscore. By or defining a name attribute like this, we make this attribute accessible by uh, derived classes. And we know how to define property. For a person, we can get a name, and we just return the name. Now, in the base class, we have a default implementation of printing out the person info. Because in person, all we have is a name. So we can print uh, just the name. All right, this is our base class person. The next two classes, teacher and a student, are concrete classes. They both derive from person. To derive a class from another, or we do this class, the derived class name. In the parentheses, we put this base class name. This way is kind of a single inheritance. We are not doing multiple inheritance. By that I mean the teacher, the teacher class inherits only one base class. In this case, the teacher inherits from a person or derives from person, and so does a student. In teacher's class, it has its own constructor, and we need to pass the additional information for teacher, the primary department where the teacher works, because the name is defined in the base class person. We need to call person, person's constructor, and pass the name to the teacher's base class person. This is the way um, Python calls the base class from a derived class. And notice for the primary department, I have this underscore, double underscore primary department. Like I said in the previous class, by having double underscore, we make this uh, 
attribute private. Now this means this attribute is only visible to the class teacher. Next, department, we return this. This is a, a property, a getter. Now this method, person info, notice it's the exact the same name as we define in the base class. It prints the name from the base class because it's uh, only one uh, underscore, so we can uh, use it in the derived class. We get the name from the base class, then we append the primary department, which is the additional information only in the derived class. This way, we override the base class default implementation of printing this person's information, uh, this person's information. Now for student class, almost the same. The constructor, it takes one additional argument that is applicable to student only, the current grade. In the constructor, we call the base constructor. In the student's constructor, we call student's base class constructor person to pass the name for it. And we assign the current grade to this private attribute. Now a property, a getter, to return the current grade for the student. The same as um, faculty, same as teacher. We have um, a person info, which overrides the person's, the base class person's default implementation. Now to create the instance of teacher and a student, it's as usual, the usual way you create the class instance. Uh, you, you create the instance by calling the class parentheses with the necessary uh, parameters necessary arguments. For teacher, it accepts a name and a primary department. These are required arguments to create a teacher instance. So teacher Andy, he works for mathematics department. And we can a print, and we want to print the teacher's name and department. And these are accessed through the property. You can do teacher a dot uh, underscore name or teacher a dot underscore or double underscore primary department. They are not visible to the instance of teacher. So you have to access them through the property. Now you notice the teacher a has this property department. But the name, teacher A dot name, is really not inside teacher A's, uh, teacher's class. It comes from the base class. So you should understand this is uh, a reuse. So teacher A dot name gets the name from the teacher's base class. Gets it from here. And the same thing for student. Student has this property uh, grade. Student, student, yeah, here. Student has this property grade. You don't see the student's name property in its class. You don't see the name property in student class. But because student derives from person, and a person has this name property. So you can just call student dot a student a dot name to get the name from the student's base uh, class. Let's run it. All right, you see Andy Mathematics the name Andy for student Max ten tenth grade. Uh, if you call student a dot department, 
you would get an error because student A does not have a department A attribute or method. It does not have the attribute called department. And that is not available from the base class. The base class has attributes or behavior that come into the derived class. The department is not a common attribute. Now, what if I do this? I want to uh, print the information for teacher A and student A. I can put these two objects in a list. Because they are all person, I can call person dot person info. Let's see what happens. Run it. Okay, the first four lines are from uh, um, this block. Now this is uh, the print and the department of mathematics. That's the teacher and ma max grade ten. That's the print from uh, this. So now you say when we call a person dot person info, because each of the instances teacher A teacher uh, teacher A student A has override uh, the person info in base class. It knows what method to invoke. For teacher's instance, it would invoke person info. Here, a teacher's implementation of person info. So you see the primary department, mathematics. And for student, it invokes this person info. It would uh, call, yeah, it prints uh, the name plus the current grade. If you are interested, you can experiment with a class called faculty that derives from person without overriding the base class info. And then you try, you can call person.info for uh, that staff class instance. Now, if the staff class does not have this uh, override person info method, it would call the base method automatically. Okay, that's all for our discussion of classes. Um, so far, what I have talked are just the very fundamentals of uh, classes and a little bit object-oriented uh, programming. Uh, because this is uh, primarily for uh, high school students and college students who are not uh, CS major or not engineer major. We just want you to have some uh, exposure to the concepts of classes and object-oriented programming. You don't have to use classes or object-oriented programming uh, techniques for a lot of work. I'd like to do a simple program that simulates a projectile motion. The motion about a ball tossed at a certain angle under the influence of gravity only. We know for constant acceleration motion, the velocity at time t equals to v0 plus at, where v0 is the initial velocity and a is the acceleration. For displacement at time t equals to v0 t plus 1 over 2 at squared. And we also know a vector v has magnitude and a direction. We can use 2D XY coordinate system to analyze a vector where the projection, the vector V's projection in X direction, Vx is the vector's X component. And the projection in Y direction is the vector's Y component. Given the angle theta, Vx equals to V cosine theta, and uh, Vy equals to V sine theta. We can use this to analyze a projectile motion. 
which can be analyzed in two directions, x and y, and the motion in each of these two directions is independent of each other. For projectile motion, the velocity in x direction is like this. The x t plus delta t, the velocity in x direction at time t plus delta t equals to the x t, the velocity at time t plus a x delta t, where a x is the acceleration in x direction, in positive x axis direction. And similarly, the y, the velocity's y component at time t plus delta t equals to the y t plus a y delta t, where a y is the acceleration in y direction, and here a y is minus g. g is the free fall acceleration due to uh, gravity. We ignore the air resistance. We said the whole motion has only uh, has only the downward acceleration minus g. A x here in fact is zero. This gives us the object's velocity at any time. Now what about the displacement? We can apply the same uh, analysis. The displacement in x direction at the time t plus delta t equals position x t plus v x t times delta t plus 1 over 2 a x delta t squared. This is the displacement in x direction since time t. And we know a x is 0. In the horizontal direction, the object experiences no acceleration. So it actually is a constant velocity motion in x direction. Now what about in the y direction? y displacement t delta t equals y t, the position um, at time t in y direction plus v y t delta t plus 1 over 2 a y delta t squared. And a y here is minus g. We use only positive g to denote this free fall acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration. Because it's always downwards, uh, we use minus g for a y. And this is the displacement. This is the displacement in y direction since time t. So with these equations, and also um, given the initial velocity, initial velocity v0 and uh, launch angle theta, we should be able to calculate the motion, the projectile ball motion at any time. The launch angle theta is um, the angle between the initial velocity's vector and uh, the positive uh, x-axis. We know the screen coordinate starts from the left top corner. And to make our simulation more intuitive, we want to translate the screen coordinate to a coordinate system we are uh, accustomed to. We want to translate the origin to the left bottom corner. So we want to translate 0, 0 somewhere here. In fact, we live a little bit distance for the origin. Uh, the origin will have um, 
uh, 20 also pixels to the bottom and also 20 pixels bottom to the left edge. And the X direction in the system goes from left to right, no change. And the Y direction moves uh, upwards. So this is our uh, coordinate system we'll be using to calculate the trajectory. This time we want to make our design more elaborate. We want to use different uh, classes to represent the ball object, the 2D vector, the coordinates of the ball and the velocity, and also the transform. We could have put everything in one program, but by using uh, classes to separate the objects into different uh, module and classes, we make the design more extendable, easier to maintain. Let's take a look at uh, our simple vector 2D class. This class represents a vector with two components, x and y. Uh, we use this almost just like a pair or tuple with two elements in it. However, this class can be extended very easily to have other vector-related operations, such as calculating the magnitude of a vector. Uh, we can also do something uh, like adding, subtracting vector by overloading uh, operators. But here, we just need to know the x, y components for the motion so that we can capture the coordinate and the velocity. This is good, this is sufficient for our purpose. The constructor only needs to know x and y. We make this uh, x, y components uh, attributes private. You can only get the x or y through property. That's this part and uh, this part. The method here update is um, useful. We want to change the vector in place. This is used uh, when uh, the projection, the projector motion moved to the next uh, location. So we want to update either the velocity or the quadrant of it. And this uh, override method is for debugging purpose. You can print uh, um, user-friendly information for debugging. All right, so all right, this is good for our vector 2D. We have another class called Affin Transform. This class captures the transformation from uh, one coordinate system to another. We have used uh, uh, this in previous program where we just uh, define the transformation in a function, and we use that function directly in the main program. But this time, we want to encapsulate the transformation in a class. We do that in the class constructor. We pass the x minimum, y minimum, uh, x minimum, uh, x maximum, uh, y minimum, y maximum. This is the coordinate. Uh, this is our desired coordinate systems uh, x and y axis range. We want to map this onto the drawing surface, which is uh, the screen corner system. Okay, the usual transformation, we have seen this before, sx, sy uh, are the scale factor for x-axis and y-axis. And tx, ty are the offsets for the x-axis and uh, y-axis. We use numpy uh, to create this uh, translate and scale matrix. Once we create that, we store it. So in other words, when this F in transform object is created, the transformation matrix is known. We don't change it afterwards. Now, there's another method called transform chord. We have used this in the main program in the previous class, but here we make it a class method. So the input is a coordinate x, y, 
Of course, we use vector 2D type. This is uh, uh, argument uh, annotation. Just to make this uh, a more is to understand this argument is type of vector 2D. So it has the y, x component, y component. We just saw in the vector 2D implementation, you have x and y uh, properties. So you can get that. We make it uh, three dimension vector. Now we just call uh, the transform. We get the transformed coordinate. We return it as a vector 2D object. And this returned value shall be the screen coordinate. Okay, let's go to our ball class. Class ball represents on the ball being tossed at a certain angle. And we want to use this class to capture the project projectile motion. In the constructor, um, what we are interested to know for the ball, the radius of it, the color, the coordinate, initial velocity, acceleration. We also want to pass the transformation to the ball object so that we can draw the ball within the ball object itself. When the ball is instantiated, when a ball object is in instantiated, again, it knows its uh, radius, the color, the current coordinate, we want to pass the initial coordinate to it at the time when we create the ball. The same thing with the current velocity. We pass the initial velocity to it, and also the acceleration. And uh, this um, same time is important. Time dot time returns the seconds um, since epoch is a floating number. So when the ball is created, we record the time is created. We record the time. The trajectory is an array to store the trajectory of the motion. At each calculation, we will add the newly calculated coordinate to it for us to draw the trajectory. The last one is uh, the transform. OK, uh, a property to return the current coordinate. Nothing special. Now the update method. The update method is the place where we implement the physics. OK, you see this calculation is very similar. Uh, almost it's just a direct translation of what we have discussed at the beginning of the class. Same time. Well, this is uh, the time when we call the ball object to update its, its motion. Every time you call it, we use time.time .time to get the seconds since the elapsed, uh, uh, since the epoch. It will always be a greater value than the last uh, time we called it. So same time minus this um, self dot underscore same time gives us the duration or the delta t, which is the elapsed time since la last uh, update. So this is um, how we calculate uh, the delta t. Once we have that, we know the current coordinate, the current velocity, so we can calculate the current coordinate in x direction. And it is this translation from the formula um, at the beginning of the class. So this is um, uh, x position plus x displacement since time t. Okay, And uh, this is the same thing for the y coordinate. Okay. You have the last uh, coordinates position in y and plus this y displacement. And of course, the acceleration in x shall be 0. And the acceleration uh, in y should be minus g. And in our calculation, we make it uh, general. Just uh, you can do a simulation um, with, with um, the acceleration in x not a zero. After calculated uh, x coordinate and y coordinate, we update 
the ball's current coordinate. All right, next, we need to transform the coordinate. Remember, the coordinate uh, is calculated in our desired uh, system. However, we want to transform them back to the screen coordinates for displaying. Okay, so self transform, transform chord. We get this screen coordinates and we add it to our trajectory. After we updated the coordinates, we can update um, this uh, velocity. Well, this is uh, still the translation of the physics. This is um, uh, the velocity at uh, x direction. In, this is the velocity in x direction and plus um, ax delta t. Well, not much, not much to explain, it's just uh, physics. After that, we update the current velocity. At last, we want to update the time we calculated this motion so that when the next call come in, you will have another uh, delta t. All right, that's uh, the update method. Uh, similarly, we have a override method, double underscore string, to return the boss motion information, current coordinate and the current velocity. This is for debugging purpose. The last method, draw, like I said, we encapsulated the join method within the ball class. That's why we need to pass the join surface to this class. The join surface is uh, uh, the object to return from Pygame. Well, here, line 51, we want to check whether we have any points in the trajectory array. If we have uh, more than one, we can draw the trajectory using uh, anti-alias lines. Okay. All right. After that, we want to transform the ball's current coordinate into screen coordinate. And then we use this um, anti-alias version um, to draw the circle and fill it. We draw it at the screen coordinate x, y. This is the center of the ball using the radius and the color we know when the ball is created. All right, let's go to our main program, projecthow.py. Well, because we have defined this uh, different uh, uh, things in different classes and different uh, files, so we want to import all of them for the main program to consume. We import some um, system um, uh, beauty modules, says time math, import a pie game, and this is our own modules. We import color constants, we import this F in transform, we import ball, we import vector 2D. We import everything from those modules. In order to initialize pie game, we define the size of the joint surface. Okay, then we Create the screen. Here we set uh, the caption of the window, uh, background color, and clock, frame rate. This is all usual. And here, the frame rate, we want to use a higher frame rate so that we can make the drawing uh, faster and make this uh, smoother. OK, now this line 26, it creates the F in transform. This is the first argument, that's the drawing surface. The next uh, four arguments is the desired uh, corner system we want. Like I said, we translate the origin to um, a point that has 20 pixels to the left uh, edge and also 20 pixels to the bottom edge. However, we keep the total distance the same the total width the same as the screen width and total height the same as the screen height so that the scale factor actually is 1 for x, for y is minus 1. So we don't really distort um, the display. The scale factor, 
The skill factors are one. Let's use uh, 15 for the ball radius. Initial velocity is magnitude, 80 pixels per second. Now, the reason uh, we use pixels is um, for the simulation. Okay, it doesn't matter you use other units, but the pixels is much more uh, straightforward. And uh, the acceleration is vector x. Ax is zero. Acceleration in x direction is zero. And in y direction is free for acceleration. It's minus 10. Well, just let's use 10. Of course, you can use, you can also use 9.8. It doesn't really matter. All right. Okay, next uh, block, next uh, few blocks, we create three ball objects. The first one, we create a ball um, at um, a thrown at an angle of 45 degrees. The second ball thrown at a degree of 70 degrees. And the third ball thrown at 30 degrees. And they are all of the same radius and uh, start at the same um, location, same coordinate. Of course, each of them has different color. The difference for these three balls, B1, B2, B3, is just the launch angle. So this is um, very interesting because from high school we learned for projectile, a ball being thrown at a certain angle, 45 degrees will throw the ball to the furthest distance. We just want to say if that is true. Of course, it is true. This is a simulation. Um, okay, we created three ball objects. Let's see. Okay, next is our simulation loop, the main pie game loop. Nothing unusual, the frame rate, and this uh, event loop, we want to trap the user input. If the user clicked uh, close button, we want to exit uh, the program uh, gracefully. We set the background color. Now here from uh, line 55 to 57, we draw the horizontal X axis line. Uh, still, we need to transform the coordinates into the screen coordinate. So we want to draw from 0, 0 to uh, screen width minus 50, and also y0, that's a horizontal line. You know, the y coordinates are the same, but the x is different. OK, so this gives us the horizontal line. Next, OK, we draw a small rectangle for the launch pad. OK, we still need to translate. We want to draw it at zero and ball radius. So this is the rectangle's left top um, coordinate, left top corner's uh, coordinate. But we need to translate that into the screen coordinate. Then we draw it. Line 63, we get the time, the current time. So for each loop, for each execution, we set the frame rate to uh, 60, and hopefully, we will run this loop six times per second. Okay, so this is uh, the time uh, when we want to update the boss coordinate. Uh, we want to update the boss motion because we have three boss. We want to update for each of them. We loop through the boss collection, three of them. We update with the current time. If you go back to ball, you will see this update is just that, that uh, physics is calculates the current coordinates and velocity at time current t. We only update that when the ball is still up in the air. It's not touched down yet. Okay, after that, we draw the screen. Of course, Regardless where the ball is, we always want to draw the ball onto the surface. This, this gives us um, the ball still being displayed 
at the end of the simulation when the ball uh, hit the ground. Okay, the last line is just um, uh, flip the joint buffer. Okay. All right, let's run this uh, program. Okay, just watch. Three balls launched from different angles. The green one was launched at an angle of 45 degrees. The blue one was at 70 degrees. Well, they hit the ground uh, the last. And also, it hit the shortest distance. Okay, that's the end of the simulation. You can run this many, many times. I enjoyed it very much, and I hope you too.